Blind Gambit, a novel by John Cronshaw. Chapter 1. Moira Brown's Boys. The dead city spawned around me, looming grey concrete and twisted steel. I crouched behind the shell of a burnt-out car, a metal husk in black and rust. Glass shards glinted on the road's surface. Shifting my gaze across the buildings, I scanned for movement, searching for the dead, looking for my enemies. The rest of my team spread out ahead, their locations blinking in green on my radar. Frag Queen sprinted off to my right, skirting a building before disappearing around a corner. Harley followed close behind, moving between shadows. Their avatars were too similar to tell apart at a glance. Both wore the same athletic female body and long brown hair. Harley's face was dark and round, with wide brown eyes. She complained there was no option for curls. Frag Queen wore a ghostly white face with pale blue eyes. We all sported the same brownish-grey coveralls. I scanned the rooftops, searching for a vantage point, a place I could hide and watch over the mission. Something flickered past a crumbling stone archway. There's something in that church, I said, warning the others. What you seeing, Neuro? Talk to me, bro. Socko's booming voice crackled through his low-grade headset as he overtook me, charging ahead with a power mace gripped in his right hand. His avatar was the type of thing a twelve-year-old would pick in a wrestling game. Tattooed, bulky, and a foot taller than everyone else, a mohawk crowned the top of his head. He had the wasteland look going on for sure. Raising my rifle, I brought up the sight, the world turning from hues of browns and greys to a sweep of green and white. I focused on the church, taking aim at the zombie. It's a deadhead. Want me to take it down? I got this one, bro. Socko bolted forward, power mace swinging. You know, you don't have to use your weapon until you're on them. Screw you, Neuro. I'm taking this deadhead out. I dropped my sight and brought up my HUD. Frag Queen and Harley moved east. The target glowed red to the northeast. The mission a simple in-out. Capture the flag deal. Or at least it would be if we didn't have to contend with the inconceivable. Approaching the church, I saw Socko going hand-to-hand -hand with a low-level zombie. I took aim and let out a shot. The bullet ripped through the air, ricocheting off the doorway, sending out an explosion of stone and dust. Crap, I muttered, reloading. Socko swung at the ghoul, smashing into its head. It crumpled to the ground, fading to nothing. Unfreaking believable, Neuro. You suck as a sniper. Yeah, yeah, I'm still a noob. It's bad form, bro. We're meant to be working together, not trying to steal kill points. I nodded to myself. Sorry about that. I'll remember next time. A stairwell descended from a rooftop on the end of a row of buildings to my right. I turned and climbed, metal clanging beneath my feet. From the top, the other buildings extended in all directions. I brought up my map again, lining it up with the world around me. Socko, head northeast. I'll cover you. Got you, bro. If I swing at something, it's mine. He left the church and ran on ahead. Where you at, Frag Queen? I need you to get those mines down, bro. Bro? That's no way to talk to a lady. Bite me, Frag Queen. You're about as freaking ladylike as Hulk Hogan. And you're about as sexist as... I don't know, someone really sexist? Now, now, you two, I said, holding in a laugh. He started it, Frag Queen said. I sighed. Can't you just say sorry to each other? We're supposed to be a team. She called me sexist, bro. And you said she was about as ladylike as Hulk Hogan. She can claim she's a girl all she wants. But we all know Frag Queen's probably just some fat 46-year-old pervert from Detroit with the same physical stature as Dr. Robotnik. I'm not even American. You want us to win this or what? I asked. Stop fighting. You're right, bro. Sorry, Frag Queen. Sorry for implying you're a sexist pig. I know that's not strictly true. Strictly? snapped Socko. Guys, seriously. Sorry, Neuro, said Frag Queen. Yeah, bro. I let out an exasperated groan, making sure it was loud enough to be heard by the others. Any signs of the inconceivable? Nothing here, said Harley. These fools are too good. It's clear, bro. Frag? I ran along the rooftop's edge, checking the street below. I'm just putting some mines out near this medipack. Just grab the pack, bro, and keep going. But I want to blow things up. Seeing nothing, I dropped down to the road below, 
the landing taking a small chunk of my health. Bullet holes peppered the brickwork, while rusted cars stood in silence. You see anyone, Neuro? Frag Queen asked. Nothing. Yet. I don't like this. Harley, I asked. What are you seeing? I've got a positive on their scout. I'm tracking them as we speak. I checked my map for Harley's position, and charged between a pair of buildings to my right, heading in her direction. Climbing to the roof, I headed to the edge and took out my rifle, locating her in my sight. I've got you covered, Harley. I caught a fleeting glimpse of the inconceivable scout gliding past in stealth mode towards her. I took aim and held my breath. When I pulled the trigger, the bullet fizzed through the air, burrowing into bare concrete. Harley, you've got a scout coming up at your rear. I tried shooting him. That's because you suck, Neuro. Socko's voice crackled. Whatever. Lowering my rifle, I reloaded and took aim again. I located Harley and swept around her position, searching for the scout. Harley, you got a visual. Negative on that. I spotted the Inconceivable's leader, standing with his back against the wall at the end of an alleyway, longsword drawn. Harley, it's an ambush. What the- An explosion cut her voice short. Frantic, I checked the map. We've lost, Harley. Unfreaking believable, said Socko. I can't believe this crap. Right, bro, this is it. Let's do this. It's time to kick ass and chew bubblegum, and I'm all out of gum. If you wanted gum, I've got some you can have, said Frag Queen. I don't want any of your freaking gum, Frag Queen. Checking Socko's and Frag Queen's locations, I let out a sigh. Neuro, what happened? What can you see? Talk to me, bro. I scanned between the buildings and Harley's last position, but saw no signs of the enemy. There was at least two of them, their scout and Malay guy. Why didn't you shoot them, bro? I missed. That's weak, bro. Frag Queen, you head north, let off a few grenades, pull them out of hiding. You're the boss. A line of grenades exploded to the east with iridescent flashes. I shook my head. Frag, you're leaving a trail behind you. If their sniper didn't spot you before, he'll have got you in his sights by now. Well, maybe if you and Socko could agree on- Frag Queen's voice cut out. Another one bites the dust, I sang. Damn it, Socko shouted. You know how much I hate Queen. Let me get to the flag. You double back. Try to create a diversion. Maybe set off some of Frag Queen's mines. You sure you can do this, bro? Just asking because I know how much you completely suck at this. I've got this. Scrambling down the ladder, I ran full speed towards the flag. Explosions rang out in the distance, accompanied by a ripple of gunfire. They got me surrounded, bro. You still there? Socko. No reply. The flag fluttered in a doorway ahead. I glanced over my shoulder at the barrel of a sniper rifle, my screen turning black before I could react. I returned to our private forum. A long crimson sofa stood flush against the wood panel wall. Frag Queen sat with her back to me, dressed in full anime schoolgirl garb. Knee socks, sailor skirt, all blues and whites, a bright red bow tied around her neck. She looked at me with big manga eyes. Oh my god, bro, Socko said. We freaking sucked out there. He flopped onto the couch to Frag's right. We should study the replay, Harley said standing in front of the wall screen, her avatar no different than in-game. We need to see where we went wrong. She scrolled through the menus, bringing up the main scoreboard. I'm just putting this out there, Harley. We don't need a replay to know we've got freaking Stevie Wonder as our sniper. Frag Queen turned to him, face reddening. That's not cool. I raised my hands. What did I do? I'm pretty sure I was last out. You suck, Neuro. You hear me? S-U-C-K. Suck. I don't even know who Stevie Wonder is. I take it he's another wrestler. Socko sprang to his feet and ran over to me, head filling most of my view. You've got to be freaking kidding me, bro. Stevie Wonder. Inner visions. Higher ground. Superstitious. He shook his head eyes turning to question marks. What's wrong with you? If you're trying to wind me up? I grinned. He did that ebony and ivory, I think, Frag Queen said. It was about racial harmony. Socko flashed her a glare. That song sucked, and you know it, Frag Queen. You're all freaking Philistines. I think that's racist, she tossed her hair back. Philistinians have as much right to be on this earth as anyone else.
Bite me, Frag Queen. I don't have time to listen to your asinine crap. If you don't like ebony and ivory, I think that makes you doubly racist. She folded her arms, offering me a smile. I took a step back and turned to Harley. I take it we're still down. She pulled her gaze from the screen and nodded. We're last. I followed her finger down the leaderboard until Moira Brown's boys flashed at the bottom, several places down from the inconceivable. I can't believe we're at the bottom. It's because you suck, Neuro. A unit is only as good as their leader, Harley said, narrowing her eyes at Socko. I'm just messing. He gave a long sigh. We should watch something, bro. We could carry on watching the Royal Rumbles. I've got 1991. I think Ric Flair wins. It's meant to be awesome. Spoiler alert, Harley said. I'm bored with wrestling, said Frag. Let's watch a movie. She shot to her feet. We could watch Robocop again. I've got the cut for TV where all the swears were replaced with badly dubbed foodstuffs. That's baloney, Harley said. I really don't mind, I said. I just love spending time with Socko. He's always such a great guy to be around. I don't know whether it's his wit, his charm. Screw you, Neuro. I shrugged and turned back to see Harley still scrolling through the leaderboards. How are the solo rankings? She shook her head. You don't want to know. Seriously, it can't be worse than our team rank. You're bottom. Oh. I lowered my gaze. As in, bottom of our team. Bottom, bottom, as in, bottom of everything. Oh. She brought up our individual rankings, scrolling past the hundreds of names. Harley Q. Soko 316, and Frag Queen flicked past. And there I was, neuromantic, blinking red at the bottom. I hate to admit it. She offered me a grin. Socko's right. You really do suck. I'll get there. Just need to keep practicing. You ever considered taking up a different specialism? Your perception's too low for you to be effective as a sharpshooter? I sighed. I like this team. If I change, I'll have to find a new crew. I'd miss you guys too much, even Socko. Who else has an encyclopedic knowledge of 80s and 90s wrestling? And porn stars. Harley said. Don't forget the porn stars. We love you, Neuro, said Frag Queen. Socko looked up from his seat. Yeah, bro, but we can't keep losing like this. You need to seriously up your game, otherwise we're going to have to find a new sniper. I'll try. It's just... I felt a tap at my shoulder in the real world. I need to go. You back later, bro. We got some Street Fighter to do. Turbo or Super? Four, bro. Best one. I shook my head. So you can spam me with Sagat again? If you can't beat an awesome strategy, that's your luck out. It's boring, Harley said. Yeah, we should have a Sagat ban, said Frag Queen. And no more Rias either. I'm going to be Dan. Socko hates it when I beat him with Dan. It's just because a Dan victory counts for double, I said. Frag Queen gave an exaggerated shrug. And if you lose, whatever. It's Dan. Socko shook his head. Whatever. Get your excuses in early. I'm going to enjoy kicking all your asses. No Sagat, I said. Bite me, Neuro. I'm done, I said, waving him off. See you later. Take it easy, bro. Yeah, bye, Harley said, still looking at the screen. I logged out and the forum faded to black. Chapter 2 Limitations the real world swirled back to the front of my consciousness, a kaleidoscope of blurs and formless colours. It never gets better than this for me. Your tea is on the table, Mum said. You coming down? I got to my feet and pressed the back of my hand against the wall to my right, wallpaper soft beneath my fingers. You need my arm? I shook my head. I'll be down in a second. Waiting until I heard her reach the bottom of the stairs, I followed her down. Touching the doorframe, I reached out for the banister, making my way down twelve steps and past the first door to the kitchen. The smell of sausage mingled with Mum's lavender reed diffuser. The TV remained on in the sitting room. Voices garbled through the closed door. You've been on that game a while, she said. I shook my head and wandered over to my seat, feeling its back before pulling it out and sitting down, wood scraping on floor tiles. Not this again. I just wish you'd go and see people. 
See? I groped for my knife and fork, and ran a finger around the plate, discerning its rim. You know what I mean. I cut your sausages for you. You really didn't need to do that. Pieces of sausage stood at ten o'clock on my plate, a pair of soggy potato waffles at two o'clock, and a pool of beans at six. I licked the tomato sauce from my finger and drove my fork into the first chunk of sausage, lifting it to my mouth, steam rising up my nose. I was talking to Margaret earlier. She was saying you should apply for a guide dog. It would get you out of the house more, give you some responsibility. I don't want a dog, I said between mouthfuls. I may as well just walk around with a big sign saying, blind guy coming through. I'm not doing that. It's bad enough already. Clearing her throat, Mum shuffled on her seat. I sensed her leaning forward and she touched the back of my head. What are you doing? I ducked, flinching. At least that scar's clearing up, she said. If I'd have known that implant would have been so invasive, I don't think I would have signed those papers. So you'd rather I just sit around doing nothing? Oh, Brian, she sighed. Why do you have to be so dramatic? I shook my head and shoveled a pile of beans into my mouth their ovoid form squashing against my tongue. You've been up in that room of yours for goodness knows how many hours. It's not right. It's not healthy. What's the problem? I get to hang out with people I like. I get to watch movies. I can do all the things that normal people get to do. Don't ever think you're not normal. You just need to be more willing to accept your limitations. Give up, you mean? No, I mean that you don't need to be afraid or ashamed of accepting support. Margaret is worried about you. I'm worried about you. She tells me you've been very hostile to some of the solutions she's been suggesting for you. What's it got to do with Margaret? She's supposed to be your social worker. She's meant to help you. You never talk to her. She can't support you if you refuse to be helped. I don't need her help. Mum reached for my hand and held it. Brian, please. I know this must be hard for you but you don't have to do this alone. You get that pride from your dad, and look what that did. I jerked my hand away, jaw clenching. That's not fair. It's completely different. You don't have any friends. What happened to Mike and Akash? You used to see them all the time. That was ages ago. They don't hang around with the blind guy. I don't care. And anyway, I've got friends. In your computer game? Other players. They're not real, though. I shook my head. Of course, they're real. But they're not like real friends. It's not like you could ask them to pop round for a cuppa. I wouldn't do that anyway. You know what I mean. They're just virtual friends. No, they are friends. And they're the only friends I've got. I know you've got a lot to deal with. Please try to make the effort to meet some real people. And if I do, will you drop it? There was a long pause before Mum spoke. Thank you, she said in a whisper. What are you going to do after tea? I was thinking of going back upstairs. I'm going back online to spend time with my friends. Mum sighed. Chapter 3 Loser Leaves Town Socko slammed his controller down when Frag Queen perfected his sagat for the third straight time. Unfreaking believable. I swear to God, Frag's Queen, there's some weak-ass cheating going on there. She rolled on the floor, laughing uproariously. It feels so good when it's Dan. I'm sure that taunting was activating some kind of hack. I laughed. Oh, poor Socko. I'd like to see you do any better, bro. I shook my head, chuckling. No way, man. Frag owned you. He waved a hand. Bro, you want some tunes? I'm done with this stupid game. It's not going to be those limp biscuits again, is it? Frag Queen grumbled. So pathetic. You're saying it wrong, bro. It's biscuit. You pronounce the Z. It's not difficult. I don't care. She examined her red fingernails. It's all macho bullcrap to me. Fred Durst was a freaking poet in his day. I smirked. What's your freaking problem? You ever hear of poet? You ever hear of freaking Jeff Keats? Who? Exactly. Fred Durst was a better poet, and that's a freaking fact. You wouldn't know good music if it smacked you in that smug face of yours. Frag Queen laughed. 
You wouldn't know it if you beat me at Street Fighter with Dan, which you probably would. That doesn't even make sense. How about some Kanye? Harley suggested. Socko let out a snort. Don't even get me started on that. Nine inch nails. I said better, bro. Don't want to sit here slitting our wrists, though. I still say aqua, Frag Queen said. Cartoon Heroes is one of the greatest pop songs of the last century. Unfreaking believable. Aqua? Are you kidding me? I staggered backwards as the forum's door swung open, the inconceivable piling in. Their leader, rhymes with Peanut, swaggered in first, wearing a white lab coat and a sunburst of silver hair. Erith Lives followed close at his heels. He wore the full Cloud Strife avatar, blonde spiked hair, dark uniform, Buster sword strapped across his back. Luckily, it was only a visual prop because that thing looked like it could do some damage. Well, 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 if it isn't the losers. Screw you, Peanut, Socko said. What do you want? Yeah, lose any games recently? Ipuna said. He wore elf ears and a green coat. A Triforce logo painted on a wooden shield. Socko glared at him. And screw you, Zelda. You only lost because our sniper sucks. Thanks, I said. I'm not Zelda. Zelda's the princess. You complete and utter douche nozzle. My avatar, as any person with even an iota of knowledge would know, is Link, specifically in his Wind Waker incarnation. Such a nerd. Frag Queen sighed. Yeah, well, Wind Waker sucked. Zelda's just a kid's game. I liked Wind Waker, I said. Granted, Ocarina of Time was better, but... No one cares about freaking Zelda, bro, Socko said. He turned to Peanut. Anything you need, or have you just stopped by to gloat? We've just come to gloat. He glanced up at the screen and turned to me. Ah, Neuromantic, the legendary. Shoot any enemies lately? Oh, uh, wait, of course you didn't. He let out a sniggering laugh. I shook my head and sighed. I'm sure you all started somewhere. Socko jumped to his feet, squaring up to Peanut. Don't talk to Neuro like that, bro. Otherwise you'll answer to me. What? Are you going to come and beat me up in the real world? Are you going to find me and do one of your pathetic wrestling moves? I'm just saying, bro. If you can't deal with your issues in the game, then I honestly don't know what to say. He gestured a yawn. Is that a challenge, bro? Peanut nodded. How about you put your money where your mouth is? I don't even know what that means. My mouth's here. Socko pointed to his mouth, extending the middle finger. You see that, bro? You see what I did? Peanut rolled his eyes. Melee rules. Last man standing. Loser leaves town. Which town? Epuna stepped forward, shaking his head. The game, you maggot boy. How long? A week? A month? Socko smacked a fist into his palm. We're ready for you, bro. Just name your stip. Peanut laughed. Forever. Socko nodded. So, if you guys lose, you're done. I don't have to listen to any more of your freaking asinine comments. Indeed. And if you lose, which based on the current standings is a surefire inevitability, you have to leave. All of you. He met my gaze. When? Now. Ooh, I can't do now. Frag Queen said, examining her fingernails. I need to head soon. Cowards, Peanut declared, raising a fist. Epuna turned to him. Actually, I've got school in the morning. I need to be in bed soon. And I've got English homework. Okay, snapped Peanut, starting to pace. Tomorrow, same time. Done, Socko said. Now get the hell out of our forum. When the inconceivable left, Harley glared at Socko. I can't believe you just did that. He raised his hands. They called us cowards, bro. What was I supposed to do? Think, McFly. Think. There's no way we're going to win. What can I say? Harley shrugged. Sorry would be a start. All right. Mistakes were made. Sorry if you feel like that. You call that an apology? I stood between Harley and Sokko, keeping them apart. Don't worry about it. We'll kick their asses. He let out a snorting laugh. Yeah, right. Good one, bro. I'm beat, Frag Queen said. See you guys tomorrow. She waved before leaving the game. See you later, said Harley, following. I looked at Socko, narrowing my eyes. What? 
What are we going to do if we lose? There's other games, bro. Not that I can play. You can hardly play this one. I'm serious. You've made a big mistake. Chapter 4 Independence I made my way down the stairs and into the kitchen, groping along worktops to the second drawer on the left. I took out a butter knife and laid it on the counter. I grabbed a plate from the cupboard above and kneeled down to the fridge. Feeling inside, I retrieved a margarine tub and a packet of wafer-thin ham. Getting to my feet, I sniffed at the ham as it draped over my fingers, cold and moist. It didn't smell of death. I pulled two slices of bread from the packet inside the bread bin. As I opened the margarine, I sneezed. The tub flipped from my hand and bounced onto the floor. Crap, I muttered, crouching and padding the tiles around me. I crawled, floor cold beneath my knees, waving my right hand back and forth cursing under my breath. You okay? Mum asked from the doorway. I started, banging my head on the corner of the table. I dropped the margarine, I said, standing. I rubbed the back of my head as Mum picked up the tub and walked over to my half-prepared sandwich. I can do that. I'll be quicker, don't you worry, you just take a seat. Wouldn't want you banging your head again. I held my breath, fists clenched. Take a seat, dear. You need to let me do things. I felt for the edge of the table and dragged out a chair. I sat hunched, leaning on my elbows, head resting in my hands. You need to let me make my own mistakes. Mum placed the plate before me and sat down on the opposite chair, wood creaking as it took her weight. Your sandwich is just in front of you. Yes, I know. I do worry about you. I sneezed and dropped the tub. I still say you need to get help. Margaret was saying Mandela House has a lot of classes for blind people. Don't call me that, I snapped. You're pushing a label onto me. I don't want to be a blind man. I don't want people to pity me. I just want to live my life how I want to, and not have you or anyone else lumping me with all the other blind people putting us in our own convenient little pen. It's not like that. Her fingers tapped rhythmically on the table. Then, what is it? You need to accept that you have a disability. You're not going to survive in the real world if you don't accept help. What about my independence? You need to accept help to facilitate independence. I sighed and reached for my sandwich. You cut my sandwich into quarters? I asked, incredulous. I didn't want you dropping it. This is what I'm talking about. I slammed the bread down, plate rattling on the table. You can't keep treating me like a kid, she sighed. Brian, please, this is hard for me too. You know I only want what's best for you. So, how is going to do craft with other blind people going to help me exactly? Margaret said there are people your own age. Wouldn't it be nice to talk to people who know what you're going through? You never know, there might even be some girls. I nodded and picked up my sandwich, letting the words settle for a while. I chewed and swallowed, closing my eyes, letting out a deep breath from my nose. Okay. So, you'll go? Mum placed a hand on mine. For you? I'll go? For you? That's wonderful. She jumped to her feet. I'll let Margaret know. She'll be so pleased. If I hate it, though, I'll only do it once. Thank you, Brian. Chapter 5 Last Man Standing I leaned back against the sofa as Harley browsed through the leaderboards. Socko spawned next to me, followed by Frag Queen a few seconds later. I wasn't sure you were going to come, Harley said, turning to Socko. Bite me, Harley. He turned the screen off and clapped his hands. I know you're peed off with me, guys, I get it. You really didn't have to agree to a stipulation, I said. This isn't wrestling. Harley folded her arms. No, this is real. Be nice to everyone. Frag Queen looked between Socko and Harley. We're not going to win if we snipe at each other. It's about the only sniping that goes on around here. Socko grinned. Am A right? I raised my hands, frowning. This is on you, Socko. What's your plan? Harley sat between Frag Queen and me as Socko paced before us. Neuro, you need to find a high point. Take as many of those chumps as you can, bro. Frag Queen, I need you and Harley to work together. Draw them out, get them stepping on some mines. Do it in such a way so if they avoid them, 
you and Harley can take them out. What are you going to do? Frag Queen asked. It's clobber in time. He mimed the action of smashing something with a club. I'll be happy as long as you leave Peanut for me. That asshole's got to get got. What do we do once we've taken them out? Harley asked. Huh? It's last man standing mode. She let out a sigh. There are no teams. He nodded. Good point. Let's focus on staying in the game, then we can have some fun. Okay. So work together until the inconceivable are done? Try to keep up. It's not freaking rocket surgery. I'll enjoy taking you out, Harley said in a low voice. Not gonna happen, bro. I'm going in there to kick Peanut's ass. Then I'll whoop the rest of you guys, show you how it's done, Staten Island style. We'll see, I said. Socko barked out a laugh. You want some too, bro? This is going to be fun. Time to kick ass and chew gum. I didn't think you wanted any, Frag Queen said. Screw you, you ready? We going to do this? Yeah, Frag Queen said, sarcasm edging her voice. Woo. Let's do this. Should we do that thing where we pump our fists together? I asked, grinning. It could be like in the movie with the ducks playing hockey. The mighty ducks. That movie freaking sucks, bro. I tilted my head. I think so. What was their team called? He shrugged. You're asking me? Harley smirked. The only fists I'll be putting anywhere are the ones I throw at Soko once we've dealt with the inconceivable. Bring it on, Harley. He raised his fists, ducking and weaving like a boxer. You'll see what freaking happens. A flat wasteland grew around me, desert stretching for miles in every direction, blast craters peppering the barren earth. The sky hung in a bright cloudless blue, the sun casting lens glare, obscuring my view. Scanning the horizon, I searched for movement. Talk to me, Nero, where you at, bro? I don't know. I checked my HUD, bringing up my map. There's just lots of sand and a whole bunch of craters. Nothing's really standing out. Sorry, bro. I forgot we can't see each other. That's freaking annoying. Whose idea was it to do last man standing? I cleared my throat. Oh, yeah. You see anyone else? Yes. Epuna's voice chimed in. Confirm your positions. Tell us where you are. A snorting laugh blasted through his headset breath whistling between each staccato burst. Unfreaking believable How did you hack onto our channel, bro? This is bull crap. You're like freaking Sagat. It's LMS mode. You complete and utter gizzard. Every man for himself. That means all channels open. What the hell did you just call me? Bro, what the hell's a gizzard? That better not be about my mum. Or I swear to God, I'll... His voice trailed off. Crouching, I looked through my rifle's sight, sweeping across the wasteland. Do they have zombies? Of course they have zombies, bro, it's Gambit. Epna laughed again. Not in LMS mode. In that case, I think I can see you, Socko. Bro, change of plan, keep shktum. Shut up and keep to what we said before. But there's no high ground. Damn it, Nuro, don't make me come over there. RWP, we've got a two to four, said Aerith. What the hell was that? Socko said. Two, four. Got it, Peanut said. Five to four on the alpha. Seriously, bro, if you guys are talking in code, that's not fair. I ran forward, still in a crouch, chasing the movement on the horizon. Oh my god, Frag Queen said. Artutard, is that seriously your actual name? Artu sniggered. What of it? Do you know how offensive that is? You want to see something offensive? You should check some of the memes I've just forwarded to your personal messages. Hope you find Nazi stuff funny. Yeah, or your mum's face, said Epuna. Ignore them, Frag, I said. They're just trying to get into your head. A second figure approached the one I was tracking, still too far away to be sure who it was. Charging forward, I came to a stop at the lip of a crater, took aim and squeezed the trigger. The rifle cracked and my XP jumped up. Yeah! What the hell, bro? Socko grunted. Did you just shoot me, Neuro? You freaking shot my power mace, I'm unarmed. Epuna and Peanut let out a laugh. I turned my rifle to the other figure and pulled the trigger, missing my target. I reloaded and tried again. There's definitely something up with these bullets. 
Is that useless sniper seriously trying to hit me? Epona asked. R2, take him out. I dropped to the ground and sought Epona with my sight. Socko, their explosives guy is near you. I'll take him. Good luck with that, bro. Can't believe you disarmed me. You're strong. What was it you were saying about your 24-inch vipers? Just go beat the crap out of him. Pythons, bro. Get it right. The game glitched for a second. Imagery shuddering, sound crackling. I think there's something wrong with my interface. Would explain why I keep missing. Static fizzed in my ears as something iridescent flashed at the edge of my vision. I turned as another player raced through the arena, wielding an enormous sword and shield that shimmered with incandescent brightness. I averted my eyes and pulled off a shot, the bullet hitting the figure. The figure kept moving. What's going on? I called. The other players stood frozen, paralysed. What's happening? No one responded. Anyone? I brought up my hood and checked the list of the other players. Socko 316, Frag Queen, Harley Q, Epuna, Rhymes with Peanut, Aerith Lives, and R2D Tard. Whoever this is isn't on the list. Anyone? Hello? The new user ran through everyone, destroying them with a quick swipe of his sword. I let off a few more shots when the new user raced towards me, sword swinging, my bullets ricocheting from the shield. I staggered backwards as the figure struck me down. A blank, eyeless mask covered his face. Everything faded to black. Chapter 6. Sysadmin Groaning, I slumped onto the forum's couch, sinking into its softness, wondering where everyone else was. Harley? Frag? Socko? Anyone? I shrugged and switched on the screen. Browsing through the list of movies and TV shows, felt strange without Socko and Frag Queen arguing over what to watch. Which wrestler gave the best elbow drop? Which Mark Wahlberg movie sucked the most? Socko said it was the happening. Frag Queen said Max Payne. Harley agreed with me that they were both wrong. It was clearly Planet of the Apes. I hovered over a wind named Amnesia. I hadn't watched it since losing my sight and felt an emptiness in the pit of my stomach. As I pressed play, I sat back, expecting Socko to chime in at any moment, complaining about a plot hole or mocking a voice actor. It was too weird. My concentration kept slipping, so I switched off the movie. Memory loss, robot guardians, a weird hospital with a creepy nurse. That movie was confusing at the best of times. Socko, where the hell is everyone? I rose to my feet, unsure what to do. Taking a deep breath, I opened the door and leaned out into the corridor. Our sign flickered in neon on the forum door. I glanced left and right, eyes passing over the other forums. Anyone about? The corridor stretched out ahead, glowing door signs disappearing towards a vanishing point as badly rendered strip lights flickered above. Doors blurred past me as I listened out for noise, the sound of laughter, of voices, of anything. It always struck me the amount of effort that was put into the game and the forums, yet the corridors between the rooms seemed like an afterthought, as if the designers had given up and gone home, and the poor work experienced kid had to cobble something together before the game came out. The inconceivable flickered in Dead Channel Grey. I banged at the door with a fist, and waited for a few seconds before knocking again. No answer. Testing the handle, I looked inside. The forum stood empty, sofa to the right, flush against the wall. The big screen loomed to the left. Various trophies lined a shelf. I didn't even know the game had trophies. I shook my head and made my way back down the corridor, returning to our forum. Entering, I recoiled at the sight of a man standing in front of our screen. He wore a nondescript grey suit and turned to me with a start. You're in. Sorry, what? You weren't frozen. You were in the melee, weren't you? I checked my HUD and brought up his username, sysadmin. You work for Gambit? He nodded and turned back to the big screen swiping through its menus. I sat on the couch. What happened? Who was that guy in the game? Clearing his throat, he turned to me and shook his head. That is what I'm trying to find out. It seems that anyone who was in the game or watching the feeds dropped out. Why? As I say, that's why I'm here. He glanced back at the screen, muttering to himself. Right. I nodded. So, everyone's just gone. That's what it looks like. He turned to me, tilting his head. 
except for you. You're still here. His eyes narrowed. Now, why is that, do you think? I raised my hands. Trust me, I had nothing to do with this. If you say so. His gaze shifted to the screen, running through the replay menus. You don't seriously think I had something to do with it, do you? I detected a slight shrug. All I'm saying is that it's a bit odd. Why would I sabotage our own game? Oh, I don't know. He tipped his head to one side. I seem to recall a bit of chatter about a loser leaves town stipulation. Let's be honest, you aren't exactly what I would describe as one of our star players. I laughed, but it sounded more nervous than I would have liked. Too loud, too forced, too hollow. He smirked, raising an eyebrow. I mean, when you put it like that, it does sound pretty bad. But seriously, just check the replay, you'll see it wasn't me. That's why I'm here. He brought up the last game, playing it from the start. As he flipped between viewpoints, I saw myself for a moment wandering around a blast crater rifle-drawn. See, that's me, I jumped to my feet. Why are you doing that? I thought you're supposed to be a sniper. You need to look out for the one with the weird shield. Weird shield? He rubbed his chin. We don't have shields in Gambit. He came into the game later. He didn't start when we did. Fast forward it a bit. He turned to me with a half smile. That can't be right. You can't just come in mid-game. We watched the stream for a few more minutes. The inconceivable strategy unfolded before us, moving like a single unit. They really did deserve to win. Sis Admin smirked. What? Did you guys not have a plan going in? Not really. We just... Well, no. What do you want me to say? We suck at this. The hacker appeared at the edge of the screen, the game glitching and warping around the shield, the fabric of the game tearing around it, exposing wireframes and jumbled code. See, I told you it wasn't me. Sis Admin's avatar juddered next to me, as if stuck between two expressions, frozen between moments. Hey, Admin Guy, hey. As I waved my hands in front of his face, I tried to prod him, my finger disappearing without resistance into his spectral image. What the hell? I watched as the rest of the battle played out before me, the hacker ploughing through everyone finally slicing through me with his oversized sword. Sighing, I clicked off the screen and dropped back onto the sofa. Sis Admin's ghost, fading. Chapter 7 Metal Detecting my visual perception collapsed around me as I returned to the real world. The effect was jarring, depressing. I got up and stretched my arms above my head, shuddering as a tingle spread across my spine and the muscles in my arms and legs pulsated. A beastly rumble emanated from my stomach. I wasn't sure how long I'd been playing, or even what time it was. Heading downstairs I heard the TV in the sitting room. It sounded like Mum was watching another property program, where rich people sell their big expensive houses and want to buy another even bigger, more expensive house, somewhere else. I hated those shows. Grabbing my cane from next to the radiator, I leaned through the sitting room door, fingers wrapped around the doorframe. I'm just going to get some chips. You want anything? There was a pause. Do you want me to come with you? I'll be fine, honestly. Could do with the fresh air. Well, you take care. Don't take any risks. I held back a say. I'll be fine. Do you know where you're going? Mum, it's the chippy. I slipped the elastic from around my cane, letting it unfurl, the four segments clicking into place in a fraction of a second. This cane was better than the old one social services had given me. It had larger roller on the end, about the size of a tennis ball. And being made from carbon fibre, it was about half the weight. The larger ball meant it didn't snag so much. You've never known pain until you've had a cane catch between paving stones and thrust into your gut. Resting the cane in the corner, next to the front door, I pulled on my jacket, checking my wallet for cash. A gust of cold air sent a shiver along my back and neck as I stepped outside. I closed the door behind me and held the cane off to my right. Margaret said I should hold it centre, but screw that. I'd rather walk a bit slower than get that jolt to the stomach again. Moving with a cane is easy. You sweep back and forth in time with your steps, taking in the obstacles ahead. I've seen TV shows in Gambit where they have blind people wandering round with sticks, tapping the ground ahead in a weird tentative way. 
and maybe different people have different techniques, but it's not like that for me. If you went around doing that, you'd never get anywhere, and you'd probably end up smacking your head off a lamppost. I made a right at the end of our drive. The smell of the neighbor's dogs hit me first. The combination of stale urine, disinfectant, and dog turd. A cyclist rode past, gears crunching as the rider turned the corner. Birds squawked somewhere to my left. Swept up leaves skittered across the asphalt, picked up by the breeze. Coming to the first curb, the smell of chips caught the wind. I turned my head and listened. Some people think that when you lose your sight, you somehow get superpowers and your other senses magically improve. That's not the case at all. I wish it was. I've learned how to focus and pay attention to them more than I used to. And if Hollywood's taught us anything, it's that I should probably have sage-like powers too, perhaps with the ability to see into the future. Yes, I may be blind, but I'm the only one who can truly see. I walked out onto the road, my cane clipping against the edge of a manhole cover, its end skipping up when it struck the curb. I followed its trajectory. Chapter 7. Metal Detecting My visual perception collapsed around me as I returned to the real world. The effect was jarring, depressing. I got up and stretched my arms above my head, shuddering as a tingle spread across my spine and the muscles in my arms and legs pulsated. A beastly rumble emanated from my stomach. I wasn't sure how long I'd been playing, or even what time it was. Heading downstairs I heard the TV in the sitting room. It sounded like Mum was watching another property programme, where rich people sell their big expensive houses and want to buy another even bigger, more expensive house somewhere else. I hated those shows. Grabbing my cane from next to the radiator, I leaned through the sitting room door, fingers wrapped around the doorframe. I'm just going to get some chips. You want anything? There was a pause. Do you want me to come with you? I'll be fine, honestly. Could do with the fresh air. Well, you take care. Don't take any risks. I held back a say. I'll be fine. Do you know where you're going? Mum, it's the chippy. I slipped the elastic from around my cane, letting it unfurl, the four segments clicking into place in a fraction of a second. This cane was better than the old one social services had given me. It had larger roller on the end, about the size of a tennis ball. And being made from carbon fibre, it was about half the weight. The larger ball meant it didn't snag so much. You've never known pain until you've had a cane catch between paving stones and thrust into your gut. Resting the cane in the corner, next to the front door, I pulled on my jacket, checking my wallet for cash. A gust of cold air sent a shiver along my back and neck as I stepped outside. I closed the door behind me and held the cane off to my right. Margaret said I should hold it centre, but screw that. I'd rather walk a bit slower than get that jolt to the stomach again. Moving with a cane is easy. You sweep back and forth in time with your steps, taking in the obstacles ahead. I've seen TV shows in Gambit where they have blind people wandering round with sticks, tapping the ground ahead in a weird tentative way. And maybe different people have different techniques, but it's not like that for me. If you went around doing that, you'd never get anywhere, and you'd probably end up smacking your head off a lamppost. I made a right at the end of our drive. The smell of the neighbor's dogs hit me first. The combination of stale urine, disinfectant, and dog turd. A cyclist rode past, gears crunching as the rider turned the corner. Birds squawked somewhere to my left. Swept up leaves skittered across the asphalt, picked up by the breeze. Coming to the first curb, the smell of chips caught the wind. I turned my head and listened. Some people think that when you lose your sight, you somehow get superpowers and your other senses magically improve. That's not the case at all. I wish it was. I've learned how to focus and pay attention to them more than I used to. And if Hollywood's taught us anything, it's that I should probably have sage-like powers too, perhaps with the ability to see into the future. Yes, I may be blind, but I'm the only one who can truly see. I walked out onto the road my cane clipping against the edge of a manhole cover, its end skipping up when it struck the curb. I followed its trajectory. The scent of chips hit me again and my stomach responded with a growl. Voices approached as I moved to the left of the pavement. I knew I was approaching some overhanging bushes. Canes get most of the things on the ground, but if it's hanging from above, 
It's all too easy to feel the whip of a branch across your face or smack your head on a sign. Nice metal detector, mate, one of the voices said. He was probably about my age, maybe a bit younger, and seemed about my height. His friend laughed. Yeah, you digging for treasure? A higher voice said. Dickhead, I muttered, approaching the curb. I stepped out on the road, and a car screeched its brakes. Losing my footing, I fell to the ground, head striking the asphalt, an explosion of purple and white filling my head. I groaned and groped around for my cane. The pair of heckler's footsteps faded as they ran away. What the hell? The man's voice stopped abruptly. You okay, kid? I sat up, rubbing my head. I... I think so. It's some blind kid, the man said to someone behind him. Just walked out on me. I'd say he wasn't looking where he was going, but... He grabbed my wrist and yanked me to my feet. What the hell are you doing stepping out onto the road like that? I shook my head. You nearly killed me. He pushed the cane into my hand. What are you doing out? Getting some chips. Pain throbbed at the back of my skull. Where do you live? Number 14. This street? I nodded. Pull the car up, the man called, talking past me. I'm going to take this kid home. You really don't have to, I said, running my hand down my cane, checking it was still okay. Come on. The man took my elbow and marched me along the road. I tripped on the curb as we approached my house. Is it this one? Which one? Fourteen. I nodded. You really shouldn't be allowed out on your own, kid. He rapped on my door. It's okay, I've got a key. I groped around my jacket pocket. He banged the door again, this time louder, and stood back when the IT opened. Brian? What happened? This kid yours? Yes. Mum said. You need to keep him on a lead or something. Shouldn't be out on his own. I'm sorry, who are you? The bloke who nearly ran over your son. The man walked away, muttering something under his breath. I ducked past Mum and ran upstairs to my room. I closed my door behind me and immediately jumped back into Gambit. The shapes and colours of the forum filled my vision, sharp and vivid, the brightness, the realness of it all. I flung myself back onto the sofa, leaning my head back as I stared up at the ceiling. With a sigh, I turned on the screen and browsed through the movies, TV shows, music videos, eventually settling on the Retro Games channel. I considered firing up Final Fantasy IX, figuring I could grind a few hours levelling up on Dragon Island before trying to take on Ozma again. The start screen flashed before me as a PlayStation controller materialised in my hands. Leaning forward on my elbows, I blinked, tossing the controller aside and switched off the screen. Logging out of Gambit, the forms and colours collapsed into a blur. I crawled over to my bed, pulling the covers over my head, feeling the pangs of hunger cursing my lack of chips and the trio of dickheads. I rubbed the bump on the back of my head and groaned. Chapter 8 Ticking I fingered the edge of my cereal bowl and shoveled spoonfuls of cornflakes into my mouth, the sound of crunching drowning out the slow, insistent ticking of the kitchen clock. Mum stood with her back to me, scraping butter across a slice of toast. I tried speaking to you last night. You went to sleep early. I was tired. I wiped a sleeve across my mouth. Decided to have an early night. The scraping stopped. So, it was nothing to do with what happened? I shrugged and dipped my head, testing the temperature of the tea with my lips. Can I have some jam with mine? Mum didn't respond. Have we still got some raspberry? I think I prefer it to strawberry. She let out a long sigh and slammed the butter knife down on the worktop. What? The ticking clock grew louder in my ears. Brian. She walked over to me, placing a hand over mine as she took a seat. That man said he nearly ran you over. What happened? Nothing. It was stupid. Talk to me. She squeezed my hand. His car was too quiet. I think it must have been one of those electric ones. I didn't hear him coming. He seemed very worried. Right. I took another spoonful of cereal, chewing in time with the clock. I'm worried about you. I swallowed and shook my head. Some kids were being dickheads. Language. They were heckling me, saying I was metal detecting. What, because of your stick? I nodded. Who were they? I don't know. Just some kids, I guess. Doesn't matter. A breath whistled from Mum's nostrils, 
her hand trembling over mine. It galls me that people would see someone going around with a disability, and their first reaction is to make fun of them. What is wrong with people? It makes me so cross. Sorry! I lowered my voice. Her hand moved to my shoulder and she rubbed my back. You've got nothing to be sorry for. Don't you ever apologize for who you are. Those boys had no right to make fun of you. If I'd been there, I would have given them a piece of my mind. It's disgusting. Treating vulnerable people like that. Right. I let out a sigh and moved the cornflakes around in my bowl, the clock pushing to the front of my perception again. The main thing is that you're safe. I wish that guy hadn't made me come back, though. I didn't get my chips. This is why I think you really need to consider getting some support. Margaret was telling me they do some good things at Mandela House. I groaned. Not this again. Mum slapped the table with both hands. You need help, Brian. And I can't be the one that always gives it to you. I can't always be there for you. I know. I didn't ask you to. Will you please admit to me that you struggle, that you need help? She lowered her voice. Because you do need help, Brian. All right, all right. I raised my hands. Yes, I need help. It's hard. I struggle. Happy now? I swallowed as my chest tightened and felt my mum's arm around my back. Don't just say it if you don't mean it. I need you to swear it. The corner of my mouth twitched. I promise. She held me for a long moment and I felt her tears against my cheek. Chapter 9. Headaches. The forum stood empty. I waded through the movies and TV shows, my eyes hardly focusing on the array of choices. After ten minutes, Harley arrived. Hey, did we win? I tilted my head, confused. Win? The melee? I gave a shrug. The idea of whether we'd won or lost the last man standing game hadn't occurred to me. I don't think anyone won. Not really. She glanced up at the screen, folding her arms, tapping her fingers. What happened? I think that guy who broke into the game froze everyone out. Yeah. Sorry I've not been around. Migraines. She tapped the side of her head. I got up and turned off the screen. You're the first one back. No one's been around. Harley stared at me for several seconds, then shook her head. I don't understand. I've been back in the game a few times, and all I've seen is one of the admin guys. Did he fix it? I don't know. It got a bit weird. Weird? Weird how? She folded her arms again, pupils turning to question marks. We watched the replay feed from the melee, and as soon as the hacker appeared, the admin guy just froze. Whatever that flashing shield thing is, it's kicking people out of the game. She sniffed. And giving me headaches. The forum door swung open, and Peanut entered. Not this guy, Harley said, rolling her eyes. I'm not here to fight. He raised his hands and looked between us. Either of you know what's been going on? Yeah, some kind of hacker ruined our game. Harley placed a hand on her hip and stared at Peanut. I think we can declare that melee a no contest. He sat on our sofa, flopping his head forward. He's not just wreaking havoc in our game. He's been going after other games, too. I've been around the forums. Uganda Knuckles, Meat Popsicle... My Sweet Roll and Excelsior Spreadsheet have all been kicked out. Did you get a headache? Harley asked. He looked up and nodded. Yes. Why? Like, a really bad migraine? Yes. That can't be a coincidence. She turned to me. Whoever this person is wrecking up our game, Dalton Jones needs to deal with it. Peanut let out an incredulous laugh. You think he'd care? He's just happy taking our money. I sat on the couch to Peanut's left. One of his admin guys was here. I think they're really worried about this. If people are getting kicked out, then they're only going to go elsewhere. The hacker's been going through most of the games. He stared down at the floor, head perfectly still. If he's causing these migraines, we can't be the only ones. My question is who's doing this and why? Harley snorted. Probably some punk kid sitting in his mom's basement somewhere, trying to feel like the big man. Peanut shook his head. No, this is the work of someone with advanced technology. Maybe it's the NSA or the CIA. It could even be China or North Korea or even the Russians. I laughed. Yeah, 
because you're such a threat. Maybe you're not, Mr. Bottom of the Rankings. He raised his chin. If it really did come down to a cyber war, we'd be the Alpha Soldiers. It only makes sense. It was Harley's turn to laugh. I bet that's the kind of crap you guys sit around talking about. She deepened her voice. Hey, maybe the CIA will be watching us killing pixelated zombies and want us to join the global war against cyber terrorists. I don't know, man, you'll be telling me the Earth's flat or that David Icke's actually a shape-shifting lizard. She let out another laugh. He snorted. These things are well documented. You can choose to be one of the sheeple at the mercy of the misinformation agents, or you can open your eyes. The CIA has tracked video game users for decades. This is probably the first shot in a bigger war. The battle lines are being drawn. Good one. An exaggerated grin spread across her face. Maybe they're scouting, maybe they're looking for you, because you're such an awesome guy. I sense you're being facetious now, so I'll ignore your sarcasm. Maybe it's one of Gambit's rivals, I suggested. Circle Tech has been making some aggressive moves lately. Peanut rose from the couch and rubbed his chin. That would make sense, though I'm still leaning more towards it being the Russians. Harley shook her head. There's a big difference between poaching designers and sending in a hacker to destroy a game. All I know is Dalton Jones needs to sort this, or maybe I'll find another game. I watched as Peanut scrolled through the live feeds, flicking past the empty game arenas. Hey, that's ours, Harley said. You do it then. Do what? If we're going to work out who this hacker is, we need to rewatch the melee, study his moves, see what we can deduce. Already did that, I said. It's not a good idea. You obviously don't have the capacity for observation and deduction necessary for such a demanding task. Hey, it's Sherlock Drones. Peanut glared at Harley for a second, then turned back to the screen. He brought up our battle, thankfully fast-forwarding through to the final moments. The hacker made short work of the other players. His shield flickered in hypnotic waves, bizarre pulsating colours. I was watching this yesterday with the admin guy. I glanced to my right to see Peanut standing statue-like next to me. I waved my hand in front of his face. Nothing. Harley seemed almost transparent, ghostly. Harley? Peanut? I stared at them for almost a minute, hoping for some movement, some sign they were still in the game. But it was no good. Sighing, I turned off the replay and looked through the live feeds, coming to a stop at a team battle. I focused on Super Green Sniper, seeing if I could learn from her tactics. Her movements were smooth and effortless, not at all like mine. She spent time hiding on higher ground, picking off enemy combatants and rogue zombies in quick succession. She pulled off a shot, and then moved backwards, covering her tracks on the ground. She was good. A glitch in the top right corner caught my eye, so I pulled the view back. It was the hacker. I watched helplessly as the figure ran through both teams, wielding the glowing sword and shield, pulling at the framework of the game, the structure bending towards him. I closed off the view with a shuddering breath and swallowed. Where is everyone, bro? Raising my head, I smiled as Socko spawned into the forum. He gestured to Peanut. Why is he here? And what happened to Harley? It's that hacker. It's been freezing people out of the game. How you doing, bro? I'm fine. Did you have a headache? You too? I shook my head. Seriously, bro. I thought my head was going to burst. It was like Andre the Giant had freaking grabbed the top of my skull and squeezed it. At least we're still here. Yeah, I was wondering about that. He rubbed his chin. We're still in the game? I nodded. I think we can safely call it a no contest. He laughed. At least one good thing came from the hacker. We were in some serious trouble back there. Harley and Peanut faded from the forum. What happened to them? We were watching the feed from our battle, and when they saw the hacker, it froze them out of the game again. He glanced up at the blank screen. Damn, bro, that's insane. Who do you think it is? I don't know. He's still at it now. I was just watching him in one of the other battles. Bro, I bet it's some ex-player out for revenge. I tell you, if we'd lost that melee and had to leave, I'd be doing that. Could be. Harley thinks it might be Circle Tech trying to elbow in, so we'll go over there. He laughed. Screw that. I already burned my bridges there, bro. 
Banned for 86 years, they said I was freaking cheating. He looked up at something and shook his head. Unfreaking believable. What is? Bro, remember when we were in the melee and you shot my power mace out of my hand? I swallowed. Yeah, sorry about that. It's gone, you destroyed it, bro. I got up as the door flew open and sysadmin strode in. Will you please stop replaying that video? I just saw that two more people have been ejected from the game. Socko turned to him. And you are? He's one of the admins. Yeah? Well, you need to fix this crap. Sis admin raised his hands. Believe me, we're on it. He turned to me. He's a hostile one, isn't he? Socko shifted his gaze from Sis admin to the screen and back to me. You watched that video. Which video? The replay. The one that kicked Harley out? Yeah. You're still here? I nodded. It seems that Neuromantic possesses some kind of immunity to the hacker's weapon. Really? Socko's eyes narrowed. Tell me something, bro. Why weren't you frozen out? I shrugged. Don't drag me into this. I've already had that peanut guy think it's the CIA or NSA or whatever. He squared up to me, head towering over me, mohawk like a coxcomb. This is serious, bro. He prodded a finger against my chest. If you're involved in this, I swear to God. I stepped aside and shook my head. This is you, isn't it? Are you serious? I waved him away. I swear this is nothing to do with me. It makes sense. Socko paced before me, rubbing his chin. You suck so bad that you don't want anyone else to play. That's weak, bro, real weak. Neuromantic has nothing to do with this, sysadmin sighed. They were in the game at the same time. Unless he's got two avatars he can control independently. Socko laughed. Bro, this dude can barely control one. I cleared my throat. Thanks. Sarko sat on the sofa and looked up at me. So what is it then? Talk to me, bro. Why is this thing kicking everyone out except you? I don't know. Maybe it's the bee chip. What the hell does that even mean? You're a bee chip tester, sysadmin asked, eyebrows raising separating from his head. Sokko got to his feet. What the hell is a bee chip? What the hell has that got to do with neuro? It's an experimental VR chip that gives blind and severely visually impaired users access to our game worlds. Bro, talk to me like a five-year-old. I swallowed. It means I'm blind out in the real world. It means I've got an implant in my skull that lets me see again. Well, in here at least. A long silence hung between us. I don't get it, bro. How can you be blind? I mean, I've seen your sniping skills. Retinitis pigmentosa. Bro, that makes less sense than a freaking bee chip. I gestured around me. This is the only place I can see stuff. I can watch movies and see my friends. This is more real to me than it is out there. It doesn't make sense. How's your helmet work? Sysadmin cleared his throat. With the bee chip, the signals bypass the optic nerve. His perceptions of the game world are the same as what you see through your suit. It's just, he doesn't use the same peripherals. Um, so, let me get this straight. You're blind? I nodded. Yes. As in blind? Yes. As in, can't see. As in white stick. You should have told me, bro. I let out a bitter laugh. Why should I have told you? I'm not blind here. I'm the same as everyone else in here. I can't let that hacker destroy the game. I turned to sysadmin. You need to get Dalton Jones to sort this out. We're all paying good money to be in this game. Socko shook his head. So you're blind, but you can see in here? So in real life you can't see anything? I groaned. Yes. Dude, that's freaking awesome. You're like Daredevil or something. He smiled at sysadmin. Bro. If Neuro's immune, he can end this. I raised my hands, shaking my head as sysadmin turned to me. Your friend might be right. First time for everything, I muttered. I freaking heard that. Sysadmin looked me up and down. What do you say? I shook my head. I suck, remember? Chapter 10. Tragedy. Mum pulled the car to a stop and switched off the engine the mindless blathering of the radio host cutting off mid-sentence. We're here, she drummed on the steering wheel. I don't know, I said, 
my fingers tightening around the door's armrest. I don't think I want to do this. You'll be great, she said, rubbing my hair. She leaned over and kissed my cheek. You promised, remember? Fine. Ducking my head, I opened the door and released my cane, allowing it to tumble outside its end meeting asphalt. I stood straight, feeling the autumn breeze on my face, the Tidal Husha of cars passing on the road behind me. As I closed the door with my hip, I listened to the faint thumping bass rhythm coming from inside a nearby building. Mum came to my side of the car, heels clicking on the ground. She hooked my arm in hers, leading me towards Mandela House. You're shaking. I swallowed but didn't answer. Inside the building smelt of food, sweat and disinfectant. The echo of melodies joined the pumping bass. Do you want me to stay? Mum asked, releasing my arm. I shook my head and sucked in my bottom lip. It's fine, it's just new, I guess. I'll get you to where you need to be and meet you at the door at four. She rang what sounded like a doorbell. Something slid across. Can I help you? A deep-voiced woman asked, a faint trace of flowery perfume wafting towards me. Yes, my son Brian is here for the class. She put an arm around me. Brian, if you want to wait there, I'll get someone to get you. I nodded. Okay. Mum adjusted my sweater, shifting it around the shoulders, pulling it away from the sweat that had gathered around my armpit. You've got nothing to worry about. She kissed my cheek again as footsteps approached. This is Brian, the deep-voiced woman said. He's here for the class. Come on then, a girl about my age said. Sorry, where? Just follow me. Shrugging, I turned to Mum. I'll see you later. Have fun. As she left, I followed the sound of vocal clicks and footsteps, catching up with the girl. Hey, I said, calling after her. I can't see. Me neither, this way. She opened a door. We passed through another corridor and the music grew louder. I'm Brian. And so's my wife, I sighed. I've not heard that one before. You should start whistling. I'm Rebecca. I take it this is your first time here. Yeah. It's terrible. You'll hate it. I laughed and followed her through the door towards the music and voices. The air changed, giving the feeling of space. Oh, hello. And who's this? A loud, drawling male voice asked. I'm Brian. I forced a smile. The man shook my hand vigorously and turned to the others, clapping his hands together. Everyone, we've got a new friend. This is Brian. Say hello to Brian, everyone. A dozen or so voices greeted me. Hi. Now, Brian, we've just started our dance lesson, didn't we, everyone? Do you like to dance, Brian? I rubbed the back of my head, leaning away from the loudness of his voice. Not really. Nonsense. He patted my shoulder, his breath tinged with onion. It's very easy, and it's a lot of fun. He shook my hand again. I'm Terry. I'll introduce you to everyone in due course. I find it best not to overwhelm new people at this stage. You just have fun, enjoy the lesson, and don't you worry about a thing. Right. Grabbing my shoulders, he positioned me somewhere in the center of the room, my shoes squeaking on polished wood. You won't need that. He took the cane from my hand. But I stood there, helpless, not sure what was around me, who was watching, or what I was meant to do. After a few moments, Terry stood a few meters in front of me and clapped his hands again. Everybody, because we've got a new friend today, I just want us to go back over the moves. I know some of you could do with the refresher anyhow, so this should be good. Isn't that right, Agnes? Licking the dryness from my lips, I stood and listened to him, outlined the dance moves, nervous sweat gathering around my neck. I felt a pat on my shoulder, and Terry leaned towards me. Don't worry about remembering them all, he whispered. You just take it one step at a time, Brian. No pressure. A few seconds later, five, six, seven, eight, by steps blared through the speakers, music distorting, floor shaking and squeaking with the soles of people's shoes. Terry cajoled me into dancing, moving my arms back and forward in time with the music. I picked up the pattern, moving left and right and forward and back. The music may have been terrible, but the dancing was much worse. I bumped into a woman and apologized. When the next song came on, I wanted to pull my hair out. There was probably a reason the song was called Tragedy. Terry stopped the music and clapped his hands again. Everybody, you are doing wonderfully well. 
Ethel, you're doing much better today. Give yourself a pat on the back. I followed his voice as he paced back and forth. This one is all about the arms. Don't you worry, Brian. I'll show you what to do in just a second. When we get to the chorus, you need to lift your hands to your ears in time with the word tragedy. Imagine you're trying to hear something very quiet, but that you're also surprised. It's like you're going, ah, oh, there's a tragedy, and you're raising your hands in shock. It's very simple once we break it down. But don't worry if you don't get it straight away, everyone. I'll come over to each of you in turn. He switched the music back on, then came over to me, lifting my hands in time with the chorus. You got that? I nodded. Tragically, yes. This is a lot of fun, isn't it, Brian? He shouted over the music. I guess that's one interpretation. You'll have to speak up, Brian. The music is very loud. It doesn't matter. As I waved him away, I stepped to the left, then the right and back to the left again, bumping into someone. My right foot hooked around their leg, limbs tangling as I fell to the floor. Pain shot along my elbow. I groaned, sitting up, my ankle throbbing. Are you okay, Brian? Terry crouched next to me. I brushed his hand away. I'm fine. I think I've twisted my ankle. You just stay there, Brian. He got up, turned off the music and addressed the room. The rest of you carry on. Our new friend Brian has had a little accident. Nothing to worry about. He restarted the music and knelt next to me. Onion breath, thick in the air. You could have said I'd hurt my leg. You've made it sound like I've wet myself. I don't think it's time for joking, Brian. Are you hurt? Is it serious? Is it just the ankle? Honestly, I'll be fine. I just need to sit down. Is anyone here waiting for you? I shook my head. My mum's going to pick me up at the end of the session. He scooped me up beneath my armpits, and I leaned on his shoulder, hopping to the edge of the hall. He guided me to a wooden bench, and I sat with my back against the wall. Do you think you'll be okay waiting? I'll be fine. I leaned my head back, gritting my teeth. Can I have my cane? I'll bring it to you, Brian. You just wait there. I told you it would be terrible. I turned to face the voice. Rebecca, right, I'm Brian. You said, and I heard the introduction, our new friend. Yeah, right. Here you go, Brian, Terry said, handing me my cane. Here's your cane, have you got it? I took it and placed it at my side. Thanks. You stay there, Brian. I don't want you having any more accidents. Right, Terry walked away. You having fun? Rebecca asked. Not really my thing. Not a fan of mid to late 90s line dance pop? That's a no. Definitely not my thing. So, what is your thing? I shrugged. I don't know. Music, I guess. Steps is music. It really isn't. What do you listen to? I don't know. 80s stuff, I guess. Paul Young? Wham. Thompson Twins. I shook my head. More like The Smiths, New Order, Depeche Mode, The Cure, that kind of thing. A bit of craftwork. Craftwork? Not exactly 80s, is it? I felt a hand on my shoulder and detected a whiff of onion. Brian, I've got you a cold compress for your ankle. I flinched when he drooped an ice-filled plastic bag over my hand. Thanks. Are you sure you're okay, Brian? Would you like me to call someone to come and collect you? Honestly, I'm good. This is a great thank you. Well, you just shout up if you need anything at all, Brian. Will do. Terry's footsteps disappeared into the noise of music and squeaking dance steps. You're blind, not deaf, Rebecca sniffed. What do you mean? Ever notice how people talk to you like you can't hear? I laughed. He is a bit full on. I wrapped the ice pack around my ankle and winced at shock. You ever heard of Devo? Whip it? Sure. I always used to think that was a song about dogs. Oh, right. Because of whippets. They're a type of dog, aren't they? Get you with your dry humour. She gave my shoulder a prod. I'm more into stuff like Pixies and Jane's Addiction. A bit of Nirvana, Screaming Trees. Ever heard of them? Sure. There's a guy I play Gambit with who's into all that stuff. You play Gambit? Yeah, right. Her voice trailed off. What is it? My brother's addicted to that game. I'm sick of it. It's good. 
I can see in there. It's just stupid. Meat space just seems empty compared to the game. She sighed. So sad. What's sad? How vi are you? Vi? Visually impaired, she sighed. You really are new. How much can you see? Not a lot. I can just about make out shapes and colors. It's getting worse. So is Gambit like an escapist thing? What do you mean? I don't know. Getting lost in a virtual world. Escaping the harsh reality of, what did you call it, meat space. My friends are there. I get to watch films, play games, I've got a social life. My life would completely suck without it. Why, because you're blind? I shifted my weight. I don't see how you could understand. I'm completely blind and I'm completely happy in the real world. How blind? I don't have any eyes. Yeah, right. Something squelched and her fingers brushed my hand. Open. What? Open your hands, dummy. I spread my fingers, palms facing the ceiling. She placed two glass orbs into my hands, warm and moist. I turned them between my fingers and passed them back. What are they? They're called prosthetic eyes. I can't see crap, but I don't need to hide out in some stupid game. Cringing, I handed them back. That's disgusting. I rubbed my hands on my jeans and leaned back. I've never spoken to a blind person before, I said after a minute. Thanks. She laughed. I bet you say that to all the girls. I'm serious. This stuff's new to me. You don't do anything with the blind community. What does that even mean? Just because we've got crap eyes, it doesn't mean that we're going to have anything else in common. True, but you do have shared experiences, people who understand what you're going through. Are all the people who work here like Terry? Rebecca let out a single loud laugh. No, thank God. That's good. He's a bit full on. I prefer the term patronizing twat, but full on works too. I smiled. I liked this girl. Cold wind hit me as I limped outside, one hand on Terry's shoulder. We stopped under a shelter in front of the door, water dripping onto the ground. How was it? Mum asked. Terry spoke before I had chance to open my mouth. Brian had a little fall. We gave him a cold compress, and he sat out for most of the session. We've filled out an accident form. If we could just get you to sign. What happened? She asked me. I twisted my ankle. It's nothing, really. She placed her hands on my arms. Oh, Brian, I do worry about you sometimes. She moved her hand away and I heard the scratch of a pen on paper. Now, I'm sure Brian is going to be okay, but just to be safe, I'd recommend taking him to casualty just to get him checked over. We will, Mum said. Thank you. Honestly, I'll be fine. He's just putting on a brave face. Aren't you, Brian? He reached down and shook my hand. I hope today hasn't put you off coming back. Hopefully we'll see you next time. He handed me my cane and went back inside. Mum hooked my arm and led me to the car. I winced each time my weight pressed down on my right foot. I'm so cross with that man, she said, fastening her seatbelt. He should never have put you in a situation where you could hurt yourself. You wanted me to go there. Maybe you should just wrap me in cotton wool and I can stay home all day. Rain hammered on the roof, so you can sit and play that game of yours. She sighed and turned the ignition, wipers whirring across the glass. There's no winning, is there? It was fine. Fine? We need to get you to casualty. Mum, I don't need to go to casualty. I twisted my ankle. I'll keep it up for the night. I'm sure the hospitals have got more serious stuff to deal with. What if you'd seriously hurt yourself? The car rolled forward. We approached the main road, indicator ticking. I shrugged. Then I'd go to casualty, I guess. It's not a serious injury. What happened? I fell over. I just misstepped and knocked into someone when I was dancing, that's all. They shouldn't get blind people doing things like that. Don't say that. I folded my arms sinking into the seat as she turned the car onto the main road, picking up speed. Did you enjoy it? Dancing? I shook my head. I'm not a dancer. I didn't enjoy that at all, and the music sucked. That's a shame. It was fine. I really wanted you to start going to the sessions there. 
I want to go back. Even after you hurt yourself? I can do without the dancing, but I talked to someone who knows what I'm going through. I realised I haven't really talked to anyone about this stuff before. And what did he say? She, actually. My cheeks grew warm. She? Well... She slowed the car, windscreen wipers scraping rhythmically through the rain. I sighed. It's not like that. Oh, I don't know. You go to a session you didn't like, talk to a girl, and then suddenly you want to go back? A mocking tone edged her voice. Mum. I'm teasing you, Brian. I'm glad you've got someone to talk to. I can't imagine how hard it must be for you. I didn't speak to her for that long. It's just nice there's someone out there who gets it, you know? I get it. You really don't. I do, Brian. No, I snapped. You don't. You couldn't possibly even begin to understand what I go through, day in, day out. I don't mean to sound harsh. It's just how it is. She didn't speak for at least a minute. I'm pleased for you, she said in a thin voice. I really am. She placed a hand on mine for a second before drifting back to the gear stick. Thanks, I whispered, hating myself for snapping at her. Chapter 11, Common Enemy I entered the forum and smiled at the sight of Frag Queen Harley and Socko. Frag Queen sat on the arm of the couch, hair in bright pink pigtails, cat ears poking through, manga eyes staring back at me. Harley sat upright and turned to me with a quick nod. The band's back together, I said. Bro, come and take a seat. Socko patted the sofa next to him. You've got to see this. I glanced up at the screen to see a couple of wrestlers climbing a ladder, their tanned skin glistening with baby oil. What are you watching? Seriously, bro? This match will blow your mind. Shawn Michaels, Chris Jericho, ladder match, no mercy, 2008. This match is freaking awesome. I sat next to Harley and turned to Frag Queen. How are you doing? She looked down at her cat claw hands, retracting the nails. Seems everyone had headaches. Apart from Neuro, Socko said. This guy is freaking daredevil. It's good to see you back, I said, ignoring him. He's got us watching wrestling again. I think he's convinced that this one's going to be the one to convert me. She made a dramatic A yawn. I think he just needs to accept that his obsession with buff, oiled up men, is just his way of coming out to us. That's weak, bro. This stuff is awesome. I like big boobs, frag queen, you know that. Sure you do, she laughed. I think the lady doth protest too much. Keep your Shakespeare crap to yourself, frag queen. You're not impressing anyone. I shook my head, grinning. Socko, if you like men, that's completely cool with us. You know that. Frag queen jumped into her feet, nodding. Where you want to stick your genitals is of no concern to us. Seriously, screw you guys. I'm not freaking gay. How many times? I raised my hands. Really, it's fine. You're among friends. Screw you, Neuro, and screw you, Frag Queen. He glared at Harley. What? Harley raised her eyebrows. You got anything you want to add? Do I need to get Staten Island on your ass too? Fool, this is between you, Neuro, Frag, and those oiled up men you keep watching. Don't drag me into your damn nightmare. Good, wait. Anything new with the game? I asked, before Sako could dig himself into a deeper hole. Harley shook her head. Whoever that hacker guy is, he's running through everyone. Hardly anyone is going into the arenas. Yeah, bro, and those that do get booted. That's too bad, I said. I was hoping to get some training in. Feeling a bit rusty, you know? Sako snorted. Bro, if you were any more rusty, you'd be seized already. You think there's any way that Hacker could destroy the forums? Harley asked. I flinched as the door swung open, expecting the Hacker to charge through with his sword and shield flashing. Peanut barged in first, trailed by Aerith Lives and Ipuna. R2 Detard shoved through the door behind them, dressed in Jedi robes. Sokko bolted to his feet, waving his arms. What the hell do you assholes want? Peanut laughed. My team and I were having a discussion and concluded that we should rescind the no-contest result of our previous melee. It is clear to anyone with even half your IQ that we were going to win. That is why I respectfully ask that you accept your loss like men. Who you calling men? Harley got up and shook her head. 
We don't have to listen to this fool. Relax, Harley, Socko said, holding out a hand. I've got this. He turned to Peanut. Screw you and screw the rest of you, freaking assholes. It was a no contest. Fair and square, bro. We're staying. He folded his arms and stuck out his chin. And anyway, Neuro lasted longest, so you should leave. Peanut and Epuna exchanged glances. R2 stood in the corner, watching. Neuro was the freaking last man standing. Step down. He gestured to the door. What happened to it being a no contest? Epuna asked, pupils turning to question marks. You can't just flip the agreed-upon ruling. Peanut raised his chin. And we've only got your word that Neuro was the sole survivor. Unfreaking believable. You heard this? He turned to me, pointing his thumb towards Peanut. Yeah, you should watch the replay, Frag Queen said. Over and over again until your head falls off. I shook my head. Guys, seriously, there's not going to be a game to play if we don't do something about this hacker. What are you going to do? Ipuna snorted. Miss them with your crappy little rifle? His teammate sniggered. Socko laid a punch into his open palm. Tell your crew to shut the hell up, bro. I sighed. You can taunt all you want, but we need to work together. I'm sure we can put our differences aside and get rid of this hacker. R2 laughed. Work with you, losers. Peanut raised a hand. The inept one has a point, R2. We must work against our common enemy for the good of the game. Yeah, once we get rid of that hacker, then we can have a replay of our loser leaves town match. That way they'll know they've been beaten, fair and square. Yeah, said Ipuna, folding his arms. Based on their rankings, I think they already qualify. As losers at Burgo, they should leave already, because they're losers. He turned to his teammates, grinning. They exchanged high fives. Oh, good one, bro, Socko said. Your mum come up with that one? What did you say about my mother? As I got up, I made my avatar turn red, and turned to Peanut with an outstretched hand. Have we got a deal? The inconceivable exchanged looks and shrugs with each other, and Peanut nodded, turned and left the forum. I dropped back to the sofa and stared up at Shaun Mikkels reaching for a glimmering gold belt, teetering at the top of a ladder, his frozen image bringing to mind the effects of the hacker. Was that a yes? Frag Queen asked, her pupils turning to question marks. I shrugged a shoulder. I think so. That was all a bit dramatic. She looked down at her cat claws again, yawning. What did you do that for? Harley asked. The less we have to do with those damn fools, the better. I say we should have nothing to do with that R2 guy, Frag Queen said. His username is just plain offensive. Who gives a rat's ass about his freaking username? The guy's a grade A douche, plain and simple. He slumped next to me. Working together against a common purpose might give us a bit of peace from them. Neuro's right, Frag Queen said. Maybe they won't be so bent on antagonizing Soko. Bro, not my fault. He folded his arms. Harley turned to him. You don't even know what antagonies means, do you? He shifted on his seat and shrugged. All I'm saying is that it's not my fault. And that's what I'm sticking to, bro. No one said it was, I said. But we can't keep going on this way. We need to focus on finding ways to beat this hacker and get our game back. That's on you, bro. That's not fair. You're immune to that migraine shield thing. You need to go out there and kick that hacker into next week. Harley shook her head. Trouble is, he sucks. I rolled my eyes. Thanks, guys. Chapter 12. The Tree Are you sure you're going to be okay? Mum turned off the engine. Yes, I groaned. Just stop going on. She sighed and got out of the car. As I unfastened my seatbelt, I opened the door, grabbing my cane and stepping into the cold air. I stood on one leg and rotated my sore ankle, still tender from my fall. Shall we? Mum took my arm and led me across the car park towards Mandela House. A blast of warm air greeted me as we went through the door, food and disinfectant smells wafting through the air. The door slammed behind us, shutting out the cold. Ah, Brian, you came back. Terry grabbed my hand and shook it. How's the ankle? It's fine. I just rested it for the night. That's good. His hand rested on my arm. 
Are you coming through today? Oh, no, I couldn't, Mum turned to me. I'll pick you up at four. She adjusted my sweater and kissed me on the cheek. You be careful. I don't want you getting hurt again. Don't you worry, Terry said, onion breath flowing between us. We've got a speaker today. Does that sound like fun? I swallowed. No dancing. You're safe from that for now, but don't think you're getting away that easily. He let out a chuckle that echoed along the corridor. Right. I rubbered the back of my neck, the corners of my lips twitching. There's nothing at all to worry yourself about, Brian. I know you had your confidence knocked yesterday. But don't you worry about a thing. We'll have you up there dancing in no time. He patted my shoulder. I sniffed. That's what I'm worried about. That's good, Brian. Very funny. You'll fit in very well here. It's important that we all have a good laugh, wouldn't you agree, Brian? Yes, Terry. It's good, Terry. We should laugh, Terry. Dancing and laughter are good things, Terry. Brian, Mum chided. I'm just having fun, aren't I, Terry? It's good to have fun, isn't it, Terry? Yes. His voice dropped. Shall I take you to the talk? Better than standing around chatting all day, isn't it, Terry? Mum tutted. That's enough. Terry gave a forced chuckle. It's all good banter. I'm sure Brian and I will get on just fine, won't we, Brian? We will, Terry. We'll be great friends. Mum sighed. Bye, then. She kissed me on the cheek and left, sending a gust of cold air inside as the door closed behind her. Do you want to take my arm, Brian? I've got my stick, Terry. I'll just follow. Good for you, Brian. He patted me on the back. I'll keep talking, so you can hear me along the corridor. Take care. There's a wet floor sign out on the left. I've tripped over so many of those things. It's health and safety, Brian. We have to put them out. We could get sued. I wonder how many people have hurt themselves on those things. It's the law, Brian. Health and safety is very important. He led the way along the corridor, my cane skipping across the gaps between the tiles. Pushing open a set of double doors, I sensed him waiting for me to pass before jogging on ahead. We're just going to go straight on ahead. You're just going to pass through some doors now. We stepped into the hall. The floor changed from tiles to polished wood. Low conversation filled the room. Now we've got some chairs out, Brian. I'll just lead you to your seat so you can make yourself comfortable. I folded up my cane and gripped Terry's elbow as he guided me to the seat. That's wonderful, Terry. Thank you, Terry. Now, Brian, I'm going to sit you next to Rebecca. Rebecca, you remember Brian, don't you? You talked to him yesterday during the dance class, do you remember? Oh, hey, Brian. That's good. See, you both made new friends. He patted me on the shoulder. You stay there and I'll go and introduce our guest today. Why, thank you, Terry. That's great, Terry. Not at all, Brian. You just shout up if you need anything. Anything at all, Brian. You just give me a shout. Right. Thanks. I waited until he went to talk to someone else, then leaned towards Rebecca. She smelt of ice cream. You okay? I whispered. I'm good. How's the foot? Fine. Just twisted my ankle. They made a fuss over nothing, really. I can't stand him. She leaned back. Who, Terry? Patronizing twat. I laughed under my breath, cringing as the feedback screeched from the speakers. Welcome, everyone. Terry's voice boomed through the PA. Today, everyone, we have one of our friends who wants to talk to you all and make you feel better about your disabilities. Oh, great, I muttered. Please give a warm Mandela house welcome to our friend, Rebecca. His claps echoed through the speakers. The people around me applauded as Rebecca squeezed past me. She let out a few clicks, unfolded her cane, and swiftly moved through the chairs towards the front of the room. Hi, everyone, she said. Can we turn this mic down, please? I think we can all hear. I shifted in my chair. Is that better? Terry asked. One, one, two, two. Yes, thanks. Most of you know me around here. I want you to know that you can stop being reliant on other people. I'm sure Terry and the organization aren't going to like me saying this, but you need to learn to do things for yourselves. All of you need to stop accepting help and just letting people do everything for you. It's sad. Society has taught us that the only way to live with blindness 
is to be reliant, is to be like babies, waiting around for someone kind enough to feed us and help us. And that's not the case. Blindness is an illusion, and you can teach yourself to see again. I shook my head. Troll, I muttered. How many mistakes have you been allowed to make? How many times has someone moved you out of the way of something before you're even aware that something is there? How many times has someone done something for you where you felt, hey, I could have done that? And not only that, they went ahead and helped you without you even asking for help. I'm sure they're well-meaning. I'm sure they feel great about themselves afterwards, patting themselves on the back, safe in the knowledge that they can tick their good deed box for the day. But how does it make you feel? You feel like, hey, why bother even trying? If they realized that was what they were doing, maybe they'd think twice. I swallowed as the hairs on the back of my neck prickled and a wave of tension spread across the hall. Someone got up from their seat and left the room, door swinging shut behind them. How many times have you been told that something you're doing or something you want to do is not what blind people do? How many times have you been told that these are your limitations? Live within them. Know your limits. Someone else can do the difficult things. Get in your box and don't make a fuss. I sat up, listening intently. You know what I think when I hear someone tell me I can't do something because I'm blind? I think I screw you. You've heard the way I move around. You've heard me clicking. I can get about just fine. Thank you very much. I don't have eyes, but I see the world around me. If you don't believe me, I'll show you my bike. A few people around me chuckled. I was confused. Every time someone stops you from making a mistake, they're taking away an opportunity for you to learn. I explore the world with echolocation because I refuse to let people stop me walking into things, because I refuse to let people stop me from tripping over things, because I don't let people stop me from making the mistakes I needed to make. Whispers and murmurs spread through the group. I know what some of you are saying. And I know some of you think this is a load of rubbish. But it's not. I know what people say about me. They call me an outlier. They warn people away from my method. But it doesn't have to be that way. When everyone's an outlier, it becomes accepted and normal. You can learn to see. You need to learn. It's not easy, but it's necessary. Stop accepting help. Allow yourself to drop things. To hurt yourself. And don't let anyone tell you that you can't do anything. Let you be the one who makes that call. People will have low expectations of you because of your sight loss. Challenge these expectations. Raise their expectations and it will benefit everyone. Sighted people dictate what we can and can't do in the name of safety and being helpful. Even if you takes you longer. Even if it makes other people feel uncomfortable or they're just itching to be the knight in shining armor who comes to your aid. Screw them. They're the ones with the problem, not you. Don't be passive. Be more. Expect more from yourself. Don't let other people tell you how to live your life. Live it and live it to the full. There was a long silence. Thank you. Can we all give Rebecca a round of applause? Terry said, returning to the microphone. Some very interesting views expressed there. Hopefully you'll be able to take something away from that. Of course, I must remind you all that it's our duty to keep you all safe. So let's keep safety in mind, above all else. Let's all give her a round of applause. Clapping turned to conversations as Rebecca pushed past me, dropped to her seat and sighed. That was awesome, I said, leaning in. I'm not going to get through to any of these people, though. Especially not with Terry's safety-first crap. He's just trying to do the right thing. But it's not the right thing. Don't you see that? Every time someone else has low expectations, every time someone else tells you that they need to do something to keep you safe... They're taking away your choice and limiting your potential. I sat back, letting her words swirl around my mind. You're right. You're damn right I'm right. Do you really ride a bike? Why wouldn't I? It sounds a bit far-fetched. You don't believe me? I shrugged. I don't know. She bolted to her feet. Fine. I'll prove it. I waited outside the main entrance dipping my head against the cold. A series of clicking sounds came from my left, accompanied by the high-pitched ticking of a bike. A brake squeaked, and the tyres skidded along the asphalt, coming to a stop a few feet in front of me. See, I told you I can ride a bike. How do you do that? Hear those clicks I was doing? Yeah. 
I'm filling the environment with noise. I can build a picture in my mind. But how? It doesn't make sense. Of course it makes sense. Our brains adapt. We can do more than you believe. We just don't give ourselves permission to do what we're capable of. Is this one of those, we only use 10% of our brain things? You know, that was debunked, right? No, it's using the visual part of my brain. I've just hacked it. How come I've never heard of this before? You said yourself. I'm the first blind person you've ever spoken to. Who would you have asked? I don't know. I rubbed the back of my neck. I figured maybe my social worker would have mentioned it, or something like that. Rebecca snorted, then laughed. You know nothing, Jon Snow. What? Didn't you hear anything I said in there? Social workers are part of the problem. They have low expectations and tell you what your limitations are. I bet you've taken those limitations to heart. I bet you believe them. Still doesn't answer the question. Why wouldn't she tell me? One, they think the idea is dangerous. My old social worker said it was reckless. Right. And two, their job is to keep you relient. That's stupid. Maybe, maybe not. All I'm saying is she's got a vested interest in keeping you from living up to your potential. You going to start telling me the moon landing was fake and that the earth is flat? What's that got to do with anything? You sound like you've cooked up some crazy conspiracy about the man trying to keep the blindies down. If you don't believe me, that's up to you, she said dismissively. Terry did exactly what I'm talking about in there. I gave a talk that could have genuinely helped people, and his response was to say that we need to be safe above all else. I don't want to be safe. I want to live. You don't need anybody else to keep you protected. We evolved as a species because people made mistakes and people learned from them and adapted. Our bodies can adapt. I've proven it. You should go on the telly or something. I have, she sighed. Loads of times. They put me on those sideshow segments, treat me like a dancing dog or a surfboarding granny. They like the image. They like the visual, but they don't like the message. They don't want to hear what I'm really saying. It doesn't fit their agenda. Agenda? I think you're overstating this. I stroked my chin. Why would they bother? Because it's scary. If you don't give people the opportunity to learn about the world through their own senses on their own terms, you may think you're helping them, but really, you're doing them a disservice. She pushed her bike for a few meters, then leaned it against the wall. I heard her flip her cane open. Come with me, she said, running away from me. I opened my cane and followed her clicks. She reached the end of the car park and continued onto some grass. Where are you going? I called after her. Just keep following me. I jogged forward, trying to keep up, my cane bouncing across the rough ground. I held my left arm held out to protect my face. I worried the cane would snag on something and drive into my stomach. I turned my head when she whistled and realized she was several feet above me. Come up, she said. I placed my hand on a tree trunk and heard her climbing, the branches above bending and creaking with her weight. I... I can't. What do you mean you can't? Of course you can. I shook my head. I don't know how. Just feel for handholds and pull yourself up. It's simple. What if I fall? Then you'll do better next time. A tightness gripped my chest. I don't know. Stop being a wimp. She patted the trunk. Come on. Stepping back, I took in a deep breath, my hands trembling. I'm not sure. You can balance, can't you? You can feel things, I guess. Tentatively, I groped around the trunk, found a branch, and heaved myself up, feeling around for the next foothold, the next handhold. My foot slipped and I froze for a long moment. A bug crawled over my hand. Keep coming, she called from far above. You're getting it. After a minute or so, I sat next to her on a branch. My legs swung below me as leaves rustled around us, a bird fluttering somewhere above, my heart pounding. She put a hand on my arm and leaned towards me. Good work. I knew you could do it. I felt her breath against my cheek, her warmth, the smell of ice cream. What about getting down? You really need to ask. I pulled stray threads of a dusty spider's web from my hair. I guess not. Have you climbed a tree before? Of course. Since you lost your sight. No, it's scary, you know. 
You've got two choices with fear, fight or flight. You can either face the challenge head on or run away. All I'm saying is running away doesn't have to be the default. We can face challenges in our own way, on our own terms. That was my point back there. It's still scary. She squeezed my hand. Of course it's scary, dummy. But smell those leaves. Listen to the birds nesting up there. We're quite high up, but it feels great, doesn't it? It does, it's cold though. Can we get down now? She laughed and slid down the tree, reaching the ground in seconds. With hesitant steps, I followed her, struggling until I made it to the bottom, a sigh of relief leaving my chest when my feet stood on firm ground. You're not really blind, are you? I asked, brushing the dirt from my hands. You're just trying to wind me up, aren't you? I popped my eyes out of my head and dropped them into your hands. You felt that for yourself? Maybe. I didn't actually see what they were. They could have been anything. Look, she said sharply, I don't care whether or not you believe me, I know the truth. I'm glad I'm not defined by my disability. If you don't believe me, teach me then, show me. Okay, come back tomorrow and we'll do something. Seriously? Yep, I'll see you around. She opened her cane and walked away. Yeah, see you around. I stood listening to her clicks fade and heard my mum calling me from across the car park. I followed the sound back across the grass and onto the asphalt. What on earth were you doing up that tree? I stiffened for a moment. Climbing. Are you out of your mind? I opened the car door and sat down. What's that supposed to mean? For the love of God, Brian. You twisted your ankle just dancing, and now you're climbing trees. Does Terry know about this? I've got a good mind to go in there and give him a piece of my mind. I shrugged and pressed my head back against the seat, fastening my seatbelt. It was good. Best feeling I've had in a long time. It's that girl, isn't it? I don't know what you mean. You don't have to prove anything to a girl. You don't need to show off. I'm not showing off. She... she wanted me to climb it. She did, did she? And what if you had got yourself hurt? I smacked my fist against the dashboard. What if I did? It would be my choice. You can't keep trying to protect me like this. I need to make my own mistakes. That's the only way I'm going to learn to deal with this on my own terms. She tutted. And where is this coming from? Her voice was higher than usual. Nowhere. I just think people need to stop having low expectations. I don't have low expectations. You can do everything you want. I just think you need to be realistic and you need to be safe. The last thing I want... This isn't about you, Mum. This isn't about what you want. I need to hurt myself so can I learn like everyone else. Stop trying to control me. You can't keep me in cotton wool forever, she sighed. Oh, Brian, I don't know what they've been feeding you in there, but you need to realize that I'm not the enemy here. I folded my arms and turned away, pressing my head against the cold glass. Don't ignore me. You've had your little outburst. If you want to be treated like an adult, then I say high time you started acting like one. How can I do that when all you do is treat me like a kid? I will not sit here and let you make stupid mistakes to prove some point to a girl. I turned to her. Her name's Rebecca, and they're my mistakes to make. Do you not understand? This isn't about you. I know you think it is, but it really isn't. You're always saying you want me to be independent, and that's what I'm going to do. But I need to do it on my own. She placed a hand on mine. I'm here for you, Brian. Don't work against me. I do understand what you're going through. She turned on the ignition. I slumped down, folding my arms. No, you don't. Chapter 13. The Plan Returning to the forum, I was surprised to see Socko and Peanut laughing together as they watched an episode of Father Ted. I grinned as Ted prepared himself to kick Bishop Brennan up the arse. R2 stood in the corner, back against the wall. Harley got up from her seat. Socko's been charming the inconceivable. I looked around. Where's Frag? She took one look at R2 and left. I don't know what's going on. Neuro bro, Socko said. Come take a seat. What are these guys doing here? It's okay, bro. Just trying to come up with an idea to take on this hacker. Peanut looked me up and down. Your teammate claims you're unaffected by the hacker's weapon. Is that accurate? 
I nodded. He's like freaking Daredevil, bro. He's got this chip thing. He's blind in the real world. Whatever's going on doesn't affect him. That's absurd. How can you be blind? B, Chip, look it up. I turned to Soko. What's the plan? Well, I was thinking. You know how badly you freaking suck. I snorted. That's your opening. Hear me out, bro. We're going to build you up. I figured we could go into a few arenas. I'll let you take pot shots at me and build up your perception. Peanut shook his head. You can't increase your stats using your own team. Otherwise, everyone would be gaming the system. I'm just thinking out loud, bro. I don't see you coming up with anything. Have you done the training missions? I shook my head. They're a bit tedious. You can build up your stats in those. I spent several days building up my levels before even daring to venture into a real game. That's because you're a loser, bro. Harley shook her head. Zip it, Socko. Peanut might be onto something here. Thing is, though, even if you're building up the stats, it's still not going to make you a better shot. Working on the whole point and aim thing might be a better use of his time. Peanut laughed. Of course it will make a difference. Otherwise, what would be the point of having stats? You build them up and it becomes easier to carry out actions within the game world. Any fool can see that. Who are you calling a fool fool? Nero needs to hit the damn target. I don't see how having improved speed or perception is going to help that. R2 cleared his throat. The higher his perception, the bigger margin he has for error. It really isn't that difficult. Where do you get off talking to me like that fool? Socko got to his feet, raising his hands. Bros, please. Nero's the key. We can build this guy up so we can take on the hacker. But he's terrible, R2 said. I mean, really, really terrible. I'm still here. I turned to Soko. Seriously, I don't see why this should be on me. Unfreaking believable. He rolled his eyes. You're the only one who can do this, Neuro. You can save the game. Take the hacker out. I hate to say it, but this is all on you, bro. I shook my head. I don't know. Surely Dalton Jones will sort a patch or something. I mean, I can't be the only beta tester. Peanut got up and stood at Soko's side. As much as it pains me to agree, he is right. We will work together and make you the best sharpshooter this game has ever seen. R2 growled. What's wrong with you? Harley asked. If we train this idiot to be the best sharpshooter in the game, where does that leave me? We may as well just let the hacker win. R2. You could be the one to train him. Peanut lowered his voice. You could teach him all you know. You could be Yoda. I don't care. I'll play something else. These guys shouldn't even be in the game anymore. Bro, there was a no contest and I was technically the last man standing, if you don't count the hacker. R2 narrowed his eyes. Perhaps one of you sent in the hacker so you wouldn't have to lose. Bro, we've already had the admin guy confirm this wasn't any of us, so how are we going to work this training thing? Get some montage music, I said. Maybe some hair metal. I'm not done, R2 said. I find it most convenient that this loser is immune. I bet he's the hacker. I bet he ruined the game so he could undermine us. I raised my hands. Honestly, think what you want, mate. It's not me and it's not any of us. I could easily turn around and blame either of you for being the hacker. But I know it isn't, so what's the point? All I know is that you were the only one who didn't get kicked out of the game. Sarko stepped forward. You're right, that's why we need him. I told you, bro, the dude's freaking daredevil. I don't read childish comics. Sarko squared up to R2. What you saying about comics, bro? Don't make me get... Socko's right, Peanut said, raising his voice. Socko turned to him, mouth gaping. I love this game, Peanut shrugged. We've got a greater challenge. Neuromantic is the key. We need to train him. What do you say? Will you help? R2 stared at me. What do you say? Peanut asked again. Train him, and then once all this has passed, it will be an even sweeter victory when we win. R2 shook his head. No. The forum door swung open and Cease Admin sauntered inside. He stopped mid-step, eyes shifting between R2 and Socko. Have I just walked in on something? I can go if you need me to. I was going anyway, R2 said, throwing his hands in the air before turning on his heels and marching through the door. Don't let the door hit your ass on the way out, you freaking imbecile, Socko muttered curses under his breath. You got any further with this hacker situation? I asked. Cease admin shook his head. 
Nothing so far. The best we can figure is the hacker seems to only be able to get into the game arenas. I think the forums are safe. You don't sound so sure. It's the best we can do until we know more. We've come up with an awesome plan, bro. Sis admin turned to Soko. Oh? We're like the Justice League. We're teaming up. He patted Peanut on the back, a broad smile plastered across his face. Peanut flinched, ducking away from Soko before straightening up. We figured Neuromantic is the key to this. We have agreed to help him become a better player. The idea is that he'll become strong enough to take on the hacker. At least that's the idea in theory. I mean, communism works in theory. His voice trailed off. That's an excellent idea. Sis admin turned to me. Your stats are pretty flat. So you might be best working on something easier to master than long-distance shooting. Bro, we could train you for melee. I've got some sweet moves I can show you, what do you say? I shook my head and stared down at the floor. I don't know. I've always seen myself as more of a sharpshooter. If I became another melee person, wouldn't I need to be on another team? Sokko didn't say anything for a few seconds. What you got to lose, bro? The game's screwed anyway. Peanut moved to Sokko's side. And for the good of the game, I'd be prepared to offer my mentoring. As you've probably seen from our encounters, my melee skills have a little more finesse than our bulky friend here. And bro, if you get rid of this hacker, you can do what you want on the team. We're Moira Brown's boys, damn it. We'll stick together to the end. We just need to finish this. My mouth twitched and I shrugged a shoulder. What do you say, bro? I raised my hands. Fine, I'll do it. As long as once this is over, I don't have to go around swinging bats at things. I was on me, bro. He hugged me, patting my back. His admin nodded at me. If you can wait until tomorrow, I can get a training room set up, completely private. I felt a pang of nervousness spread across my body. Okay. Chapter 14 Sorry. I made my way downstairs, feet sinking into the plush carpet. Tracing the dado rail, I entered the sitting room, flopping onto the sofa next to Mum. What are you watching? My question was met with a deep intake of breath. Mum? She turned off the TV, the room filling with silence. You really upset me earlier. I didn't mean to upset you. Is that supposed to be an apology? I shouldn't have lashed out. I... I'm... I didn't mean it. I cleared my throat. Sorry. I'm glad you're being sensible. She turned the TV back on, reducing the volume. There's no need to take unnecessary risks. I leaned forward, resting my elbows on my knees, and shook my head. I apologized because of the way I spoke to you. I shouldn't have raised my voice like I did. I sighed, feeling my hands clench. I'm not going to apologize for taking risks. I don't want to be one of those blind people who sits around doing nothing all day, listening to audiobooks and waiting for others to do stuff for them. But there's so much you can't do, and no one's expecting you to. For now, it just means there's a lot that I need to learn. I do worry about you, Brian. I sat back and folded my arms. Well, don't. Fifteen. The force is strong. What the hell is this place? Sokko asked, glancing around, wide-eyed. An infinite blue-green space spread out around us. Looks like an empty swimming pool, I said. Looks like a Game Boy version of Tron, Sokko muttered. Peanut rubbed his chin. It is really quite generic. I would have expected something with a little more panache, a little more flair. Woo! Peanut tilted his head at Sokko. And what was that supposed to be? That's your flair, bro. Woo! Sysadmin opened his arms and threw back his head. This is the super secret training arena. I shook my head. Right. There's nothing here. He frowned at me for several seconds. This is the best I could come up with at such short notice. His voice sounded deflated. Do you want to beat this hacker or not? I shrugged. To be honest, I was hoping for a montage theme from Rocky. You know that bit in the film where we get to see bits of training? Maybe try on some funny hats. He walked over to me and folded his arms. Neuro, neuro, neuro. This is serious, not some stupid movie. You ever hear of grinding? Of course. Yeah, bro, it's what his mum does on her webcam. 
Socko stopped when he caught Sysadmin's glare. Sysadmin waited for a moment, then turned back to me. This is your grind. We need to make a hero out of whatever this is. He wants you to be Keanu Reeves, bro. I grinned. Which one was he in Bill and Ted? Sysadmin glared at Socko, gaze shifting to me. This is serious, I shrugged. Let's get training then. Which of these do you think you want to use? Peanut brought up a rack of weapons. Blades like knitting needles, daggers, machetes, short swords, long swords, bastard swords, battle axes, claymores. Maces leaned next to staffs and clubs. A morning star hung over the side of a rack, seemingly ignoring gravity. I'd recommend starting with this. He grabbed an oak staff as tall as his shoulders and swung it in front of him in a smooth, horizontal arc. I ran a hand along the racks and sighed. I don't see any rifles. Seriously, bro, go for the mace. Maces are awesome. You ever seen me swing one of those bad boys into a zombie's skull? Smash! Peanut tossed the oak staff to me, taking his own when the staff respawned on the rack. He moved into a fighting stance, staff held diagonally across his body. Are we going to start? I really don't have to stand here all day listening to you two blather on about weapons that require a no skill. We are not here to learn how to smash the heads of zombies. We are here to learn the fine art of melee fighting. He began circling me then, stopped, dropping his stancy. This is ridiculous. You're not even trying. Well, give me a chance at least. Do you think the hacker will give you a chance? I'm not a melee person. Sis admin look it at me. Based on your stats, you're not really anything. I know you've got this idea into your head that you're a sniper, but you're really not. You, my friend, are a blank slate. You are a fresh piece of clay we can mould and turn into the ultimate warrior. I smirked. Does that mean I get to wear face paint? Don't go bringing the warrior into this, bro. You're Al Snow at best, and that's a freaking compliment. Peanut's sigh became a groan. I literally have no idea what you two are talking about. Neuromantic, look at me. What? I'll explain and I'll use small words so that you'll be sure to understand, you warthog face buffoon. I shook my head. What? Just copy what I do. Do I have to spell everything out for you? This is going to take forever. I took in his stance, pushed my right foot forward and slid my left foot back at an angle. Gripping the staff with both hands, I held it before me at 45 degrees. How's this? With a raised chin, he examined me like he was considering an abstract painting. No, no. He shook his head. Switch hands, you're doing it all wrong. I adjusted the staff and held it before me. Okay, I'm going to swing at you now, and when I do, you need to lift up your staff to block it. Do you understand? Yes. I flinched when he swung towards me, hitting my staff with a loud crack. The staff rolled out of my hands. Peanut let out an exaggerated sigh as it came to a stop. Try again. I didn't know you were going to go for me. At least give me warning. Do you think the hacker's going to give you warning? Don't be a child. I picked up the staff and moved into stance. Without warning, Peanut lunged forward, bringing his staff down, knocking me on my head. I glared up at him, pouting. I wasn't ready. He jumped forward and I raised my staff, knocking his aside. I let out a cheer and he struck me against my side. Hey, what was that for? You left yourself open. Dropping my stance, I looked to see Sadmen. Can we try something else? He shook his head, gesturing for me to continue. Peanut charged at me. I sidestepped, knocking his staff aside, parrying when he made a counterattack. Seeing he was off balance, I drove my staff towards him. He twisted, shooting his staff behind my legs, taking my feet from under me. I blinked as I lay flat on my back. Get up. That was a cheap shot. I didn't say things were going to be fair. Get up. I rose to my feet and leaped towards him, raising my staff above my head. He struck the back of my knees and I fell on my belly, staff clattering across the tiles. He rested his boot on my back. You are a sad, strange little man, and you have my pity. Don't taunt him, bro, Socko said. Let him up. I got up, picked up my staff and moved into stance. I will meditate, then I will destroy you. Meditate? Peanut frowned. Before he had chance to ready himself, I fainted right then left, brushing across his strike before hitting the side of his stomach. Yes, I hit you. He grinned. 
A few hundred more hits like that and you'll only be incompetent. Sokka rested his hand on my back and led me over to the weapons. That was some good work, Neuro. You want to try something else? You should try the mace, bro. I placed the staff back onto the rack and drew out a longsword, its blade gleaming against some unseen light source. I swung it a few times, feeling its weight and movement in my hands. This feels better. I put on my best Scottish accent. I'm Neuro MacLeod from the Clan MacLeod. There can be only one. Seriously, bro? Was that supposed to be Scottish? You sound about as convincing as Shrek. I shrugged. Sorry. Peanut pulled the same sword from the rack, turning it in his hands. My name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Bro, that was worse than Neuro's accent. Frowning, Peanut lunged towards me. I staggered backwards and parried the blade, smiling at the satisfying clink of steel. I circled him, crabbing my way sideward, blade outstretched in my best swordfighter impression. On guarde. I think you already passed the bit where you're meant to say that. He shot forward, blade coming down. You fight like a dairy farmer. I dodged to the right, my sword ricocheting off his. How appropriate, you fight like a cow. I pivoted and swung my blade upwards, grinning as he squirmed. This is the end for you, you gutter-crawling cur. He thrust his blade forward, knocking the sword from my hand, metal ringing out as it clattered along the tiles. With a smooth dart towards me, he tripped me to the ground and pressed the sword's point against my throat. And I've got a little tip for you. Get the point. I yield, good sir. I raised my hand, submitting. He pulled me to my feet and handed me the sword. Thank you. I gave a bow. What the freaking hell are you two on about? Sokko gave us both a confused look. I think they're stealing lines from Monkey Island, Sisadmin muttered. Glancing down at the sword, I smiled. I think I definitely prefer the sword to the staff. Yeah, bro, but you still suck at it, Sisadmin rubbed his chin. Well, this is why we're here, I guess. What is it they say? Making chicken salad? Dude, seriously, you've got to try the mace. Sokko yanked the sword from my hand and dropped it into the rack. He dragged the mace from its niche, handing it to me with a broad grin. Heavy and cold, I swung the weapon. It's a bit unwieldy, I glanced longingly towards the rack. Honestly, I think mastering the sword is the way forward. After all, that hacker's got a sword. Sysadmin nodded and smiled. At least you've got past these fantasies of becoming a sniper. I shrugged. I wouldn't go that far. But it is the sword you like? I nodded. I'm glad you said that. I've got something for you. A treasure box appeared on the ground next to me, and he gestured for me to open it, a smile creeping over his face. Open it, then. He flapped his arms impatiently. Kneeling, I opened the chest and it rose from the ground, spinning in midair, bathed in golden light. I reached inside and pulled out what looked like a black toilet roll tube. I examined it for a moment, tilting my head and exchanged looks with Sokko shrugging. Thanks, I guess, what is it? Sis Admin snatched the tube from my hand, gripped it, and an orange neon blade emerged in an instant. Holy crap, bro, it's a freaking lightsaber. That's freaking awesome. Sis Admin retracted the blade, turned the handle, and handed it back to me. It's a laser sword. We had a bit of trouble with legal putting this into the game. He shrugged one shoulder. We had to pull it from the release. You can have it. Soko let out an uproarious laugh. Laser sword? Are you freaking kidding me? That's a lightsaber, bro. Sis Admin shook his head and folded his arms. It's a light sword. Right, I nodded. So not a laser sword. He narrowed his eyes. Laser sword. That's what I said. Peanut looked down at the handle, shaking his head. How come he gets a lightsaber? I want a lightsaber. I'm better than him. At everything, frankly. Sis Admin turned to him, fists clenched. It's a laser sword. This is the only one. Peanut peeled his eyes away from the weapon. It's a video game, just copy and paste. Special item. It's not as easy as that, trust me. Damn, bro. Sokka placed a hand on Cease Admin's shoulder. 
This is freaking hilarious. Cease admin turned his pupils to question marks. Lifting the handle, I rotated it between my fingers, its black casing shimmering against the light. It's pretty unoriginal, Cease admin dipped his head. I just wanted to be a Jedi. Sniggering, I looked down at the handle and pushed out the blade, bright orange and glowing. I pointed it towards Peanut and offered him a smile. Choose your weapon. I'll keep to my sword. Sokko and Sysadmin backed away as Peanut circled me. I swung the laser sword towards him. Shoom! Peanut straightened up. Please don't start with the sound effects. Shoom! I lunged forward, hitting the sword from his hands, watching for a moment as it somersaulted through the air. Turning, I drove the laser sword into his chest. A chime rang out and my agility level shot up a point. Yatta! Peanut looked down at the laser sword with raised eyebrows and smiled. The force is strong with this one. I wanted to say that, Sisadmin muttered. Chapter 16 Roots Hello, Brian, Terry said, onion breath filling my nostrils. And how are you today? Great, Terry. I drummed my fingers on the reception desk. Will you be joining us for the dance class today, Brian? No, I'm actually here to meet Rebecca. That's fantastic, Brian. I think it's marvellous that you're making a new friend. Rebecca is a wonderful person, just... His words stopped a moment, making way for verbal clicks and a cane skittering across floor tiles. Ah, Rebecca. Hi, Terry. Your friend Brian is just here. He patted the edge of the reception desk. Yep. Her tone was short. Hey, I said. Hey, yourself. You okay? Take care, you two. Terry said, footsteps moving away, a door closing behind him. She let out a groan. I've never known anyone who grates on me like he does. He seems all right. He's a bit full on, I guess. Did I mention I think he's a patronizing twat? I chuckled. You may have mentioned that once or twice, yes. I take it you brought your cane? I raised it a few centimeters, letting its end hit against the floor. Yep. Good. I think for today, I'll teach you about getting around indoors using clicks. You're not going to get it straight away, but it's worth practicing. Okay. I ran my tongue across my parched lips. She made a vocal click. You need to make a vacuum in your mouth. Then you make it pop, like this. She made another click, the noise echoing against the walls. I copied the sound, producing a successful click first time. Easy. Where did it go? What? I rubbed my chin. Confused. Where did the click go? I... This is getting a bit abstract. Is this one of those if a tree falls in a forest questions? You don't know where it went, because you didn't do it with intent. That sounds a bit mystical. Not mystical. It's called physics, dummy. There are these things called sound waves and ears. You need to aim where the sound is going. You need to listen to when it comes back so you can build a picture. Right. Touch the wall to your right. Unsure, I reached out and placed a hand on what felt like glass bricks. Okay. Hold your face so your nose is about a centimetre from the wall. Why? I'm not going to hit you if that's what you're worried about. Just do it. Pressing my hand back against the wall, I moved my nose so it almost touched. My breath felt warm against my face. Now what? Now click. Aim straight ahead. I let out a couple of clicks and stopped. Now what? You keep going. Listen to what the clicks sound like, the shape of the sound. I frowned. Shape? Do you want to learn this, or not? I sighed and faced the wall again, clicking, focusing on the sound, not really sure what I was listening for. I felt a hand against my waist. Now pull away, slowly. Keep clicking. She drew me backwards four steps, and I noticed the slight change in the tone of the clicks. I hear it. It's different. When you get good at this, you'll be able to perceive the world. I can tell when there's a lamppost, a bollard. I can tell when concrete changes to grass. I can tell when I'm at the edge of the road. So... When you say picture it, what exactly do you mean? There was a pause. I don't know how to explain it. The more clicks I send out, 
the more I get a visual image in my mind of the world around me, the shapes of things, the edges of things. But you see them? My brain processes them as forms. It becomes a visual image in my mind. I guess my brain is filling in the gaps. I really don't understand what's happening. I can't read signs or anything like that. But I'd be able to tell if there was a sign there. I shook my head. I get how you can tell distances. But that's only when you're really concentrating. You're concentrating. But that's just because it's new. I just can't get my head round it. When people learn how to speak a new language, trying to learn the words and structures requires a lot of concentration. But then if they can immerse themselves in the language, it becomes second nature. So this is kind of like a new language then? Exactly. What you've just done is the equivalent of learning something like Japanese. And you've got to the point where we now know that there's different letters. Right. How long did it take you to get good at it? A couple of weeks to get the basics, but months. Maybe years, really. A sinking feeling spread through my stomach. That long. I didn't have anyone teaching me. You taught yourself? How? Because I had to. I don't know. Right. I licked my lips again. Shall we try this with moving around a little bit? You can use your cane to go down the corridor very slowly and focus on the clicks. I want you to tell me when you think you're about three steps away from the door. I swallowed. I can do that. Are you sure? You don't sound so confident. It's fine. Just a lot to take in. I let out a stream of clicks as I walked hesitantly forward, my cane gliding over the tiles. I came to a stop when the clicks changed and waited for Rebecca to catch up. A few dozen clicks came towards me, then past me. She stopped about five paces ahead along the corridor. Here. Come to me and listen to the sound. I stood to the side and clicked towards the door. I don't know. You can tell the difference. You could tell the difference when you were leaning against the wall. You've just got to get used to it. Okay. Let's try it again. We repeated the process five more times. Each time I felt no closer to tuning into the clicks. I don't think this is going to work. I appreciate what... You're not giving up, she snapped. I'm going to get you through this, if I have to drag you through. We're going to try again. And again. And again. And if we have to come back tomorrow, we'll try again. We're going to keep doing this until you start to get it. And I guarantee you will start to get it. I snapped my heels to attention. Yes, ma'am, she sighed. I'm serious. If you're going to learn this, it's going to take a lot of work. I know. I made my way back along the corridor, clicking as I went. We turned and marched back, stopping five paces away from the door. Again. I repeated the process six, seven, eight times. Following the sounds, I came to a halt at what I thought was three paces away from the door. I think I'm starting to get it. She let out some clicks and walked over to me. Maybe, maybe not. It's possible that you're just getting used to this particular corridor. What do you suggest? We'll try a different corridor, dummy. She pushed through the door and held it open for me, the sound of the dance class growing louder. What about the class? Don't worry about that. We're not going in. Terry's not going to make you dance to steps again. At least that's a positive. She came to a halt. Three paces from the door. You ready? I let out several clicks and strode towards the door, thumping bass interfering with the sounds. After a few seconds, my stick clattered against the door and I stopped before I hurt myself. Too far, she called. Try again. I went back to the doors. It's too hard with the music. We should try somewhere else a bit quieter. No, this is good. When you're outside, there are going to be noises all around. You've got to tune them out. You can't let things like engines, voices, music distract you. You've got to focus on the clicks, on the shape of the sounds. I mean, you need to really focus, really laser in. I nodded, like a sniper. The hall doors opened. Everything okay, you two? Terry asked. Yep, Rebecca said. Well, you be careful. I don't want Brian hurting himself again. He closed the door, deadening the music. Patronizing twat, she whispered. I laughed. 
Right, let's take this outside. The further we get from Terry, the better. Outside? A shiver passed along my spine. She yanked my arm and turned to the door. Follow me. I trailed her along the corridor, listening to her clicks. I don't hear any clicking, she said, turning back to me. Get into the habit. Clicking, I carried on towards the exit self-consciously. We went outside and across the car park, stopping when we reached the grass. Did you hear that? Hear what? The change in the sound. Concrete and grass sound different. You need to get used to that. Right. I sent out a dozen or so clicks, aiming first at the car park, then towards the field. The grass is duller. Exactly. You need to listen out for things like that. You're working with subtle fluctuations. She hopped onto the grass and I followed, heading towards the tree. Just keep coming this way. You'll be able to hear the trunk. My foot caught on an exposed root, my knee buckling beneath me. My forehead scraped along the bark, tearing through flesh. I cried out in pain. You okay? I groaned through gritted teeth, grabbing my ankle. Hurt my leg again. How's it feel? It hurts. Can you get up? Holding my breath, I tried to push up to my feet, cringing as a bolt of pain rushed up my leg. I winced, falling back to the dirt. You can get up. This was a bad idea. She pulled me to a sitting position, resting my back against the trunk. You'll be fine. I won't. Get help. Blood tricked down my face. As I reached up, I took in a sharp breath, my forehead stinging to the touch. Sighing, Rebecca got up and left me beneath the tree. I wiped blood from my face with a sleeve and held back tears, my ankle throbbing. The tree rustled above me, its branches brushing against each other, keeping time with the gusts of wind. A bird fluttered high above. Voices approached. What happened? The deep-voiced woman from the centre asked. He tripped over some roots, Rebecca said. I blinked away a tear. I'm bleeding. I can see that. Are you expecting a lift? I shook my head. Not until four. Anyone home? Mum should be. Right, I'll drive you. She helped me to my feet and took my weight on her shoulder. Stabs of pain burrowed into my ankle as I limped forward. I'll see you next time, Rebecca said. You'll be fine. See you, I managed, listening to her clicks fading. The woman led me to the car shifted the passenger seat back as far as it would go and helped me inside, closing the door behind me. Thanks for this, I said, fumbling to fasten my seatbelt. No problem. She asked me where I lived and put the address into her sat-nav. How did you hurt yourself? I tripped into that tree. I don't know what happened. Was Rebecca showing you her dolphin tricks? She started the engine and put the car in reverse. As in the echolocation stuff? Yes, I guess. She sighed. You're not the first person to get hurt, and I'm sure you won't be the last. The gears crunched as she set the car to drive forward. She can get around, though. I'm just new to it. So is everyone else who gets hurt. Listen, it's Brian, isn't it? Yay. Rebecca is. How can I put this? Her heart's in the right place, don't get me wrong, but she's what we call an outlier. She's found something that works for her, which is great. But she thinks because she can make it work, she has a duty to get everyone else to do it. Thing is, that's not the case. But she said she can teach me. She said that to a lot of people, and they all end up like you, getting hurt, having to be taken home. She's been warned before about this, but she is very... What's the word? Strong? Reckless. I think a lot of people get drawn to her because she gives these inspiring speeches, but what she's saying is completely wrong, and the sooner you realize that, the better. Right. We didn't speak for the rest of the way. She took my arm and led me up my drive. Wiping the blood from my forehead, I stood at my front door, shifting my weight away from my right foot. Oh my goodness. What on God's green earth has happened to you? Mum asked, opening the door. I fell. Brian had a tumble outside Mandela House. He wasn't in one of the sessions, so we were unable to supervise him. Well, thank you for bringing him back. Would you like to come in for a cup of tea or anything? No, no. I'd better get back to the centre. Thanks for the lift, 
I muttered as she left. I limped past my mum, ignoring their continued conversation. I took a seat in the sitting room, awaiting my lecture. Mum didn't come in straight away. Instead, she brought me a cup of tea and a flannel. You should go wash yourself. You look like you've been in a car wreck. It's just a graze. I'll be all right. What happened? I got up and headed to the bathroom as mum followed behind me. I twisted my ankle again. I caught a root. A tree root. I nodded and filled the sink with warm water, washing my face with the flannel, clenching my jaw as it stung my cuts. Mum handed me a towel. You weren't climbing trees again, I hope. No, I was learning how to get around better. Doesn't seem better from where I'm standing. I'll be fine. Who's this Rebecca? As I dabbed my face dry, I moved past her and back towards the sitting room. She's just a friend, why? Apparently she's been teaching you some dangerous techniques, filling your head with nonsense. That's not true. So who was it you were working with today? You weren't in any of the sessions. Rebecca was teaching me how to echolocate. That's absurd. You can't teach something like that. I took in a sharp breath, pulse thundering in my head. You can. It's like how bats get around. You make clicks, and you can start to use it to see. Nonsense. How's it nonsense? You're not a bat. I shook my head, confused. I don't understand. People don't echolocate. Rebecca does. She sighed. How do you know she's telling the truth? She can ride a bike. Lots of people ride bikes. Her hand rested on my arm. Without eyes? She doesn't have any eyes, Mum. She can see using clicks. Nonsense. She tutted, filling your head with such rubbish, I don't know. Mum, it's real, I said flatly. She can do it, she's been on telly and everything. And how long has she been doing this? I shrugged. I don't know. And she's teaching you? I nodded and we sat in silence. After a minute or so, I groped around for the TV remote, then gave up. I want to learn this. I need to have my independence. I don't want to be reliant anymore. If I learn this, I can... The tinny sound of a news report came from Mum's phone. I think I've found her. Who? Your friend on the news. Oh my, she's riding a bike. I said that. This is quite amazing. She's showing me how to do it. It was weird. She says it's like anything you try the first time. You just need to practice. It's just a new way of tuning to the world. She was saying our brains work in ways you don't really understand, and she reckons she sees pictures in her head based on the clicks. Mum turned off the video and let out a long sigh. Do I need to be worried? What do you mean? I took a sip of my tea. About your injuries? If I'm honest, I probably should have rested my ankle for a bit longer before going back out. It's hurt the same place again. I think I've aggravated it. Do you think we need to get you to the hospital? What are they going to do? Nothing's broken. I'll just fetch a bag of frozen peas and put my feet up. She sighed again and took my hand. I'm not going to tell you not to do this. I just want you to be careful. I love you, Brian. I know this is something you need to do. I'm just not sure if that Rebecca is the right person to teach you. She seems like a very willful young lady. I just hope she's not going to be a bad influence on you. Give me more credit, please. This is my choice. It's like everyone around me thinks they know what's best. It's like I'm the last person to have a say in any of this. She didn't respond for several seconds. Have you thought any more about getting a guide dog? I slammed my fist against the arm of the sofa and heaved myself up. No. Chapter 17. Harry Potter. As I lay awake, thrashing in my bed, sweat sticking to the sheets, my head raced with thoughts of Gambit, thoughts of Rebecca, the tension with Mum. After several hours of this, I figured it was too late to fall asleep, so I got up and logged into the game. The empty forum emerged through a sunburst of brilliance against the blankness of the real world. The strip light flickered above as I turned on the big screen. I lay on the couch with my head resting on its arm, my legs curled into a futile contortion. Absently, I bruised through the game arenas, turning my attention after several minutes to the list of movies and TV shows, going back through the lists of 80s and 90s classics. The cursor flashed over Malrats for a moment. I stared at the letters, 
their forms seeming to lose their meaning. Sighing, I pulled up the menu for retro video games and selected Final Fantasy IX, but I switched off the screen before it passed the PlayStation logo. I brought up my HUD and stopped when I saw a new option. Training mode, I selected it. Blue-green tiles stretched on forever, parallel lines converging on a vanishing point too far away to see. No one else was around. I checked my hoodie and set up a low-level VR simulation, bringing the laser sword from my inventory. A generic shadowy figure spawned before me, wielding a short sword. Pressing the button on my laser sword's handle, the neon blade appeared. Shoom! I couldn't help myself. The figure circled me and I parried its series of strikes. It came at me with predictable moves, quickly falling into a pattern of a swoop to the left, a jab to the right and a forward lunge. Gradually I pushed the figure's skill level up so it was above my own. Its moves were swifter, more explosive, and less predictable. I shifted on my feet, turning this way and that, struggling to return its blows. It struck me that controlling a sword was more about the feet than the hands. I wished I'd given the dance class more of a chance. As I concentrated on the figure, I ducked and weaved, staggering back when the sword caught my side. My movements became more fluid, my body seeming to respond before I thought about them on a conscious level. Even though I could tell I was improving, I knew I wasn't a melee guy. When I dealt a swift strike to the figure's neck, I scored another agility point, my overall level getting a boost. Bowing, I turned off the simulation and logged out. Arriving back in my bedroom, I realized I was coated in a thick layer of sweat and almost breathless. I made my way across the landing and took a shower. Mum and I ate breakfast in silence. She took my cereal bowl when I'd finished and loaded it into the dishwasher. I'm just popping out to the supermarket. You need anything? I placed my mug down. I'm fine. You're not still in a mood, are you? No, I just didn't sleep well last night. Ended up playing Gambit. She sighed. You really shouldn't be playing those games through the early hours. The dishwasher beeped, then filled with water, motor whirring. It's no good for you. I shrugged. I couldn't sleep. Mum opened one of the kitchen drawers and pulled out some carrier bags. She kissed me on the top of the head and left the room. Won't be long, she called over her shoulder, closing the front door behind her. I got to my feet, feeling near the radiator for my cane. With a flick of my wrist, I let the end bounce off the floor. The hollow plastic roller echoed on the tiles. I pushed my tongue to the roof of my mouth and let out several clicks, moving backwards and forwards, getting a feel for the changes in sound, trying to create a picture in my mind. As I moved from the kitchen to the hall, I peppered the space with clicks, attempting to picture the forms of the walls. Something wasn't working. I turned and my head struck the corner of an open door, filling my vision with a violet explosion of dizziness. I dropped to the floor, clutching my head, crying out in pain. Blood oozed from my forehead. I ran my fingers over a wide vertical gash extending from my hairline to the bridge of my nose. I winced as blood poured around my tear ducts, stinging my eyes, dripping from the end of my nose and pattering against the carpet. I staggered to the kitchen and grabbed handfuls of kitchen roll from its usual place, pressing the sheets against my forehead to stop the flow of blood. Once the bleeding slowed, I crawled along the hallway trying to clean the carpet, groping for patches of damp and laying down the kitchen roll, dabbing it against the blood pools. This is going to stain, I muttered. I padded into the sitting room and slumped onto the sofa, eyes stinging as more kitchen roll gradually soaked through. When I went to grab more kitchen roll, Mum returned. I'm back. It's just me. Her shopping bags dropped to the ground. What on earth has happened? She ran over to me, panic in her voice. It looks like a massacre in there. I walked into the door. I'm fine. She grabbed my wrist and pulled the kitchen roll away from my face. You most certainly aren't. When did this happen? Just after you left. She lifted the shopping bags and carried them to the kitchen, hurriedly shoving things into the fridge and freezer. With a jerk... She grabbed my hand and pulled me to the door. What are you doing? We're getting that scene to. It's fine, honestly. You look like someone has attacked you with a knife. They can take a look at your ankle while we're there. Where? Realization dawning, I raised my hands. I'm not going to the hospital. 
Yes, you are. This has gone far enough. She led me to the car, slamming the front door behind her. Seatbelt, she snapped, starting the engine. Surrounded by drunks and screaming babies, we waited in casualty for three hours, exchanging small talk and drinking bad coffee from a machine, before a doctor finally came to see me. We followed her along the corridor, and she guided me onto a bed, the sound of railed curtains closing around us. Gloves snapped over her hands and she prodded around my cut. Can you tell me what happened? She sounded bored, perhaps tired, or perhaps she was annoyed at having to waste her time dealing with me when there were other patients who weren't just there because of a cut. I walked into a door. There was a pause. A door. The side of a door. The edge, really. You're going to have a wicked scar. You'll look like Harry Potter. That's all I need. There's your ankle as well. Mum shifted on the seat next to me. Can I see? I pulled at my jeans and removed my socks. It's just twisted. I tripped over it a couple of times. The doctor's hand pressed around my foot, manipulating my ankle this way and that. There's certainly a lot of swelling. How does this feel? She pressed against my bone. It's fine. Hurts a bit. You need to rest. It doesn't seem like there's anything torn or broken. Right. We have to get that cut cleaned up and close the wound. It might be best to do it with anaesthetic. You're not putting him under, are you? Mum asked. Just local anaesthetic, nothing to worry about. The doctor went away for a few minutes. Mum squeezed my hand. Are you okay? I'm all right, just feel a bit daft. Don't. I know I was cross earlier, but I know it wasn't your fault. Thanks. When the doctor returned, she cleaned the wound with swabs, tearing away dried strips of kitchen roll. A male anaesthetist arrived and injected me near the wound. The sensation of coldness spread across the top half of my head. The uncanny feeling of my skin moving without sensation came over me. I can't watch this, Mum said, leaving the cubicle. Do you think you'll be okay here while I get a coffee? I'll be fine. The doctor stitched the wound closed. The thread tugged at my flesh. She cleaned my forehead again and snapped off her gloves, squirting something on her hand from a wall dispenser. Oh dear, Mum said, returning. My beautiful son. Chapter 18. Stealth. Sis admin stood a few inches from my face when I logged into Gambit. I staggered back and looked around. Harley and Aerith glanced up at me from the couch. Ah, you're here, finally, Sis admin said, turning to me. Harley got to her feet. What happened to you? I ended up in hospital, had to get my head stitched up. No, seriously. She folded her arms, head tipped to one side. I waved my hands and shrugged. It's true. I walked into the side of the door, split my head open. I ran a finger down the centre of my forehead. She raised her eyebrows. Damn, you okay? I nodded. What's the plan? C's admin stepped forward. Well, as you can see, Harley Q and Aerith lives are waiting for you. He hesitated for a moment, focusing on Aerith. I tried everything, you know. There's no way around it. Question marks filled Aerith's eyes as he looked between me and Harley. What's the admin nerd talking about? I don't know. I shrugged. Sees admin let out a long sigh. Your name? I tried leveling up. I tried different character configurations. She always dies. There's no way around it. I don't think I ever really got over it. Oh. I get it. You're trying to bond with me on some emotional level. I shook my head. Judging by who's here, I guess we're doing stealth training. Sis admin nodded. Indeed. Excellent. That will come in useful with my sharpshootering. I don't think sharpshooter's a verb. Aerith frowned. It is if I make it one. I made my avatar give a Cheshire cat grin, holding it for slightly too long. He let out a deep sigh. What? You need to rethink your position. Your skills aren't in marksmanship. Is that why you gave me the lightsaber? You think I want to do melee stuff? I shook my head. That's not me. It's a laser sword. I smirked. Of course it is. He groaned, and the game world faded out for a short moment. We emerged in the training arena. Very original, Aerith muttered, rolling his eyes.
It's the training stage off Street Fighter. I needed to throw something together in a hurry. Sysadmin looked around. I'd like to see you do better. I shook my head. How am I supposed to do stealth training when... The world shifted and a ruined city emerged around us. Sorry, what were you saying? Sysadmin tilted his head, regarding me with a grin. I shrugged. Doesn't matter. Harley let out a snort. Damn. This admin guy sure knows how to turn up the smug factor. That's some serious smuggery right there. Ignoring her, Sis Admin cleared his throat. I've set up a basic capture the flag scenario, except it's just going to be you. The idea is to get from here to here. The map appeared on my HUD and two dots flashed, white on green. You got that? Yep. So, capture the flag? I'm going to put in some zombies, he said to himself. What weapons can I use? He glanced up at me. No weapons. This is about stealth. I swept my gaze across the landscape, all cracked concrete and twisted girders. Zombies appeared, frozen in the distance, their clothes hanging in rags. It was like something from a Romero movie, only with better effects. I turned to Harley. What do you suggest? She remained silent for several seconds, considering the landscape. You want to stick to the shadows, keep an eye on your sight lines. What do you mean? Well, if you've got a visual on a deadhead, they've probably got a visual on you. I nodded. Right, stick to the walls, check my sight lines. Got it. Anything else? Harley shrugged. That's all I do. Erith let out a laugh. There's more to it than that. No wonder you guys suck. He turned to me. Harley Q has got the basics down. Stick to the shadows. Creep close to walls. Keep flat against surfaces. Look down at your feet. If you're walking on loose stones or over twigs, chances are you are going to make noise. He scanned the buildings and pointed to an alleyway between a pair of half-destroyed concrete tower blocks. Avoid places like that, when you've got a small gap between two buildings. One, your feet are going to echo, and two, you always need to make sure you're not going to get cornered. I followed his gaze, taking it all in. Right. I'm not done, you need to know your lines. Harley said that. No, she didn't. She was talking about visual stuff, getting spotted by zombies. It just shows her complete ignorance. For this, I'm talking about always being three, four steps ahead. You need to know where you're going in advance. You need to know your route. Keep low and keep quiet. The key to good stealth is to be patient. Choose your spots. Got it? I've had entire battles where I've waited in the same place for almost an hour. I'm a tactician. This is a human game of chess. An hour? Sounds tedious, he shrugged. Perhaps. But that commitment, that level of discipline, that's what sets us apart from, oh, I don't know, maybe one of those loser teams, like Moira Brown's boys. Screw you, Harley snapped. Cease admin stepped between them and raised his hands. You can take shots at each other when we've got rid of this hacker. Let's work together and focus. Is that okay, children? Do I need to start using the naughty step? Can't you just kick the hacker out of the game? Harley asked. There was a long silence. Well? No. We're not... We're not really sure what to do. So what you're saying is, Dalton Jones is willing to take our money, but not fix this. It's not as simple as that. I waved my hands. If I'm the only who can beat the hacker, then standing around debating who should do what isn't going to help. Harley stared at me for a few seconds, then tossed her hands up, stepping backwards. Shall I go? Cesar Mean patted my shoulder. Go get the flag. Remember what I... Aerith's voice cut out abruptly. Hello, anyone? I spun on my feet. I was alone. Fissured asphalt stretched ahead, buildings looming either side. Behind me, a mountain of rubble conveniently blocked the path. Movement caught my eye in the distance the first of the zombies heading my way. A fire escape wound up to a rooftop to my right. I ran towards it, climbing the steps, flecks of rust raining down on me. Reaching the roof, I dropped to my belly and crawled to the opposite edge. I glanced up at the towering statue of a gorilla, Harambe etched onto its stone plinth. Shaking my head, I turned my attention back to the street below, considering its layout, and brought up my map. 
The road extended towards a T-junction, where I would need to take a right. The zombies staggered in a sparse procession, their number concentrated near the flag. There's no way I can do this, I muttered. I thought about what Harley and Aerith had said about planning my lines, and compared the path of the streets to the map, looking for nooks and shadows along the route to best hide from the deadheads. It was going to be a challenge. Dropping down from the rooftop, I sidestepped smoothly along the road on bended knees, wishing I could move like that in the real world. Waiting in a doorway, I listened for footsteps, my back pressed against a generic, featureless door. I peeked out for a brief moment and I spotted a zombie no more than twenty metres away. Without thinking, I reached for my weapon, frowning when the option was locked. I bolted towards the next building on my right, jumping into its ruins through an empty window frame, broken glass shards glinting against an unseen light source. The concrete stairwell ascended to nowhere, fading into a claw of corkscrewed steel. The sound of scraping footsteps filled the room. I looked around the window, the lens glare of sunlight obscuring my view. Taking in a deep breath, I crept to the farthest corner on the left and squeezed out through the window, dropping into an alleyway. I froze at the sight of two zombies, seemingly focused on the remains of a dead cat or perhaps a small dog. Whatever it was, the designers had clearly taken a great amount of delight in depicting its glistening gora. When I thought about the lack of detail on some parts of the game world, I shook my head. Something cracked beneath my foot. The nearest zombie's attention shifted towards me. The second zombie grunted, eyes fixing on me, grunts turning into low, almost wolf-like moans. I charged onto the road and ran towards the junction. The growls seemed to spread, filling my ears with a guttural drone. They clogged up the street to my right, acting as a fleshy wall between myself and the flag, rotting hands clawing towards me. A group of fiends circled me, surrounding me. I tried to strike out with fists, but the option was locked. The nearest zombie lurched towards me, biting down on my right arm and shoulder. They swarmed me and the screen faded to black. I found myself back at the start of the simulation. Harley and Aerith stood a few paces back. Cease admin sniffed, arms folded. Well, that was a waste of time. I don't know what happened, he shook his head. What happened is, you didn't listen. Are you taking this seriously or what? Harley stepped forward. Just lay off him, he's not done this before. That's for sure, Aerith said. I glanced along the empty street. I thought I was doing okay. I did the thing he said with the lines. It didn't look like that to me. So what did I do wrong? Aerith shrugged. Where do you even start answering a question like that? I think you panicked, Harley said. You started off well enough, but then you just seemed to forget everything we'd said. I nodded. Maybe. You remember what I said about patience? Aerith asked. Yeah. You heard it then? You were actually listening. You took it in. I clenched my fists. Sorry, what are you on about? The idea of a lesson is to learn. You absolute golem. You rushed into a horde of zombies, and you were subsequently swarmed. It's not a difficult course. You just need to show a bit of restraint, a bit of self-control. Show me, then. Aerith and Sis Admin exchanged glances. We haven't got time for this, Sis Admin said. Just try again, keep focused, take your time. He let out a long sigh. I don't know, just do what they said. And I could tell you were trying to go for your weapon. Aerith said. You wasted several seconds. I nodded. Instinct. Foolishness. You need to adapt your behavior to your context, and you looked ridiculous. Right. Lesson learned. You ready? Sis Admin asked. Yeah. The simulation began the same way. Zombies just visible in the distance. I moved to the left, ducking into the shadows of a looming concrete tower block, pressing against the walls with my back, skirting between cracks and crevices. I crawled past a towering mound of rubble at least three times my height and passed my first zombie. I made my way up the mound to get a better view, shifting stones clattering beneath my feet tumbling towards the road. Cursing, I scrambled down, ducking behind the shell of a rusted estate car. A zombie staggered into view, searching around the rubble. I stopped myself getting up as soon as it turned its head away. I held my breath, waiting. After a minute or so, the zombie shambled away, disappearing around the corner of a building. 
I glanced across the street towards the alleyway where I'd been caught out last time. The same group of zombies huddled inside, no doubt still feasting on the incredibly rendered cat or dog. They didn't see me. As I reached the end of the building, I pushed my back against the corner and peeped around the wall. To my left, the group of zombies waited, the road conveniently blocked after thirty or so metres by a collapsed wall. The tattered red flag waved on a pole about eighty metres to my right, several hundred zombies standing between us. I scanned the street, searching for hiding places. I dived for cover in the trailer of a nearby pickup truck, lying face down on the waves of painted metal. Tension swept over me as a zombie scraped along the trailer's side, its throat letting out low, gurgling moans. I waited for over a minute before raising my head. The zombie had passed. Dropping from the truck, I scurried across the road and onto the street with the flag. As I clambered into the window to my right, I found myself in a bare concrete room. I crouched below the window line, creeping towards the far corner, moving deeper into the gloom, searching for a doorway or crack I could squeeze through. The wall stood flat, featureless, its uniform brickwork mocking me. Working back towards the window, I climbed out and glanced upwards, tracing the lines of window sills and rooftops, wondering if I could reach the flag without actually stepping onto the road itself. I caught sight of a fire escape leading to a rooftop on the opposite side of the road and ran towards it, abandoning all efforts to remain hidden. The zombies let out a chorus of groans as I charged up the steps. Reaching the roof, I stopped and waited, looking over the edge as a sea of dead flesh swelled towards me. I leant over the stairs, laughing as they clawed uselessly at the lower steps. Who knew they couldn't climb? I strode across the rooftop, measuring the gap to the next building. Moving back to its centre, I ran forward and leaped from the edge, hitting the opposite wall face first, sliding down to the ground, my energy taking a hit. Zombies piled on me, tearing at my body before the game faded to black. You're not even trying, are you? Sysadmin spat. You're kidding, right? I got way further. You've learnt nothing. You thought you could just drop stealth mode? I shrugged. I guess. I thought I could make it. He tossed his hands into the air, face turning red. This game is falling down around us and you're not even trying. I took in a deep breath. I am. If you don't get this, it's over. He leaned towards me, eyes narrowing. Do you understand? I shook my head and scoffed. You can't put this on me. I don't have to listen to this. I'm going. I'll save you the trouble. He faded from the game. I let out a long sigh and turned to Harley. Was I really that bad? Don't listen to him. You were doing great. I think the pressure's getting to him a bit. People are complaining. And leaving. Aerith muttered. You need to get a bit more crafty. You can't just go running into things like that. She's right. The admin guy was getting a bit tetchy while you were in the game. I swallowed. What now? Now? Aerith stared at me for several seconds. Now you try again. And you keep trying until you get that flag. Any tips? Harley and Aerith looked at each other, mirroring each other's shrugs. Use your wits, Aerith said. You almost had it. Okay. The pair faded, and the mission started before I could ask another question. The zombies started to move, slow and shambling. It struck me that their movements were exactly the same as last time. Dipping my head, I followed my lines along the left-hand wall, crouching, then crawling, then stopping behind the rubble. Scaling the mound, I tossed stones onto the asphalt to draw the zombies' attention, and waited, a handful of them turning towards me. As I scrambled down, I ducked behind the wrecked estate car until they disappeared again. I ran back up the mound and filled my inventory with fifty stones. They would have been too heavy to carry in the real world, but for some reason that didn't matter in the game. Unencumbered by the extra weight, I dashed towards the pickup truck, hiding in the trailer again. I lay flat as the zombie scraped along its side, glancing up at the steps ahead. Dropping from stealth mode, I charged along the street, rushing up onto the rooftop. Several zombies spotted me, their grunts turning to moans. Several hundred deadheads turned towards the noise moving in my direction. Instead of approaching the flag, I skirted left along the roof's edge until I stood above the pickup truck. Taking the first rock, I threw it towards the truck, missing. Adjusting my aim, 
I tossed another stone from my inventory, smiling as it landed in the center of the trailer, with an explosion of dust and a deep metallic thud. The noise caught the attention of more zombies. I chucked another rock, and another. Zombies heaved forward, swarming around the trailer. I continued to pound it with stones until the path to the flag grew clear. I watched and waited for several seconds, then dropped to the street, a chunk of my life flashing away. Back in stealth mode, I followed the line of the wall to my left, running forward in a waddling crouch. The flag waved ahead. The first of the zombies spotted me and turned its attention from the pickup truck. I quit stealth mode and charged forward, running full speed as the zombies surged towards me. After a few seconds, I grabbed the red flag, tearing it from the pole and waved it above my head, laughing as my sneak skill increased. Yata! Victory chimes sounded, and I found myself back in the tiled training area. Harley greeted me with question marks, replacing her pupils. You did it? A pyric victory, Aerith grumbled. What have penises got to do with anything? I asked, tilting my head in confusion. Pyric, not phallic. It means that you may have won, but it was a hollow victory. I shrugged. I won. The mission was to capture the flag. I captured the flag. I rubbed my hands together. And I got the skill points. You were meant to use your stealth ability. I did. And then I used my wits. I brought up my hood, projecting my increased stats between us. See? You've completely missed the point of the exercise. Aerith folded his arms. This sneaking around stuff isn't for me. I want to practice my shooting. He sighed. Well, it's not up to us. You will have to speak to Sysadmin. Yeah, if and when he ever calms down, Harley said. My smile dropped. Right. Chapter 19. Filling in the Nothing. I waited in Mandela House's reception for almost twenty minutes before Rebecca finally arrived. I didn't expect you here today, she said, sidling up to me. Oh, wh what do you mean? She let out a laugh. Because, dummy, the last time I saw you, your ankle was about to fall off or something. Most people tend to quit around that point. That? Oh, that was nothing. I'm fine. Shall we carry on? She didn't say anything for a few seconds. What is it? She took in a breath and her voice lowered. I don't think it's a good idea. It's a great idea. You said yourself we should be allowed to make our own mistakes. That's how we learn, right? You're not ready. I let out a long sigh. I'm here now. Mum's not picking me up for another couple of hours. Can't we at least do something? I don't know. Come on. We can do this. Fine, fine. I smiled. Let's go and practice. I unfolded my cane, letting its end clatter against the floor. I turned, heading towards the exit. Where are you going? Outside. I felt a hand on my shoulder. No, no, no. You're not going outside. I'm in enough trouble as it is with the organization. She let out a sigh. Look, I don't mind teaching you, but we really need to get the basics right first. We'll stay inside for now. I swallowed, feeling her close to me, the smell of ice cream. Okay. I tried not to sound deflated. Okay, what? Look, I just want to be good at this. If it means practicing inside for a bit, that's fine. Good. She put an arm around me. I'm not being patronizing. You know that, don't you? I nodded. I get it. It's fine. I'm just getting it in the ear from the people here. I don't need any more hassle. I didn't mean to get you into trouble. It was my choice to teach you. You've got nothing to be sorry about. You remember how to click, right? I pushed my tongue into the top of my mouth and let out a pop. Its sound ricocheting off the walls. Good. Her hand moved away from my shoulder, and she let out her own click. Take the door ahead. You can lead the way. Clicking again, I attuned my ears to the sound, trying to picture the corridor's form in my mind. It felt like gambit for a moment when you catch that fleeting glimpse of the world generating before your eyes, the structures beneath the reality. I let out a few more clicks, their echoes forming shapes like rain dripping on concrete, fading in the next moment. Hesitating, I turned to Rebecca. Can you tell the difference between materials? Sure, it's not perfect, 
but wood has a different tone to concrete. Right. I swept my cane ahead of me, taking the first step. As I strode towards the door, I worked out the distance using only the sounds. There was no scrambling, no groping. I could tell where the door stood. I stopped and smiled. I did it. I walked along the corridor, edging forward without running the back of my left hand along the wall as a guide. My steps quickened as my senses sharpened and confidence grew. Rebecca asked me to stop. That was really good. I didn't hear your stick touch the skirting boards once. It's weird. It's almost like I can see it. I can see the shape of the corridor. It's not quite like seeing it really, though. Does that make sense? Rebecca gave a slight laugh. That's perfect. That's exactly what it's supposed to do. I don't know if I told you before that I can see. I think the visual part of my brain must be compensating in some way. What do you actually see? There was a long pause. I'm not really sure how to describe it. It's like I can picture it without picturing it. It's like when I hear my clicks, they're filling in the nothing. Have you got better at it? Every day, the more I do this, the more I feel in tune with it. Do you think I can get there? That's up to you. You seem to be getting it. I don't feel like I can get much done inside. Maybe we should go outside again. Absolutely not. Please, I need this. I said no, she snapped. Chapter 20. Monkey Business Epuna stood with his hands clasped behind his back, as if surveying the training arena's endless tiles. Triforce shield clasped to his left arm, boomerang at his belt. Hey. He turned to me and nodded, blonde fringe poking from beneath his green cap. You took your time. Right. I see you've gone for the Robin Hood look. I'm not going to dignify that with a response. I looked around. Where's everyone else? It's just you and me, sniper boy. Where's Frag Queen? Cease admin? Epina made a show of examining his fingernails. I'm sure she's given up on Gambit, and who could blame her? She'll probably be off on some Circle Tech MMO like everyone else. What do you mean? Well, if you were paying attention, you might have noticed that players are leaving in their droves. It's all very sad, really. He yawned. I guess it's up to us to pick up the spoils. Yeah. I had some real-world crap to deal with. Could you show me your stats? I brought up my HUD and projected a table of numbers between us. Ouch. They're better than they were. I see your explosive skill is on the less respectable side of mediocre. Well, that's why we're here, I said, forcing a jovial tone. The ruined city emerged around us, frozen zombies ahead. I tilted my head, turning to Epuna. This is the same one as last time. Do you honestly believe that I can be bothered to set up a new sim? I've set it up so it's not capture the flag this time. Well, at least you've done something. He let out a mirthless laugh. You should be more grateful. It's not every day I help a complete and utter Magator get ahead in the world. Magator. Keep up, half man, half maggot. I think that's a fair assessment. I grinned. Doesn't Tower suggest a bull? Wouldn't that be half maggot, half bull? You should be glad I'm even here. He looked around, smirking. It's not like your own teammate could even be bothered to show up. You should be thanking me. I bowed my head, wishing I had a flat cap I could remove. Thank you, Governor. Don't be a prick about it. Smiling, I raised my hands. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. What did I just say? His eyes narrowed. Something about it not being capture the flag. He raised a finger and went to say something, stopping himself as he gestured along the road. Your mission is to destroy all the zombies. All of them. I made my avatar's eyes widen. But there's hundreds of them. Epuna let out a long sigh, eyes rolling. There are four types of explosives you need to know about. I nodded. Grenades. Mines. Um, four, you say. A hand grenade appeared before us, hovering in midair like a spinning pineapple. I take it you know what this is. It's a hand grenade. Specifically, it's a frag grenade. They're perfect for ripping through flesh. You can probably take out a few dozen zombies with one of these if you let it off in the right place. They have a decent-sized blast radius, so make sure you're well clear before it goes off. Got it. And do you know what to do with a grenade? I grinned. You toss it, and boom! 
Epuna snatched the grenade from the air and hurled it along the road, letting it skitter along its surface uselessly. He turned to me, shaking his head. You need to flick the activation switch, and then you throw it. I shrugged. Well, obviously. Well, if it was obvious, you would have said. Wouldn't you? Right. I chose to ignore his tone. What's next? You've got three types of landmines. Proximity, timed, and remote. So, grenades and mines. Got it. Clearing his throat, he raised his chin, holding his hands behind his back. There are four specific types of explosives. They all have distinctive properties and functions that can be utilized by a strategic player. He looked me up and down. That's not really you, is it? Properties and functions, you say? Don't be facetious, you golem-breeding maggot child. Remember why we're here. Just tell me what they do. I know you're dying to. I folded my arms, tapping my left foot, resisting the urge to walk away. A metallic lunchbox-looking thing appeared at eye level in front of us, spinning slowly in midair. First we have a proximity mine. Step on this. Boom! He flung his arms into the air, a broad smile spreading across his face. The mine disappeared, and a new image emerged. It looks exactly the same, I said, pointing to the lunchbox-looking thing floating before us. Epuna rolled his eyes and tutted. There's a timer that you can set. They are completely different, you nauseating cretin. I glimpsed the tiny black rectangle on its side, no doubt the button to activate the timer. What's the point in those when I could just use a proximity mine? Because they serve different functions. Any fool can see that. You can create ambushes and traps. You can create diversions. It's really not that difficult. What's the next one? The timed mean vanished, only to be replaced by another lunchbox-looking thing. Ipana met my gaze with a grin. Now I know you're trolling me. I gestured to the mine. That's exactly the same as the first. If I start hearing Rick Astley, I'm leaving. Epuna pulled a remote control from behind his shield and waved it in front of my face. It's the same as the first, but with one distinct difference. So that's like a detonatory kind of thing? He nodded. I think she's got it. By George, she's got it. A crease formed between my eyebrows. What does that even mean? It means there's hope for you yet. It means that you might not be a complete and utter dullard. I know this might seem like a daft question, but why don't you just use remote minds all the time? They seem like the best ones. Ha! You're wrong. Wrong? Wrong how? He rolled his eyes again and glanced down at his fingernails. Because... Remote mines are only any good if you have a direct line of sight, for one thing. For another, they're much more expensive than standard proximity mines. There's a bit of a scarcity thing. It's called economics. Maybe you've heard of it. Shifting my gaze along the familiar street, I stared at the frozen shapes of the zombies in the distance. So, I need to blow up all the deadheads? That's right. All of them. What should I do? He gave me a confused look, question marks appearing in his eyes. You use the grenades and mines to destroy the zombies. He shook his head. This is completely ridiculous. I let out a sigh. Yes, I realize that. Don't you have any tactics? Anything specific that might come in useful to get better at the game and, oh, I don't know, destroy the hacker? He flicked a hand towards the zombies. Just blow them up. Blow them up? That's your advice? Take as many as you can at the same time. Aim for the center of groups. I took in a deep breath. Right. You can also take advantage of the chain reaction multipliers. In what way? If you let off a bunch of explosions together, they become more powerful. How do I make that work? I looked around and Apuna had disappeared. The zombies in the distance started to move. Checking my HUD, I selected the proximity mines and lay a pair at the side of the road. The world froze around me, and Epona appeared inches from my face. What are you doing, you complete and utter simpleton? I glanced down at the mines, frowning. I'm trying to catch me a Waskelly Wobbit. He shook his head. No, 
You're exhibiting signs of a malfunctioning brain. I shrugged. Can I carry on with the mission? Do I have to explain everything? You're wasting minds. Wasting them. The minds are called proximity minds for a reason. He gave a sigh. There's no point in setting them if the zombies are nowhere near. I pointed to an alleyway to my right. There's some hiding there. He followed my gesture towards the alleyway and nodded. When you're dealing with an enclosed space, just toss a grenade in. Should I activate the grenade first? His eyes narrowed. Obviously, remember who's helping you here. I grinned. Can I get on with the sim now, please? I found myself back at the start of the simulation, the zombies resetting to their original positions. Bringing up my HUD, I skirted along the building to the right, selected a grenade, activated the switch and tossed it into the alleyway. After a pause, an explosion tore through the alleyway, knocking me backwards. The deathly groan subsided by the time the smoke cleared. Did you see that? Boom! Turning to the zombies at the far end of the street, I charged along the centre of the road and ran up the mound of rubble, quickly surveying my surroundings. The groaning increased. I selected the proximity mines and lay ten of them along the junction. Bringing out the timed mines, I set the countdowns and flung them along the street like frisbee zombies lurched towards me as though a single organism. I tossed a few grenades amongst them and ran back along the street, taking cover around the corner of the alleyway. The first series of explosions rumbled from the other side of the buildings. A large blast shook the world as the proximity mines went off in rapid succession. Scores of zombies emerged through the smoke and the flames, shambling towards me. I laid a cluster of remote mines in the rubble's shadow. The remaining zombies moved closer. At the right moment, I pressed the detonator and watched as arms and legs and bits of head and rotten entrails flew in all directions. I tossed my last few grenades towards them and waited as the smoke cleared. That should be all of them now. I waited for the chimes, looking around for Epuna. Confused, I strode along the road towards the junction, stopping at the corner as hundreds of zombies shuffled towards me. I double-checked my inventory, but I knew it was fruitless. I get it. I failed. Ipuna gave no sign that he'd heard. I moved towards the swarming dead and spread my arms, allowing them to feed. The game faded to black. What was that supposed to be? Epuna shook his head. You deserve to be eaten for sullying the good name of explosive experts the world over. So, what? You want me to be an expert on my first day? Epuna didn't answer and a moment later the city evaporated, leaving the endless tiles of the training arena. I think I'm getting it. Let's try again. Epona waved his hands dismissively. You are wasting my time. Did you even have a strategy? I shrugged. Blow up the zombies. Wasn't that what you said? He sniffed, pacing backwards and forwards. You went through all your inventory. You clearly didn't take into account the number of zombies in the simulation. His voice grew higher. This is basic, basic stuff. Like activating a grenade before throwing it? His eyes narrowed. Look, I don't use explosives. I'm just not used to them yet. That's an understatement. My concern is that you're going to pull another stunt like you did with the stealth training and still get the benefit. I can't allow that, not on my watch. I want to learn this. Help me. I spread my hands. I'll do it how you say, I promise. He met my gaze for several seconds, then made a show of shaking his head. You're not worth the effort. What about the hacker? Without offering a response, he logged out of the game, leaving me alone in the empty arena. I pulled up my HUD and noticed the option to restart the last simulation was available. I selected it and the city re-emerged, my ammunition replenished. Taking a deep breath, I began the mission again, this time using what I learnt in stealth training, keeping to the shadows and tracing the lines of walls. I made my way up to the rooftop, ignoring the zombies in the alleyway. I edged slowly towards the statue of Harambe, its lifeless stone eyes staring back at me. I leaned over the roof's edge, almost falling when the statue rocked on its pedestal. Selecting the timed explosives, I threw them into the centre of the heaving zombie horde. Before the mines detonated, I dropped down from the roof onto the street. A dozen or so zombies called out, revealing my location to the others. I ran in a half-circle, 
laying proximity mines as I went. As I raced back to the roof, the first timed, explosive detonated, tearing through thirty or so zombies. The second explosion came a few seconds later, shaking the buildings around me. I peppered the farthest end of the horde with a couple of grenades, catching the stragglers. The final time blast rang out, taking out more of them, so I threw the rest of the grenades, staggering backwards as the combined blast created a shockwave, hurling me onto my back. The multiplier, I muttered, getting up. I dropped from the roof again, rushing over to the pickup truck. The horseshoe of proximity mines stood between me and the dead. Climbing onto the trailer, I jumped up and down, drawing them towards me. As the first zombie stepped onto a mine, I ducked behind the pickup's cabin as a chain reaction of explosions engulfed the rest of them. The shockwave depleted half of my health. I sprinted from the truck, watching as a final group of zombies pushed through the smoke. I planted the three remote mines and scrambled up the rubble mound, waiting for the perfect moment. Quickly running through the weapon options on my HUD, I frowned at the line of zeros. This is it! I gritted my teeth as the final zombies drew closer. Taking in a breath, I detonated the meanies in quick succession, grinning as they caught the final zombies, their bodies breaking apart in an almost comdic fashion, limbs flying in a fountain of gore, a disembodied heed rolling along the asphalt, coming to a stop next to the pickup truck before fading. The smoke cleared and the final body flickered away. Confusion settled over me as I waited for the victory chimes. I looked around, still waiting. Damn it. Deflated, I made my way along the street towards the point where the flag hung in the stealth simulation, squinting against the lens glare. No zombies, I shook my head, wondering if I'd done something wrong while setting up the simulation. What the hell is going on? As I made my way back along the street, I approached the start point, stopping at the sound of grunts from the alleyway on the left. Oh, it's you guys. I sighed. I gave a whistle drawing the attention of the three remaining zombies, and stood stock still as they approached me. When the game faded to black, I logged back into the simulation and bolted towards the alleyway, throwing in a single grenade. Satisfied that the zombies were dead, or at least even more dead than they already were, I headed back up to the roof, this time avoiding the statue. I cursed when I looked over the roof's edge. The explosion in the alleyway must have alerted the other zombies as they were already drawing close. I flung the timed mines onto the street below, ducking behind the lip of the roof as the blast rocked the statue next to me. As I got up, I glanced over the edge, tossing a couple of grenades to take out the strays. Zombies reached the junction, some of them swarming over the pickup truck. I ran and dropped off the roof, lining the street with proximity mines before bolting back up. I lobbed a few grenades, then waited for the fireworks. Crouching at the roof's edge, I cursed as the zombies came to a halt at the bottom of the fire escape, surrounding me. I paced and waited, dropping into stealth mode, waiting for them to move. Damn it! Stepping backwards, I knocked into the statue again. As it wobbled back into position, I walked around it then gave it a shove, smiling as it scraped along its plinth. Pushing at it with a shoulder, the stone gorilla dropped, flipped, and rolled off the roof, smashing onto the road shattering into an explosion of grey dust. Zombies streamed towards it, flowing like a single mass, surrounding Harambe's remains. I backed away, turning to the steps. Below, huddled zombies remained. I cursed, not sure what to do. I considered Harambe's stone plinth. Crouching, I pushed at it with my shoulder, but it wouldn't budge. One grenade remained in my inventory, so I dropped it down the fire escape, moving back as smoke and chunks of rotting flesh plumed towards me. When the smoke cleared, I climbed from the roof all signs of the destroyed zombies already faded. I ran past my proximity mines, stopped, and waved my arms, calling out to attract the remaining zombies' attention. After a moment, they lurched towards me, feet dragging behind them with each plodding step. The first landmine detonated, setting off a chain reaction causing a line of rapid blasts. I let out a sigh and the smoke cleared, more zombies heading my way. Come and get it! I spread my arms wide, throwing my head back, waiting for the feeding frenzy. Respawning in the training area, I considered leaving the game for the night. I went back to the forum and sat on the sofa, the room quiet and empty. 
Sighing, I absently browsed the movies, scrolling past titles I'd seen a thousand times. I turned off the screen and started to pace, my mind filled with thoughts of the explosive simulation. I knew there was something I was missing, some strategy, some way I could draw the zombies together so I could take them out with the limited explosives. I went to log out, then stopped, switching the screen back on. I brought up the first replay and watched it, studying it from different angles. When I reviewed the second replay, it struck me that the zombies in the alleyway were key to solving the whole thing. My method in the first mission worked, but the three zombies caught me out. But when I took them out first, it brought the swarm forward before I had chance to lay down traps. My mind raced with the potentials. Tired and ready to sleep, I loaded the training arena and jumped straight back into the simulation. Dropping into stealth mode, I crabbed along the left-hand side of the street, keeping in the shadows, watching my lines. I laid out a series of proximity mines, repeating the horseshoe shape that had been so successful in the first simulation. Climbing to the roof, I peppered the street below with timed mines, skimming them into the centre of the horde, targeting the rear of the group with grenades when the timed mines went off. I lobbed the remote mines onto the ground, keeping back the final one for the zombies in the alleyway. I dropped from the roof and ran over to the pickup truck, jumping onto its trailer, calling out as the ghoulish howl spread. Zombies marched slowly towards my booby traps. I rushed back up the ladder, diving onto my belly as they stepped onto the mines, bringing with it a booming a salvo of blasts, the building shaking beneath me. I detonated the remote mines and tossed the remaining grenades over the roof's edge, clearing the street. Grinning, I dropped down from the roof and went into stealth mode following the shadows along the building to the left, planting the remaining remote mine at the alleyway's entrance. I called out and waved my arms, drawing the zombies out. Taking the bait, they moaned and followed me. Running ahead, I came to a stop and faced them. Hail to the king, baby! I detonated the mine, a fiery blast filling the alleyway. When the smoke cleared, the final zombie staggered out, groaning as it made its way towards me. That's not fair. I quickly checked my HUD. All zeros. One freaking zombie. I shook my head. Now I'm starting to sound like Soko. And talking to myself, apparently. I climbed back onto the roof and locked eyes with Harambe. Sliding the statue off its pedestal, I pushed it across the roof. The zombie glitched awkwardly at the corner of the building, the animation not really sure what to do. I shoved the sculpture to the corner and gave it one last prod, dropping it over the edge and down onto the zombie. The statue shattered, sending with it an explosion of putrid flesh. The victory chime sounded, and my explosive skill level shot up. A wooden treasure chest appeared before me, bathed in yellow light and spinning in midair. I flipped open the lid and the chest disappeared, being replaced by a gorilla suit. I added the suit to my inventory, and a message told me I'd unlocked the monkey business achievement. Awesome. My smile dropped when I saw the time in the corner of my HUD. Four in the morning, I logged out and crawled into bed. Chapter 21. A Problem. Brian? Something shook my shoulders. Brian? I rolled over, pulling the covers around me. Brian? Huh? Mum? Your breakfast is getting cold. I stretched and yawned and shuffled my feet over the side of the bed, leaning on my knees. I'm coming. Do you want me to pour your tea, dear? I added. Please. I got up and headed downstairs, the smell of bacon drifting through the air. I felt like a zombie as I shuffled slowly to the kitchen table. Smells good. Mum placed the plate in front of me. Groping around its rim, I picked up the sandwich, biting into it, letting the taste fill my mouth. You okay? Mum took her seat at the table, placing a teacup to my right. I wiped my mouth and nodded. Just tired. You were up at all hours again. Isn't that what you were wearing yesterday? I put a hand on my t-shirt, its armpits damp with sweat. I must have forgotten. You need to take care of yourself. You can't keep living like this. I sighed and tested the temperature of the tea against my lips, taking a tentative sip. It's only going to be for a few more days. I need to train. You know it's not real? It's just a game. You don't need to do anything. You could stop playing the game right now and nothing would change. Gritting my teeth, I tried to work out how to explain why Gambit is important to me. How it was my only link to the sighted world. Not this again. I felt her hand on mine. 
she squeezed. Please, Brian, I'm worried about you. I pried her hand away, leaned back in my seat and took another bite from my sandwich. I don't know how to explain it. There's this hacker who's been trying to destroy the game. Because of my B-chip, I've not been affected. I'm sorry, dear. I've no idea what that means. There's a real person trying to take Gambit down from the inside. People are leaving the game. Well, maybe that's a good thing. It's the only place I get to see things. I get to see my friends, see films, play games. I'm in the dark here. I feel like I'm living in this bubble. It's scary here. It's lonely. When I'm in Gambit, I feel alive. Oh, Brian, I didn't realize it was this bad. I know. This is why I'm training. I need to get my stats up so I can take on this hacker and get them out of the game. You've got a problem. She raised her voice. It's not real. I stood to my feet, feeling the urge to cry out. Why won't you listen to me? I am listening, Brian. This is really bad. I think you're addicted to that game. It's not that. It really isn't. I need to do this. I've trained. I've learned so much. I'm ready. I grabbed the remaining piece of my sandwich, shoved it into my mouth, and stormed back to my room. I logged into Gambit to find the forum empty. I lay on the couch for several minutes, staring up at the wood-panelled ceiling. Sighing, I turned and switched on the screen, bringing up the live feeds of the game arenas. I scrolled past empty landscapes. After around twenty channels, I came to a live game. The Inconceivable vs. Team Rocket. They were battling in a giant dome, its roof scratched and cracked, steel struts twisted under its weight. Zombies swarmed the arena. A bright red flag fluttered in the distance. I zoomed in on Apuna, studying his tactics. It seemed he was working in tandem with Peanut, with Peanut drawing zombies towards Apuna's mines, then picking off the survivors with a sword. A glitch at the edge of the dome caught my eye as the hacker tore through the wall of the dome. I leaned forward, transfixed by the hacker's hypnotic sword and shield. One by one, the hacker froze the other players out of the game, their avatars stuck in time as if trapped in amber. I shook my head, sighing, and turned the screen off. I got up and felt a hand on my shoulder in the real world, so logged out. You still want to go to the center today? I blinked a few times as my vision evaporated. Please, I'll meet you downstairs. I need to change. And have a wash. I sniffed at my armpits. Right. Mum left the room and her footsteps faded downstairs. I stripped and walked across the landing to the bathroom. Cold water shocked away the last remnants of sleepiness. I brushed my teeth, washing and drying myself before getting dressed and heading downstairs. Mum handed me my cane and unlatched the door. You sure you're going to be okay? I nodded. Can we go? I followed her down the driveway, clicking as I went. The shape of the fence to my right and the wall to my left formed in my mind as a vague, nebulous image. It wasn't like seeing in Gambit. It reminded me more of something mushy, something not quite there. I slid onto the passenger seat, folding my cane as Mum started the engine. That clicking is going to get very tiresome. I ignored her. She reversed the car from the drive, turned on the radio and drove forward. The presenter was prattling on about video games, about how they should be banned. I swallowed, waiting for Mum to chime in, knowing she'd just parrot whatever she heard on the news or read in the Daily Mail. Have you thought any more about getting a dog? I shook my head. I don't know. This technique Rebecca's teaching me seems to be working. I'm starting to get it. The indicator ticked, and she pulled out onto a busy road. I just worry about what other people will think. Other people? What about other people? She let out a breath through her nose. I'm just concerned that the clicking thing that girl's been teaching you is a bit off-putting. I let out a bitter laugh, folding my arms. I really don't care. Don't you worry about what people think? No, I couldn't give a crap. I shifted my weight, turning to face away from her. Brian, don't be like that. I don't know whether it's tiredness or that game. You're not being fair. I press my face to the glass, cold against my left cheek. You know what's not fair? I asked in low voice. I've found something that I can use to get around, and you're worried about what other people think. 
What would your father say about your attitude? A wave of anger washed over me, pulse racing in my head. I clenched my jaw, unable to respond. I'd like for you to stop playing that game. For me. Just drop it, I snapped. I don't want to talk about it anymore. Well, will you at least... I said. I don't want to talk about it. I slammed a fist against the side of the door. Silence hung between us. Trembling spread across my body, breath tight. You need to think about how you're acting, Brian. You can't keep running off into that world. It's not real, and it's not right. I sighed. Just drop it, please. You look like you're on drugs when I come in your room. You're just like some kind of mindless zombie. I look at you and I think, where's my boy, where's my son gone? She turned off the road and onto a car park, bringing the car to a stop, the engine ticking against the cold. Remember how you wanted me to do more things? How you wanted me to make friends and have a life? She didn't say anything. I've got friends in Gambit. I've made a friend here at the centre. There's no distinction to me. They're all real people. The people in the game are real people. I'm doing what you asked by giving this blind centre thing a chance. Well, not really. Terry said you haven't been to any of the classes. I'm trying to learn how to get around. Just give me a break. Let me do things in my own way. Just trust me, please. She took in a sharp breath and placed a hand on mine. Okay, she whispered. You know I only want what's best for you, don't you, Brian? Sometimes that might not be what you think it is. I nodded and opened the door, unfolding my cane, its tip hitting the ground. I know. But I need to make my own mistakes. You understand that, don't you? The door's at your eleven o'clock. I'll see you in two hours. And then, can we move past this? Mum didn't respond, and I closed the door. I skirted round the car, heading for the door, clicking as I went. The engine started behind me and Mum drove away before I reached the entrance. Brian, it's lovely to see you back, Terry said as the door closed behind me. Oh, hi. It's Terry, Brian. You're just in time for the class. Yeah, I could tell it was you from the voice, Terry. That's fantastic. He patted my back. Would you like to take my arm or do you feel more comfortable following, Brian? I shook my head. I'm supposed to be meeting Rebecca. Ooh, I don't think she'll be coming today. We had a little... disagreement, let's say, with your friend Rebecca. Right, I sighed. I'll be honest, I'm really not a fan of dancing. Well, that's fantastic, Brian, there's no dance class today. Do you know what sculpture is? I frowned. Of course I do. Well, let's not keep the others waiting. I sighed. Lead the way. Do you need to take my arm, Brian? You already asked that. I'll just follow. He took my arm anyway. I tore it free and staggered back. I said no. There was a long pause and he forced a laugh. Of course, of course. I understand. You value your independence. That's very commendable, Brian. Come on. He marched ahead on the corridor, footsteps echoing around us. I followed him into the same room as the dance lessons, closing the door behind me, the smell of wood polish and dust filling the room. I came to a halt as Terry clapped his hands. Everybody, do you remember our friend Brian? He came to one of our dance classes and had to sit out, do you remember? He is going to join us to make some sculptures. How does that sound, everyone? Where should I sit? There's an empty seat just ahead of you, Brian. I made a few tentative steps forward, feeling with my cane along the floor until it clipped a chair leg. Gripping the empty chair's back, I folded my cane and sat down. Hello, Brian, an elderly woman said next to me. Hi. I felt a hand on my shoulder as Terry leaned over me, his onion breath now smelling of strong coffee. I'll just get you some papier moche and some glue. What do you think you want to make today? Papier mache? I thought we were going to do sculpting. That's right, Brian. Sculpt in with papier mache. You didn't think we'd let you loose with hammers and chisels and big blocks of stone, did you? He gave a chuckle. I shrugged. I thought clay, at least. This is primary school stuff. I got to my feet and unfolded my cane. 
Is everything okay, Brian? I just need to go to the bathroom. Would you like me to help you? I think I can wipe myself. Very good, Brian. He forced another laugh. I mean, do you need me to help you find the way? I sighed. I know what you meant, I'll be fine. I let out a few clicks, listening for the difference between the brick wall and the wooden door, setting off when I faced the right direction. I let the door slam behind me, clicking as I followed the corridor towards the disabled toilet. I stopped at the sound of more clicking, the tapping and sweeping of a cane along the floor and followed the sound. I made a right, hearing the footsteps ahead. Rebecca? I was hoping I'd find you. How's it going? I asked, taking in the smell of ice cream. We really shouldn't be talking here. She walked towards me, grabbing my arm, turning me around. Hey, what you doing? Terry had words with me. He doesn't want me causing trouble for the organization. He said I was barred from teaching here. Barred for what? Being an endangerment, I guess. He reckons I'm opening them up for being sued. And they said you can't teach here? There was a long pause. I'm dangerous, apparently. I provide too much of a risk. That's ridiculous. You're helping people. He gave me a load of crap about risk assessments and health and safety. He said if someone sued, they'd have to close this place down. But no one would do that. That's crazy. Of course they wouldn't. It's an excuse. They want you to do things their way or no way. They think they know what's best, but they live in a sighted world. They don't get it. How could they get it? Her voice cracked. It's okay. I'll be all right. It's just frustrating, that's all. We walked to the main door and stepped outside, the temperature dropping. What were they doing in there? In the class? Yeah. They were doing papier-mâché, I decided to leave. Do you like the classes? I don't. I came to see you. Good. Fancy trying again? What about what Terry said? That was them talking. She stopped for a second, muttering to herself. What is it? We should probably get off the premises completely. I don't want to give them any excuses to give me any more grief. I hesitated. Off the premises? As in outside? Of course, dummy. Best place to learn. It's not too busy around here. There are some wide pavements and some simple curbs. You're only going to learn so much on a car park or a field. Right. You sound worried. I thought about saying something witty. I am. You don't have to do anything. I know. Let's do it. Sparrows tweeted overhead, branches shifting in the trees. Holding my left hand out, I brushed it along the side of a bush, taking care not to scratch my knuckles. Rebecca ran on ahead, sending out a salvo of clicks. She returned a few moments later, stopping a few feet away from me. We've got a nice clear road. There's a footpath ahead, gardens and driveways on the left, the roads on the right. Got it. All I need you to do is make it to the next curb. There are a couple of lampposts you'll need to avoid, but apart from that, it's all clear. Okay. Sounds good. I swallowed. Well, get on with it then. Right. I stepped forward, sweeping my cane across the asphalt pavement. I made several clicks, detecting the first lamppost, a vertical line revealing itself to me. I skirted around it, clipping it with the side of my cane, nodding to myself when it hit. The ground made a slight incline to my right, probably a dropped curb, maybe the entrance to a driveway. I let out a few clicks to my left, confirming what I guessed. I moved swiftly around the second lamppost and halted at the lip of the curb when my cane rolled off the edge. Rebecca joined me. How was that? I asked. You tell me. Seemed easy enough. Were you just using your stick? No. I could tell where the lamppost was and the driveway seemed obvious. She didn't say anything for a long moment. What is it? I'm impressed. You're doing really well. Shall we cross? Sure. I listened for traffic and stepped out onto the road. Reaching the opposite side, I waited for Rebecca. You coming? No, I need you to get to the next junction. Just keep going along the same way. Okay, what can I expect? You can expect to work out what's there. I shouldn't have told you about those lampposts. Okay, I traced the curb with my cane, 
orienting myself with the road on my right. Striding forward, I followed the curve of the pavement around to the left, using my left hand to follow a wall, my cane snagging and skittering over cracked and crooked flagstones. As the road straightened, I made several clicks and caught the hint of a driveway entrance and a lamppost to my right. A car stood ahead, half blocking the footpath. I squeezed past it, shaking away branches as they brushed against my face. Kicking aside a can, I passed another lamppost, halting as my stick caught and bent on a broken paving slab, stepping back before it had chance to drive into my stomach. Reaching the next corner, I let out a relieved sigh and waited. Rebecca caught up with me, stood at my side. How was that? Challenging? Yeah, that was a crap bit. Didn't help that someone had parked their car over half the pavement. No way you'd fit a wheelchair through that gap. The ground was bad, but I'm getting it. I could tell where the driveway was and the lamppost. I knew the car was coming. It's amazing. She threw her arms around me and hugged me her long hair against my cheek. That's great. I'm so pleased. I knew I could teach people. I felt myself flush when she pulled away, heart racing in my chest. I rubbed the back of my neck awkwardly, unsure of what to say. You want to do another one? Actually, I need to get back. Mum's picking me up at the centre. This is just the beginning. You realise that, don't you? Thank you. Don't thank me yet, dummy. You've still got a long way to go. Come on. I'll walk back with you. We strode across the car park towards Mandela House. See, ten minutes to spare, Rebecca said, the robotic voice of her watch fading. Think you'll be around on Monday? Definitely. We should keep on with those streets and then we'll do some more advanced stuff. How advanced? Brian, there you are, Mum said, panic in her voice. I've been worried sick about you. I was out with Rebecca. Hi, Rebecca said. Mum didn't say anything for a second. Is that the girl who's been getting you injured? This is Rebecca. She's been teaching me how to get around. I'll leave you to it, Rebecca said, walking away. See you Monday. Yeah, see you. I turned to Mum. There was no need to be like... What on earth were you thinking? I had a frantic phone call from Terry saying you'd gone missing. What was I to think? I sighed. They were doing children's crafts. I'm not a baby. You should have told someone. He had me worried sick. Can we go? Not yet. You need to go back in there and say sorry to Terry. He does an absolutely marvellous job here and you're making his life stressful. It's selfish, you know, Brian. You were never raised to be selfish. I didn't think. I just wanted to get out of there. I don't like those classes and Terry's a patronising... Ah, Brian, there you are. Terry's voice came. Where have you been? I shrugged. I didn't want to do the class. You should have said, Brian. He placed a hand on my shoulder. I want us to be very good friends, Brian. It's very important that we know where you are at all times. Like some kind of prison? I let out a long sigh. You treat us like kids in there? Brian, Mum snapped. I'm very sorry, Terry. He's been playing on this computer game to all hours of the morning. I think it's made him forget his manners. Terry's hand slid from my shoulder, and he exchanged words with my mum, moving a few steps away and talking in a low voice. Thank you, Terry, mum said, walking back towards me. Brian, have you got something to say for yourself? Not really, mum tutted. I'm so sorry about my son's behaviour. I'll make sure to have a strong word with him. We are all friends here, Brian, Terry said in a jovial tone. We can start again on Monday. How does that sound? I didn't respond. It will all be water under the bridge. Thank you, Terry, Mum said. I'm so sorry. You two have a nice weekend. He went back inside. Mum turned to me. I'm so cross with you. I don't even know where to begin. You can start by taking me home. Chapter 22 Truffle Shuffle Talk filled the room when I entered the forum. Socko sat on the arm of the couch with Harley and Peanut to his left. R2 stood with his back against the wall near the door, staring up at the screen. Hey, I said, taking a seat next to Peanut. Bro, that monkey suit is freaking awesome, Socko said, 
Actually, it's a gorilla. Same difference, bro. I don't care about your technicalities, about your species descriptions. Who are you freaking David Attenborough? You're wearing a monkey suit, and that's enough for me. Take the compliment. I glanced up at the screen. Ooh, you're watching The Goonies again? What's with the tone, bro? This movie rules. Yeah, but, I mean, seriously. Again? I looked around. Where's Frag? I've not seen her. No one has, Harley said, turning to me. R2 sniffed. I bet my memes sent her running. Bro, shut up, he waved at the screen. This is the bit with the truffle shuffle. If you speak over this, I'll come over there and get Staten Island on your ass. I shook my head. I've literally no idea what that means. You'll what, turn me into an island? I swear to God, Nero. Socko rolled his eyes. Sis admin strode into the forum and looked me up and down. Nice monkey suit. Actually, it's a gor- People are leaving the game, he said before I could get out my words. Lots of people. I had a look at some of your training missions. Good work with the explosives. Thanks. Even though he bailed halfway through, Ipuna really helped me. So did Socko and Peanut, Aerith and Harley. Everyone's been great. I glanced at R2, but didn't say anything. Socko let out a long sigh, flapping his arms. Unbelievable. Missed it now. Can't believe you talked over the truffle shuffle. Sis admin switched off the movie and brought up my stats on the big screen. Bro, no. He shrunk at Sis admin's glare. Sis admin turned to the screen, then smiled at me. See, you've gone up a few levels. Your explosives, sneak, and agility are looking nice. You've got more skills. You've even got your own laser sword. Bro, it's a freaking lightsaber. Socko got to his feet, muttering. I can't believe you turned off the goonies. That's weak, bro. It's sacrilege. It's like ripping pages out of a Bible or something. Sis admin cleared his throat. I repeat, you've got the laser sword. I think we could kit you out with some explosives and send you after the hacker next time he's in the game. I glanced around at everyone, their eyes fixed on me. I don't know. I'm not ready. I turned to R2. I need you to help me. He let out a laugh. I'm not going to do that. Sis admin turned to R2, folding his arms. Why won't you help him? Why should I? Because we need him to take the hacker out. But he sucks. You suck for not helping, bro, Socko said. I take exception to being compelled to act in a way I don't want. That's unconstitutional. For you, maybe. Sis admin raised his hands. No one is compelling anyone to do anything. He looked at me and shook his head, arms dropping to his sides. If he doesn't want to do what's right for the good of the game, that's his choice. Thing is, R2, I've had some complaints about your username. What kind of complaints? Don't play dumb, I'll make a deal with you. Help Neuro become a better sniper, or I'll make it so you have to change your account name. Just help him, Peanut muttered. It'll be helping us all. R2 squared up to Sis Admin. So what you're saying is if I don't help the worst sniper ever get better, then you're going to force me to change my username? I wouldn't put it like that exactly. Sis Admin took a step backwards and shrugged. But yes. I don't care. R2 turned and left. That went well, Harley said. If he comes back, you'll find he'll have to change his name to something a bit less offensive. He rubbed his chin. I might have to block his personal messages as well. Some of those pictures he was sending Frag Queen were somewhat offensive. Peanut stepped forward. It's called psychological warfare. All is fair in love and war. That's bullcrap, bro. I swear they've got the Genevieve Convention. Peanut sniffed. It's called the Geneva Convention, and it doesn't apply in a video game use absolute cretin. Who gives a rat's ass? I glanced up at Harley, shaking her head. She leapt up onto the sofa, raising her chin. Listen, everything we care about rests on the shoulders of Neuro. We need to work together. We need to stop arguing. Let's support him and give him the confidence to take Gambit back. Yeah, bro. We'll be with you tomorrow. We've got your back. Peanut looked me up and down. As much as it pains me to admit it, you've come a long way since you first started. I think you can do this. Sis Admin looked at me and smiled. You can do this. I looked down at my hands, nodding to myself. Okay. 
This is freaking awesome, bro. I've just got one thing to ask. Soko gestured to the screen. Can we watch the freaking Goonies now? Chapter 23 Fish and Chips Mum sat in the sitting room, watching EastEnders on catch-up when I approached the front door. I pulled on my coat and quietly turned the lock, slipping through the door and into the cold. Unfolding my cane, I walked forward and made a right out of the driveway, letting out clicks as I went. Reaching the curb, I waited and listened for cars. An aeroplane hummed across the sky and a pair of dogs exchanged barks in the distance. I stepped out into the row, clicking. My cane gliding across the roof asphalt, bouncing on tiny stones. My cane struck the opposite curb, and I stepped onto the parter. Heart racing in my chest, I grinned and I carried on walking. My clicks picked up the swoop of a fence and a lamppost to my left. I followed the pavement round to the right, the smell of chips catching the wind my stomach responding with a deep, gurgling moan. Following my nose, I went inside, placing a hand on the warm metal counter, smiling. What can I get you? Two fish and chips, please. Anything else, love? Actually, some mushy peas. And a Coke. Diet or full fat? Full fat, please. I waited, my stomach rumbling as she wrapped the fish in paper and shoveled chips from the fryer. Salt and vinegar? Please. She dropped the parcels into a carrier bag, handing it to me, handle thinning, around my fingers. When I paid, I headed home, following the same route back, hedges making way for walls. I crossed the road, whistling to myself between clicks. There you are, Mum said. I've been frantic. I shrugged and held up the bag. Got some chips? How? I grinned. I've got these things called legs. People use them to go from one place to another. You walked? Well, I didn't exactly drive. How? I told you, this is what I've been learning. Mum led the way into the house and I closed the door behind us. Will you make some bread and butter? I'm starving. I handed the bag to Mum and followed her through to the kitchen. She unwrapped the chips and served them onto plates, kettle boiling as she made some bread and butter. I sat at the table and opened my Coke. Is it what that girl's been teaching you? Rebecca? Yeah. That's wonderful. She set the plate in front of me, laying out knives and forks. I'm really proud of you. You should have said something before you went out, though. I just wanted to do it by myself. I get that. But still, even if you weren't visually impaired, I'd still want to know where you are. It's just courtesy. I didn't think. I just really wanted to try this. The batter crunched as I cut into it the knife gliding through the soft fish. I took a bite. Rebecca is great, I said, between mouthfuls. Really? A mocking tone edged her voice. I put my fork down. What's that supposed to mean? Does Brian have a girlfriend? No, I said a little too defensively. I took my fork, driving it into a chunk of haddock, shoving it into my mouth. You can talk to me, you know. If you like her, that's fine. I took a sip of coke and built a chip butty on a slice of bread. I don't know. I do like her. She's funny, her hair's really soft, she likes good music, and she smells like ice cream. I felt my cheeks grow warm. Why don't you ask her out, then? Mum. What? What's the worst thing she can say? She could say no and let me know what a loser I am. And you'd be in the same position you are now but totally embarrassed. I folded the bread, lifting it to my mouth. If you like her, you should ask. Please ask her. And you wouldn't mind. I took a bite, butter melting on my tongue. Why would I mind, Brian? All I want is for you to have a good life. Nothing would please me more than to see you happy. As long as I'm happy in meat space, you mean? Meat space, she tutted. I don't want to have this discussion. Ask her out. What happened to her being a bad influence? I felt a hand on my wrist. Brian, if you think I haven't been listening to what you've been saying, you're wrong. I can see why the people at the blind centre don't like what she's doing, but look at you. You keep smiling. You seem more confident. You went out and bought us some chips. And you came back safely.
I took another mouthful of the butty and swallowed, smiling involuntarily. Thanks. Chapter 24 The High Street Wow, I'm impressed. You've been practicing. I stood at the edge of the curb, resting the tip of my cane at my feet. I'm really getting the hang of it. I'm really impressed. You sound surprised. Most people I try to teach have usually given up by now. Well, they all did. It's too hard. I guess I, I'm not most people. This has been so great, learning all this stuff, hanging out with you. Rebecca laughed. Not too shabby yourself. Come on. Come on, where? We need to take this to the next level. I felt my heart beating. What do you mean? Time for a real challenge. Let's try the high street. My body tensed. Sweat trickled around the back of my neck. The high street? Perfect place to put your new skills to the test. I think it's fair to say you're getting a bit too cocky. Right. She gave my arm a playful shove. Lighten up, dummy. I'm just screwing with you. We don't have to do anything you don't want to. I swallowed. Let's do it. There's a lot more going on. More people. More noises. There's going to be a lot of street furniture, so you'll have to concentrate extra hard. I can do that. She rested her head on my shoulder and her arm went around me briefly. I resisted the urge to stroke her. You'll be awesome. She led the way along the pavement, crossing two sets of junctions, the roads getting busier as we went. We took a right at the third junction, cars whizzing past us. A man laughed at us as we passed. It's the blind leading the blind. Nice stick. Rebecca stopped. I don't laugh at your disability. What you banging on about, darling? You've obviously got some deep-seated mental disability if your first reaction when you see a blind person is to laugh and heckle. Yeah, whatever, love. The man grumbled something under his breath as he brushed past me. Rebecca didn't move until the man's footsteps faded. What did you do that for? Because he was a dick. What the hell is wrong with people? You didn't have to say that, though. Didn't I? I'm sorry. But if you see someone with a disability on the street and your first reaction is to act like that, then it's fair to say there's probably something seriously wrong with you. I nodded. So, what's the plan? Call them out, I guess. Make them see what a dick they are. Um, I meant with the training, she laughed. Let's see if we can get to the other end of the high street. There's a cafe on the right. If you make it, I'll buy you a coffee. I smiled. Sounds good. Make it a tea and you've got yourself a deal. Done. When you're ready, you go first. I let out several clicks and started to move, gingerly at first. The noise of the cars interfered with my clicks, making it difficult to focus. People talked as they rushed past me. Dance music blared from shops. I made out an obstacle straight ahead, perhaps a signpost. I skirted around lampposts and floor signs. I dodged past a cuboid structure, maybe a phone box, my cane sliding across the smooth paving stones. I stopped just in time as the corner of a bench nearly made contact with my shin. The sound of Rebecca's clicks came from far behind me. I sidestepped and carried on until gurgling coffee machines came from a shop to my right. I halted next to the cafe entrance as Rebecca stopped beside me. This is the place. That was amazing. You only stopped once. Yeah, there was a bench. I didn't spot it with the clicks. Are you okay? I stopped just in time. That was a clean walk. That was so awesome. Excitement filled her voice, and she threw her arms around me. I'm so pleased. She leaned away, and I kissed her, pressing my lips against hers. What are you doing? She staggered away from me, pushing a hand against my chest. I... Who do you think you are? I... I can't do this. You can find your own way back. She turned on her heels, let out some clicks, and marched away fading into the other noises. Wait, I called. I'm sorry. You okay, mate? A man asked. I sighed. I'm fine. I shook my head, rubbing the back of my neck. Actually, would you be able to give my mum a call? I'm not really sure how to get home. Chapter 25 Showdown I sat in the forum, alone. Red Dwarf washed over me, my attempt to make myself smile failing miserably. I'd even picked my favourite episode, the one where the crew returned to Earth, only to find that time runs backwards. 
Sis admin ran into the forum, so I paused the video, the cat's fang smile leering over us. The hacker is in the game right now, he said, almost breathless. You think you're ready? I shook my head. I'm not sure. I don't think so. He tilted his head, staring at me, eyes turning to question marks. What's up with you? Nothing. I sighed and looked down at the floor. It doesn't matter. He shook my shoulder. Look at me. I know it's scary. You can do this. I've seen your replays. The stuff you did in the training was pretty innovative. You've got this. I rose to my feet. No, I haven't. How do we know this is even going to work? What if I go in there, I beat him, and then he comes back, like everyone else does? I don't get why you think this will do anything. He shrugged. You've got to try something. Getting the hacker out of the game will help us to locate which backdoor in the code he's exploiting. Your stats are better and your skills are better. You can do this. Right. I gave you that lightsaber because I believe in you. There's not a melee weapon in the game that equals it. You need to get in the game now. I thought it was a laser sword. He waved a hand. You can do this, Neuro. Fine. I'll give it a go. Right, well, I'll leave you to it. Last thing I need is to be frozen out again. He patted my back, heading out of the door. Go get him. I nodded to myself when he disappeared. Bringing up my HUD, I saw a solo mission highlighted on the menu and logged into the game arena. The dead city emerged around me. Sweeping my gaze along the road, I recognized the cracked buildings and rusted cars. A movement in the distance caught my eye, so I dropped into stealth mode, jogging in a crouch. I made a mental map of the shadows, choosing to follow the left-hand side of the street, tracing lines between the corners of cars and buildings. A lone zombie shuffled in the shadow of a towering church, its shambling form framed by the swooping stone arch surrounding the main doors. I ignored the ghoul and pushed deeper into the city. The buildings grew taller, looming over me in shades of grey. A wrecked car lay on its roof as telephone wires draped across the centre of the road, thick clouds eddying above. I started as a tin can, cartwheeled past me, wind howling along the rooftops. Selecting my proximity mines, I placed them in a horseshoe shape around me, then carried on along the street, placing remote mines at regular intervals, stopping when I caught a glimpse of the hacker's shield. Taking a deep breath, I pressed my body against the nearest wall, standing as still as I could, watching, breathing. After several minutes, I climbed into the empty window, shattered glass crunching beneath my feet. I ducked low and moved closer to the hacker, his face an unmoving plain black mask. He slashed the scenery with his sword, revealing the abyss beneath. The scenery seemed to bend and distort around him. He still hadn't spotted me, so I moved closer. I skimmed the trio of timed mines several meters behind him. He didn't notice. The blast rocked the building around me. Smoke clearing. I jumped out onto the street, hurling a barrage of grenades towards the hacker as I ran back along the route I'd followed. The hacker finally gave chase. Come on, I muttered. Come get some. I frowned at the zombie shuffling towards my proximity mines. The explosion threw me onto my back. Jumping to my feet, I activated the remote mines to distract the hacker. Readying myself, I drew my laser sword as the hacker circled me. What do you want? The hacker did not respond. Instead, he lunged at me, catching me with the edge of his blade. I pivoted swinging the laser sword. Who are you? The hacker responded with a lunge. I kicked him back, and he held his shield. I let out a laugh. It doesn't affect me. You can't beat me. It's over. The hacker shook his head and charged forward, shoving me with the shield. Tripping, I fell onto my back, lasses were rolling from my hand. The cloud swirled above as the hacker walked around me, surveying his prey. He stood over me and drew up his sword, holding it high above his head. I snatched the laser sword, activating it as he thrust his blade down, my own sword pushing through his chest. Nothing happened for a long moment. The world seemed to freeze, and then the victory chime sounded. The hacker faded. The arena stood empty. I logged out of Gambit, trembling, pulse racing in my skull.
the real world came to me in a sludgy blur. I staggered to the bathroom and washed my face, sweat coating my body, nerves prickling. Exhausted, I made my way back to my room, pulling the sheets over me as I crawled into bed. I closed my eyes and sunk into a deep sleep. I woke up, unsure of how long I'd been asleep. Rolling over, I yawned and logged into Gambit. A cheer greeted me when I entered the forum, limp biscuit blaring from a hidden speaker. Socko jumped to his feet and Harley ran over to give me a high five. Peanut clapped his hands while R2 eyed me from the corner. How's everyone doing? I asked. Word is, bro. You did it. Socko's voice came loud over the music. Sis admin entered, a car salesman's smile plastered across his face. The monkey has returned victorious. I gave him a confused look and glanced down at my suit. It's a gorilla. He strode over to me, patting me on the arm. I think congratulations are in order. Are you sure it worked? You should check the feeds. He gestured to the screen. As far as we can tell, he's not there. That's freaking awesome, bro. I said you're like Daredevil. I turned on the screen and lowered the music's volume as I scrolled past the live game feeds. Many of the arenas stood empty, some of them damaged with gaping black holes punctuating the landscapes. Everyone averted their gaze from the screen. What you seeing, bro? It's all good. I kept scrolling until I reached the final feed and smiled. It's safe to look. A collective sigh of relief spread through the room as I scrolled back through the games. I turned to Sis Admin. What will happen now? His grin remained fixed. We've got our best people working on it, which reminds me I should really go and check how they're getting on. He walked towards the door, then stopped, turning back to me. You really have done us all a massive favor. Thank you. He dipped his head and left. R2 stepped forward, raising his chin. You did well. Thing is, now we know how powerful you are. He rubbed his hands together. And we know all your tricks. I rolled my eyes. We've been friendly with you for the good of the game. But if you think for one second that our feud is over, you are a bigger fool than I gave you credit for. Harley stepped forward, pointing towards me. He just saved Gambit from its biggest threat and you're already throwing down a challenge. R2 smirked. I thought that was the point of the game. You should be praising him, not starting trouble. At least give him a second to breathe. I shrugged. Bring it on, I say. I've got some great new skills. My stats have gone up and I'm much better at the game now. R2 grinned and shook his head. But you still suck at your primary role. You're better at everything but sniping. He pointed to his head. That's why I'm smarter than you. It's called strategy. We needed you to beat the hacker, but you won't beat me, and you'll never beat the inconceivable. Socko shot forward, puffing out his chest. Let's do it, bro. Let's throw this down. One last time. No excuses. Loser leaves town. He pounded a fist into his hand. What are you doing? Harley snapped. Peanut and R2 shared a smile as R2 raised his hands. You know, bro, you don't have to say bro at the end of every sentence, bro. It's very annoying, bro. Screw you, you freaking dweeb. I'm going to get Staten Island. The forum door seemed to twist, as if being sucked into a vortex. The door flung open. The hacker entered, shield held before him, shimmering with a spectrum of colors. Everyone froze around me. Avatars flickered, held in place, glitching. The hacker stood in the doorway, holding his shield up towards me, glancing down at it. Then back to me. I shook my head. That's not going to work on me. He shook his head and backed away through the door. Who are you? I called, but he was already gone. I swept my gaze across the form. Damn it. Chapter 26. Shell. I slumped over the breakfast table, my body aching with tiredness, muscles stiff. It's just cereal today, Mum said. I'm not bothered. I'll go and get some bread today. Maybe some eggs. Weetabix is fine. I sighed. Mum paced back and forth around the kitchen, bowls and spoons clattering as the kettle came to a boil. She placed a bowl in front of me and sat down. So, are you going to tell me what's up? I ran a forefinger around the rim of the bowl, took my spoon and mashed the Weetabix, creating a paste with the milk. Brian, what's wrong? I don't want to talk about it, I said, yawning. Has something happened I should know about? 
I'm tired, just get off my back. I scooped a spoonful of mush into my mouth, hardly chewing. Just watch how you're talking to me. You were up to all hours playing that game again. Don't come down here taking it out on me because you haven't had enough sleep. You've only got yourself to blame. Look at you, you look like a complete mess. It's just... I shook my head and took another mouthful. It's just nothing, Brian. Take care of yourself. I swallowed and nodded. Do you want me to drop you off at the centre before I go shopping? She got up to pour the teas. I don't know. Well, the offer's there. Would you like me to make a coffee? Maybe. Well, judging by your tiredness, I think you need something to give you a kick up the backside. She made the drinks and brought them over. I took the cup and sniffed it. The coffee smelt strong and sugary. Mum took a seat. Did you sort out whatever was going on in that game? No. I felt the weight of pressure pushing down on the top of my head. What is the point of a game if it makes you miserable? I thought they're supposed to be fun. It is. At least, it was. It's just getting to me. You can play another game, surely? I scoffed at that. What? Like Circle Tech? I don't want to. My friends are in Gambit. They're relying on me. To do what? I pointed at the back of my neck. My B-chip means I'm the only one who can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the hacker. That doesn't make sense. The hacker boots people out of the game and the thing he's using gives them migraines. As in real migraines? As in real, real migraines in the real world? Not just some game thing? Yes, as in real headaches. It's really bad. Someone should stop him. That's what I'm trying to do. I'm immune to whatever he's using. Can't the game company do something? I don't think they really know what's happening. They must, surely. If someone is in the game, the people who made it must know how they got in. I took a sip of coffee. Maybe. Is that why you've been so miserable? I let out a sigh. It's not the game that's bothering me. Is it what's her name? Rebecca. I didn't respond. My boy's growing up. She tussled my hair. I did something really stupid. What sort of stupid? Not police stupid, I hope. I shook my head, waving my hands. No, no, nothing like that. I took in a deep breath. When I went out with Rebecca yesterday, we had a really good walk through the high street. I know. And she abandoned you. I kissed her. She hugged me after, and I... I don't know, I thought... I think I've ruined everything. Is that why she left? I gave a slight nod. What are you going to do? I was thinking I could buy something like a giant tortoise shell and hide in it forever. It might have been a bit presumptuous to kiss her. It just happened. Speak to her. She placed a hand on mine. How? I've made a right fool of myself. How? You tried to kiss her. She didn't want you to. Apologize. I can't. You're going to look even more of a fool if you don't nip any issues in the bud now. So what? I just walk up to her and say, Sorry, I made a mistake. I thought you were into me. Can we be friends? That would be a good start. Be honest with her. Tell her you got caught up in the moment and you got your feelings mixed up. But I didn't. I blinked, trying not to cry. I know, she whispered. I really like her, Mum. You can still be friends. I don't want to just be friends. Your choices are simple. Be mature enough to be her friend or run away. It will be sad if you lost her as a friend as well. I let out a shuddering breath. Okay, I'll try. The longer you leave it, the harder it will be, trust me. Thanks, Mum. Chapter 27 The Hacker The closing sequence of Akira rolled, scenes of the universe unfolding. I nodded towards the screen. Still holds up. Damn right, it holds up, Harley said. You know, I must have watched that movie a hundred times. I'm confused, bro, none of it makes sense. It's one of those movies people watch to sound clever, but it sucks. Socko started to pace. I'm surprised you didn't make us watch it in black and white with subtitles and start going on about discourse, bro. Except we didn't, Harley said, shaking her head. What was with that big bubblegum monster thing? That was Akira. 
and those weird young old kids or old young kids. They had psionic abilities. Why did they need that girlfriend woman? As a conduit for their power. It's dumb, bro. Bad choice, Harley. He sunk onto the couch. It's not my fault if you don't get it. Kiss my ass, Harley. We should watch something good. Something like The Goonies again. Or Home Alone, or Coming to America, starring Eddie Murphy. Or Brewster's Millions. Or even that crappy one Neuro made us watch with the stupid tiny UFO things. Batteries not included. Harley flashed me a grin, scrolling through the list of movies. I like that one. How about something like The Running Man? Running Man works for me, I said. You can't beat Arnie's puns and one-liners when he defeats the bad guys. Yeah, bro, it's freaking awesome. Plus, Socko will be able to deny he's drawn to the muscled-up men. It's a win-win. Unbelievable, bro. You need to drop that crap. Harley pulled her eyes away from the screen. We could always watch The Hunger Games. Socko shook his head. Are you freaking kidding me? The Hunger Games? He just suggested The Running Man, I said. It's basically the same film. Harley smiled. But he won't get his fill of muscle men. This is true. My head hurts, bro, and it doesn't help you going on about this asinine crap. If you didn't keep talking over the film, maybe you wouldn't be so confused. Socko leaned forward, resting his head in his hands. It's not that, bro. These headaches keep getting worse. You too? Harley sat up. Yeah. He turned to me. What happened with the hacker after we were kicked out? I don't really know. He just came in, held that flashing shield thing up to me. I laughed and told him it doesn't do anything to me. We thought you took him out. He looked down at his hands, shaking his head. This is bad. I've got a theory. I think it's an inside job. It's Circle Tech, bro, trust me. I think it's the admin guy. No, bro. He looked up at me. Pupils becoming question marks. That doesn't make sense. Socko's right. He's been trying to help you. What if it's a cover-up? Or if he's pretending to help while at the same time destroying the game? Why? I hate to agree with Socko, but it doesn't make sense. Why not be him? Last few times I've been in the forum, the admin guy has been here, and then disappeared and a few minutes later, I have a run-in with the hacker. I don't think that's a coincidence. Socko frowned. That's dumb. Harley jumped to her feet. No, it's perfect. The admin guy has access to things no one else has. It's still dumb. Why would he want to sabotage his own job? He could be a spy, I suggested. Or maybe he's trying to crash the stock price. I nodded at Harley, then turned to Socko. See? He threw his hands into the air. I'm done with this, bro. I can't keep having these migraines. I think Frag Queen's done, and if this hacker comes back... He shook his head. I don't know, bro. What are you saying? Neuro, I just need to think about a few things. He logged out, Avatar disappearing. Damn, Harley said, but what are we going to do? We need to let Dalton Jones know. Yeah, right. She let out a laugh. I folded my arms. I'm serious. Chapter 28 Customer Support Welcome to Gambit Customer Support. How may I help you? I need to speak to Dalton Jones. I'm sorry, I didn't get that. If your call is about payments, please say payments. If your call is about the version 1.61.2 upgrade, please say upgrade. If your call is about your account, please say account. Would you like me to repeat those options? Damn automated system, I muttered. I'm sorry, I didn't get that. If you call is about payments, it's about the hacker. I need to speak to Dalton Jones. Is your call about the hacker? Yes. Our developers are working on a solution to your problem. Can I help you with anything else? I need to speak to Dalton Jones. If your call is about an issue with messaging, please say yes. No, just put me through to a real person. I'm sorry, I didn't get that. If your call is about payments... I prodded the zero button on my keypad several times... Please hold while I divert your call to our contact center. Hello, you are through to David. How can I be assisting you today? His voice had a thick Indian accent. I need to speak to Dalton Jones. I'm afraid that will not be possible, sir. 
Do you have your Gambit username to hand so I can bring up your account? It's Neuromantic. And how are you spelling that, please, sir? I spelt it out. Look, I've worked out who the hacker is. He's trying to bring the game down. I need to speak to Dalton Jones, please. I'm afraid that's impossible, sir. Do you have your account password, sir? 1.21 gigawatts. And how are you spelling that, please, sir? Please. I need to talk to him. It's urgent. I'm unable to transfer this call, sir. Is there anything else I can help you with? I let out a sigh. You know, if this game goes out of business, that'll be you out of a job. Sir, I am appreciating your concern in this matter, but this contact centre deals with more than 70 companies worldwide. So, there's nothing you can do? I gripped the phone tight. I could send a message, if that is acceptable to you, sir. You can send a message? To Dalton Jones? That is correct, sir. Would you like me to go ahead and do that? Yes. Tell him that sysadmin is trying to bring down the game. He's the hacker. I think he's probably working for Circle Tech or something. Do you have your account password, sir? It's 1.2 car 1 gigawatts. I spelled it out before he could ask. I will read your message back to you, sir. You are saying in a message to Dalton Jones that ceased admin is hacker and is working for rival company. Sysadmin. I spelled the username out. He's working for CircleTech. I will send a message for you now, sir. Is there anything else I can be helping you with today? No, that's great, thank you. Well, you have a very good day, sir. Thank you for calling Gambit Customer Support. If you could leave feedback on this call. I hung up the phone. Chapter 29 Frank Ah, Brian, are you here for the class? Terry asked, the door closing behind me as I stepped into Mandela House's reception area. I was wondering if Rebecca's around. There was a long pause. I'm sorry. Rebecca's not here today. I haven't seen her. Right. I swallowed. The way you said that makes me think you have seen her. I just want to talk to her, that's all. You know we don't endorse her training, Brian. She's not in today. I let out a sigh. Fine. We have someone from Guide Dogs coming in today. They're bringing some dogs. You should come and listen to what they have to say if you'd like, Brian. I think a dog would be a perfect companion for you. I'm not sure. There's no obligation to do anything. It's just an opportunity to stroke some dogs and find out how they help people like you. I suppose not everybody likes dogs. I rub my chin. I do like dogs. What do I need to do? Just meet them. Hear what they've got to say. A lot of people at the centre swear they're much better with a dog than a cane. I nodded. Lead the way. Terry walked ahead, holding the door open for me. Now, Brian. I know you're having a little trouble settling into what we're trying to do here at the centre. It's not that. I just don't like doing things like dancing or kids' crafts. He carried on along the corridor. I imagine some of the other people at the centre would be offended by that. You should try and joining what's on offer. Who knows, Brian? You might even find something you like if you give it a chance. He opened the door to the main hall, and I stopped at Rebecca's voice behind me. I thought you said she wasn't here. She doesn't want to see you. I turned and followed her voice. When I reached the door, Terry blocked my path. I can't let you go in there, Brian. I need to talk to her. She doesn't want to see you. I just need a minute. No. I tried to duck past him. Let me go. Listen up, you entitled little prick, he snarled. I've put up with your crap for long enough. You've got two choices now, Brian. You either come to the presentation or I'll have to ask you to wait in the reception until your lift arrives and we can have a talk about whether or not you'll be welcome back here. My mouth gaped. Two choices, Brian. What is it to be? The voices stopped and the door opened. Rebecca? She doesn't want to see you, Terry said, his words flat. Would you like me to escort you to reception? I sighed and shook my head. I'll go to the presentation. Terry clapped his hands. Wonderful. We'll put this ugly business behind us. Come on. He took my arm and led me to the hall, directing me to a seat. My mind wandered during the presentation. An elderly woman spoke about her guide dog, about the freedom he gave her. I wasn't really listening. Rebecca dominated my thoughts. 
Why was everything going wrong? Why was it all collapsing around me? Do you want to say hello? A young woman asked. What? This is Frank. He's still in training. I felt a cold nose and warm breath against my hand, and then a few licks around my fingers. I laughed as his tail batted against my legs. I reached around stroking his velvety ears, running a hand over the top of his head. Hey. He raised a paw, placing it on my hand. I rubbed his back, his fur soft between my fingers. Who's a good boy? You're a good boy, aren't you? So, what did you think of the presentation? The dog turned away from me, his tail fanning my face. I rubbed his lower back, smiling as his back paws danced. I don't know, I... I don't think I took it all in, sorry. The woman pulled up a chair next to me. It's okay. It's a lot to take in. It's not that. My head's everywhere at the minute. Frank licked my hand again, and I rubbed the back of his ears. What color is he? He's a black Labrador. He's lovely. He's giddy. You're a big dafty, aren't you, boy? How does it work? You apply, and a mobility instructor comes to assess you at home, then one of our trainers will try to match you up with a suitable dog. I mean, how do they lead you around? We teach you to work with them. They have a harness, and they're trained to help you follow routes. Sounds cool. It is. When you use the cane, you respond to what's there. You're always having to figure out where you are based on obstacles. You're always on the defensive. It's different with a dog. You don't even know the obstacles are there because they lead you around them. How are they with stuff like hanging branches? We train them for that. Wow. I'd imagine a dog would be perfect for someone your age, give you the independence that you deserve. So, where do they stay? She laughed. With you. We can provide all the food and vet bills. It's just like having a very helpful pet. Sounds great. You should apply. Frank dropped to the floor, rolling onto his back, tail wagging against my feet. I knelt over him, rubbing his tummy. I think he likes you. He's great. So what do you think? About what? Applying. I got up and returned to my seat, leaning back. I don't know. Maybe. Well, you think about it. It's been lovely talking to you. Upstand, Frank. Come on, you big daft lump. I nodded. I will. Bye, Frank. I locked the front door behind me and headed down the driveway. Cool wind swirled around me as fallen leaves skittered across the pavement. The navigation app spoke to me from my pocket, offering me the directions. I followed along, clicking and sweeping the pavement with my cane. When I reached the main road, I increased the volume of the clicks, taking each step with caution. When the navigation app told me I'd arrived at Mandela House, my body stiffened. I exhaled a trembling breath and marched across the car park towards the entrance. I heard clicks as I approached the door, Rebecca's clicks. Rebecca? I've got nothing to say to you. She started to open the door. Please, I'm sorry. I don't know what came over me. Thank you for apologising, she sniffed. I'm glad you can see what happened was really quite inappropriate. Now, if you'll excuse me. I said I'm sorry, I mean it, I just... I don't know. Can we please start again, maybe? She let out a bitter laugh. Absolutely not. I just want... The reception door slammed shut. Rebecca was already inside. Chapter 31 Empty. Returning home, I ran upstairs and threw my head into the pillow, eyes filling with tears. I punched at the pillow several times. Everything was falling down around me and it was all my fault. Taking a deep, quivering breath, I sat up, wiped my face and logged into Gambit. Entering the forum, I staggered back at the sound of shouting. Do you think I give a rat's ass? Screw you, Harley. Socko paced with agitated steps. Harley sank onto the sofa, shaking her head. You're being a damn fool, Socko. I don't have to listen to this. It took a few seconds for them to notice me. What's going on? I shifted my gaze between them. Socko is what's going on. Don't put your crap on me, bro. What happened? I asked. Just Harley being Harley. What's that supposed to mean? She sprang to her feet. Guys, please. I stood between them, keeping them apart. Whatever, bro. 
He waved a hand. I'm done. He logged out. I shook my head and sighed. I came in here to get away from the drama. She sat back down. Sorry you had to see that. I took a seat next to her. What happened? I don't know. Frag's done. Socko's done. All this stuff with the hacker. It's getting to everyone. Has the hacker been back? She shook her head. He's still getting those headaches. I think he's just lashing out. Want to watch something? To be honest, I'm not really in the mood. He's gone now. I selected the game feeds on the big screen and scrolled past the arenas. A few teams battled each other in a desert landscape. I turned to Harley and smiled. People are getting back into it. It'll just be a matter of time. I selected the next game, watching as the inconceivable took on Pickle Rick. I think we should study what they do, see what their strategy is. Harley sighed. There's not going to be a we the way things are going. Whoever this hacker is and whatever they want, it's working. They'll come round, I'm sure. The screen pulsated as the hacker burst into the game arena, freezing out the other players in quick succession. Not again. I turned to Harley, but she was already frozen. The forum stood silent, empty. I scrolled through the other live feeds. Some screens showed nothing but a black void, others a mashup of glitched polygons and flickering colors. Cursing, I turned off the screen and logged out. Chapter 32 Friends I lay on the sofa with my head buried in my arm. My eyes stung from tears. It's Rebecca, isn't it? I sat up and gave a slight nod. I didn't hear you come back. My voice came out quiet, cracked. Did you speak to her? Yeah. I take it things didn't go how you expected. I tried to talk to her. The words came out in a quiver, spit thick in my mouth. I shook my head. She's not interested. She sat next to me. I'm sorry. I shrugged a shoulder. It is what it is. You'll be fine. She rubbed my hand and rose to her feet. Do you want a cuppa? Not answering, I sunk back against the arm of the sofa, curling my legs in tight. You're not going to mope around all day, are you? I'm not moping. I pulled a cushion up and rested it against the side of my face, sandwiching me, enclosing me. You are moping, Brian. She yanked the cushion aside, tossing it onto the other sofa. I let out a sob. But I don't know what to do. She grabbed my arm, dragging me to a sitting position. You need to try again, or you need to move on. Sitting around feeling sorry for yourself isn't going to help anyone. I don't want to walk away. I like her. And she doesn't like you? Not like that. Then you need to move on. There are other girls. Not like her. She's cool. Even if I can't go out with her, I just like spending time with her. I wiped the tears from my cheeks. You want to be her friend? I nodded. Did you tell her that? I didn't say anything. Go and tell her, she said firmly. If she rejects you as a friend, she's not worth it. What should I say? Be honest. Tell her how you feel. Tell her what you want. Tell her you want to stay friends. You need to respect what she says. Why can't things just be easy? Mum chuckled. You need the lows to enjoy the highs. Things are never simple. Does it get easier? She sat back on the sofa. No. Different, yes. Simpler. No. So, I've got a difficult, messed up life to look forward to. I couldn't help grinning. That's the long and short of it, Brian. We need to make the most of what we do have. If we focus on everything bad that happens in the world, you'll never do anything good. You can always find ways to stay positive. What if she rejects me again? Then you move on. Something caught in my chest. Right. She took my hand. Brian, you're growing up to be a good man. Just think back to a few weeks ago. You didn't have Rebecca as a friend. You can make new friends. You've made new friends. You can make friends again. I guess. What do you do in your game when you can't do something? Get a load of crap off Socko. Sorry, who's Socko? I shook my head, smiling. He's a friend. Doesn't matter. Are you going to see her then? I let out a long sigh. I have to, don't I? She didn't say anything. Fine, I said, getting up. I'll try again. 
Chapter 34 Stupid I didn't know how I could beat Sysadmin. Why anyone thought that simply taking him out in a game setting would be enough to defeat him was beyond me. But then, I thought about who'd planted that idea. It all made sense. I logged into Gambit and entered the forum, immediately switching on the screen to fill the silence. Leaning forward on the sofa, I brought up the replay of the last man standing battle with the inconceivable. This was where Sis Admin first appeared as the hacker. I wanted to learn everything I could about him, discover his strengths and weaknesses, and see if removing him from the game was even possible. I replayed the video, cringing at my lack of skill. I shook my head as I shot wildly towards Sokko, my bullet destroying his weapon. When the hacker appeared I paused the film and stared at him, the edges of an idea forming. I rewound it, watching again as my refool took out Sokko's power mace, remembering how annoyed he was that I'd permanently destroyed it, removing it from his inventory. I started as the forum door swung open. R2 and Aerith strode in, both glancing up at the screen. Best not look at that. I turned the screen off. R2 stood over me, rocking on his heels. Great work with that hacker. I can't believe we relied on you. Leave me alone. I stared down at my hands, shaking my head, then looked up at him, glaring. You could have helped me, but you didn't. If anyone's to blame, you should start looking at yourself. R2 let out a spluttering laugh. Good one. He turned to Aerith. You heard this guy? Not that it matters, Aerith said. Most of the arenas have been destroyed now, he should have stopped him. I thought I had. Well, you didn't. R2 sniffed. Honestly, unless you've got something useful to add, please just go. I signalled towards the door. I'm working on a plan to beat Sysadmin. I don't have time for this. R2 and Aerith exchanged a look, question marks filling their eyes. What's Sysadmin got to do with anything? R2 let out a laugh. You think Sysadmin is your man? He shook his head. I know he is. It's the only thing that makes sense. Really? R2 tilted his head. Really? I got up and started to pace. I don't know why he's doing this, but I think I figured out a way of stopping him. Like you did last time? I glared at R2, turning my avatar red. It was stupid to think that beating someone in the game would destroy them. Sis Admin knew that, so he put that out there as a distraction while he went around ripping the game apart. I'm sure you've been beaten enough times, Erit said. Exactly. I was replaying our last man standing match. I wanted to see if I could learn anything about the hacker, but I noticed it's something else. That you suck. I let out a sigh. In a way, yes. I accidentally shot Sokko's weapon. So. R2 looked at Aerith and shrugged. So when we came out of the game, he was pissed off with me because the weapon wasn't in his inventory. Yeah, I've seen. So what's your point? You going to... Aerith's words stopped, a broad grin passing across his face. That's actually pretty smart. I underestimated you. R2 laughed again. You're going to take out his weapon, are you? I nodded. But I need your help. I just need to get my perception high enough so I can take care of that weapon, once and for all. Not this again. R2 waved a hand. Please. You're the best sniper I know. You can help me. He folded his arms. Go on, R2, Aerith said. Just help him out. You'll be a hero. R2 shook his head. I think I've already made my position perfectly clear. The answer is no. Chi, Chapter 35 Simon As I made my way along the high street on my own, I used the stick and click technique to avoid obstacles. The gurgling of a coffee machine came from a door to my right. I placed a hand against the window and stood. Hey, Rebecca said. Oh, you're here. This is Simon. This is the brother I was telling you about. He said he'll defend my honor if you try kissing me again. What, no? She gave my shoulder a playful shove. I'm just joking. Lighten up. Right. I forced a laugh. Very funny. Brian is embarrassed because he tried to kiss me last time we were here. Ignore her. She's just trying to embarrass you. I'm Simon. Nice to meet you. He took my hand, 
and shook it. I'm Brian. Nice to meet you. You'll have to tell me some embarrassing stuff about your sister just to even things out. Not going to happen, Rebecca said. I have lived a perfect life. What about that time you cried when you found out there was no such thing as unicorns? That was devastating. I was a kid. You were twelve, I laughed. I think we're at one all now. Was it like finding out about Santa? Shall we go inside? Rebecca sent out a few clicks and pushed the door. I thought we could stand out here in the cold, I said. Nothing I like more than hanging around on a cold high street, hearing stories of unicorn trauma. I used to be in a band called Unicorn Trauma, Simon said, holding the door for me. Really? Nope, he laughed. We sat on leather seats near the window and Simon asked what we wanted and went up to the counter. I folded my cane and took off my jacket. Simon seems all right. Yeah, I'm trying to get him to adjust to real life. Why? He's been addicted to a video game. I think I've managed to get him out of it, though. Simon brought the teas and coffees on a tray, placing it down on the table. My sister said you're into gaming. He pulled a seat out and sat opposite me, putting my cup in front of me. I was. It's not so much fun nowadays. What do you play? Gambit. It's like a co-op shooter with zombies. It's kind of... Gambit? He leaned forward, voice filling with excitement. I love that game. It's addictive, Rebecca huffed. What's your username? I asked. Frag Queen. Seriously? I shook my head. Neuromantic, we're... Holy crap, Neuro! He jumped from his seat, throwing his arms around me. This is awesome. I guess Sokka was wrong. You're not just some Dr. Robotnik lookalike from Detroit. Yeah, about that. He returned to his seat. I don't care. I'm sure Soko isn't really built like a tank. None of us are really warriors in a post-apocalyptic wasteland. Simon let out a laugh. So, have you given up? It's that hacker. I'm going to the toilet, Rebecca said, getting up. You two talk about video games without me. I've got a theory, I said, leaning forward. I reckon it's the admin guy. I think he's doing an inside job. I don't know. Why would he do that? Take down the company. Maybe he's a circle tech spy. Seems a bit far-fetched to me. Hasn't he been trying to train you? Yeah, I guess I leveled up. That's awesome. You'll make top sharpshooter in no time. It wasn't shooting that did it. I've got no one to train me. That R2 guy just refuses. He's obviously an alt-right dick. You can tell that from his username. I think he probably lives in his mum's basement. Big Pepe the Frog poster above his bed, I laughed. I did some stealth training and melee stuff, even got to grips with explosives. Right, he said absently. I've got a gorilla suit too. How? There was a statue of Harambi. I pushed it onto some zombies and unlocked the monkey business perk. That's awesome. He let out a sigh. How are you going to beat the hacker? I've leveled up a few times, and I think I'm better than I was. I think I know how to take the hacker's weapon out, that's the key. I don't know. By leveling up everything else, you actually nerfed your perception. I can't do sniper training. No one will help. What about crafting? What do you mean? If you work on building weapons, you can boost your perception that way. Really? Really? I turned as Rebecca returned to her seat. Hey, what have I missed? I was just telling Neuro how to improve his perception in Gambit. She let out a sigh. I can't believe you're still talking about that game. She slurped her coffee, draining the cup, and rose to her feet. I'll leave you guys to it. It's fine, Simon said. We can talk about something else. How about unicorns? Rebecca's cane tip hit the floor and she squeezed past my chair. I'll see you guys later. A rush of cold came through the door, and she was gone. I shook my head. That went well. Chapter 36 Craft Finding the forum empty, I brought up my HUD and logged into the crafting area. A ramshackle pine hut emerged around me, beams of sunlight poking through the cracks. A workbench stood to my left, tools lying scattered across its surface. A spanner, some pliers, a hammer and various screwdrivers. A bandsaw loomed to my right. 
I turned and exited the door, finding myself in an expansive junkyard. Cars and machine parts rested in uniform rows, occasionally punctuated by the placement of washing machines and refrigerators. Unsure of what to do, I loaded up the training module, and it instructed me to seek the necessary parts for weapons, components that could be found within the junkyard, or from items already in my inventory. Heading back inside, I saw a rolled-up piece of paper on the workbench. It showed the schematics for a basic air rifle. I took a screenshot of the pieces I needed and made my way back outside. I searched in cars and trucks, removing nuts and screws that matched the schematics. A handgun dropped from a glove box, and I found a short length of pipe around the back of a washing machine. Satisfied I'd collected the necessary components, I took them back to the shack and laid them out on the workbench. I followed the instructions, cutting and welding pieces together, transforming the seemingly random bits of junk into a rudimentary air rifle. As I loaded the weapon with bolts, I stepped outside and set up a row of tin cans on top of a washing machine. I took a few shots, frowning as they missed. I tried again and made a direct hit, the can spinning to the ground, resting in dust. Bringing up the tutorial, I went through the exercises to improve the rifle, upgrading parts and adding new ones. I spent an hour searching for a particular spring that ended up being loose on the top of a washing machine. As I fitted the final screw, my perception jumped up a level. I set up the tins again and took a few pot shots, finding it slightly easier to aim. Pleased, I returned to the tutorial and flicked through the notes. I hovered over the section about building new weapons, using items from my inventory. I raised my eyebrows when I realised I could improve my perception by upgrading or repairing existing weapons. I started again, repeating the process, gathering parts and building a rifle from scratch. Without testing it, I immediately went and found the parts to upgrade it. When I fitted the final component, I frowned when I realised my perception hadn't improved. Scrolling through the tutorial again, a single word struck me that hadn't before. Unique. I had to craft unique weapons to improve. That made sense, though I was prepared to grind, building air rifles for the next few weeks if necessary. I glanced around the workbench, searching for schematics. There were none. Spreading my search, I checked around the shack but found nothing. How am I supposed to build unique weapons if there are no more schematics? Moving outside. I looked in cars, checking underneath seats and glove boxes, stashing items in my inventory that might come in useful for crafting. After an hour or so, I found a slip of paper containing instructions to build a mace-like weapon. I gathered the parts and fitted them together with ease, testing it against the side of a washing machine, grinning at the loud metallic thud as I dented its side. Checking the schematics, I noted the appearance of upgrade instructions. I collected batteries, wires, and the heating element from an old toaster, fitting them to the mace so its head glowed molten red. I gave a fist pump when my perception rose again. Excited, I ran inside and grabbed the rifle and took shots at the tins again. My aim improved. My movement seemed less wobbly, more fluid. It felt as if time slowed as I took aim. Perhaps it did. Perhaps that was how the perception mechanic worked. Tiredness gripped me. I searched around the junkyard for ten minutes, seeing if I could find another set of schematics. Exhausted, I gave up and logged out. Chapter 37. Dalton Jones. Good idea doing crafting, sysadmin said as I entered the forum. He turned to me with a broad smile. You? I spat. He raised his eyebrows, pupils turning to question marks. Did I miss something? I stared at him jaw clenched. I was just thinking we should have thought of the crafting thing to build perception. That was a good idea. Where's your shield? I asked, squaring up to him. He raised his hands, taking a step back. Excuse me? I know it's you, I've worked out your little plan. You really think I'm the hacker? I nodded. It makes sense. I've been trying to help you. Just drop the act, it's over. What is it? Money? Are you a spy? Help me understand this, you've hurt a lot of people. You're serious, aren't you? He cocked his head. You seriously think it's me? It's the only explanation that makes sense. I raised my chin. Don't think I haven't noticed what you've been doing. You go away and suddenly the hacker's in here. He waved his hands, just admit it. 
The hacker was in here, in the forums. You know you were. You've got this completely wrong. He sat down on the couch. Explain to me why I had the migraines, why I was frozen out of the game. I thought back to when the replay froze him out. Doesn't prove anything. I've been with you when the hacker arrived. I racked my brain, confidence slipping. I don't remember that at all. I know this is you. It can't be anyone else. I think it must be another beta tester like you. It's got to be another user with a B chip. What's that got to do with anything? That's why you're immune. Whatever this hacker is doing must be working on the optic nerve or something. I know about programming, not biology. How do I know you haven't got one? Sis admin let out a groaning sigh. I'll leave you to think about it. If there's nothing I can say to make you believe me. He shook his head. You're wrong. I didn't know how to respond. You believe what you want. He looked up at me and stood. I'm going. Just know I'm not working against you. Prove it. He shrugged. I'm going. He walked towards the door and turned back to me. I got your message, by the way. Nice idea to try the call center. My mouth gaped open. You're Dalton Jones. Sis admin nodded. I blinked. But if you're... I'm not the hacker. Chapter 38 Ridiculous Grin Simon placed the coffee in front of me. I cut my hands around its warmth. Rebecca won't be too long, he said, taking a seat. Has she said anything about me? A few things. Right. I brought the mug to my lips, testing the heat. She likes you. I nearly dropped the coffee. Yeah, right. She does. I don't think she knew how to react. I don't believe you. Why would I lie? I guess. I took a sip, the coffee hot against my tongue. Simon cleared his throat. Anything new in Gambit? I spoke to Dalton Jones, he chuckled. Good one. Seriously? Really? I nodded. He's been with us from the start. It's Sis Admin. I thought he was behind all this. I gave a nervous laugh, rubbing my implant scar. It appears I was wrong. How did you manage that? I shrugged. I don't know. I leaned back, the noise of the coffee machine filling my ears. It just made sense. Every time he went off, the hacker... No, I mean, how did you find out it was him? Oh, right. I called up their call center and got them to leave him a message. I think I went off a bit about how sysadmin was the hacker. And they actually did it? It took a bit of doing. They sent me around the houses a bit with their automated menus. Ended up just pressing the buttons on the phone a bunch of times until they put me through to a real person. Simon laughed. He drummed on the table. Well, if it's not him, who is it? I shrugged. That's what we're trying to work out. Well, if you and Dalton Jones are best buddies, maybe he knows. How long do you think Rebecca will be? I was thinking I might do some craft grinding tonight. Get my perception levels up a bit more. She's just outside. I think she's waiting for us. I'll go and grab her. I sat and waited as Simon brought Rebecca inside. She took a seat next to me. I'll get some more drinks, same again? Please. I turned to Rebecca. Hey. Hey, yourself. See you started without me. Simon got them. Lighten up. Just kidding with you. I should know by now, right? I'm glad to see you and Simon getting on. Yeah, I can't believe we already knew each other. What, with his Japanese schoolgirl thing? Seems a bit wrong if you ask me. I don't mind. My guy wears a gorilla suit. Not really my place to judge, is it? A gorilla? It's just stupid. I won it when I dropped a statue of Harambe onto some zombies. That does sound stupid. I was wondering if we'll be able to get back to some training soon. Whenever. I think you're already doing pretty well, though. I'm not sure what else I can teach you, really. You could teach me to ride a bike. I can do that. Never actually taught anyone to do bike things before. No one really gets to where you are. You've done really well. She squeezed my shoulder. Thanks. Here's your coffee. Simon placed a tray down onto the table and distributed the drinks before sitting to my left. Brian was telling me he wants me to teach him how to ride a bike. Simon snorted. Have you told him how many times you've crashed into things? Rebecca shuffled on her seat. Well, not exactly. Is this a regular thing? Not as much as it used to be. 
and I had you down as some crazy dolphin girl. Dolphin girl. Yeah, Simon said. Because you don't stop chattering. Get bent, Simon. I smiled. As in ecolocation clicks, that sort of thing. I don't mean that you live in the sea or anything. I got it. Jokes are always best when you have to explain them. She sighed. It's not perfect by any means. At least I'm trying something. And it's awesome, I said. What are your plans this evening? She asked. I'll probably go back home, have some tea, play gambit. I need to increase my stats. Rebecca didn't respond. You okay? I asked. That's a shame. What do you mean? I was going to see if you wanted to go on a date, but if you're playing gambit, I'll leave you to it. That's mean, Simon said. Don't wind the lad up. It's not mean. It's true. She turned to me. You don't have to, if you don't want to. I just thought it'd be a nice idea. I told you she liked you, Simon whispered. I heard that. I shook my head, confused. I thought you just wanted to... Don't make this more awkward than it is. Are you going to go on a date with me? Or not? Yes, I smiled. That's a ridiculous grin, Simon said. I take it it's just going to be the two of us? I asked. Yes. I think we can do without our chaperone, don't you? Chapter 39 The Date I sat at our usual seat in the cafe, window behind me. I tapped nervously on the table, wondering where Rebecca was. It worried me that she wasn't going to turn up, that this was some kind of joke, some kind of payback for trying to kiss her. I got to my feet, ready to leave. A rush of cold air came flooding in. What sounded like a woman with a child in a buggy entered, door closing behind her. I sighed, pulling on my jacket. Perhaps she'd been joking. Perhaps. The door opened again, accompanied by a salvo of clicks. Rebecca bumped into the table out of breath. I'm so sorry I'm late, she said, dropping down onto the seat next to me. Bloody buses. They're meant to be every ten minutes, but they're clearly not. I was beginning to think for a second that you weren't going to turn up. Look, I'd even put my coat back on. So sorry. I'm joking. I draped my coat over the back of the chair and sat back down, sinking into the leather. Right, I forgot about your deadpan delivery. You should add a bit of inflection to your voice once in a while. What would be the point in that? I want to keep people on their toes, keep them guessing. She laughed. I bet you think that gives you an air of mystique, don't you? I bet you think you're really cool. She laughed again. You know nothing, Jon Snow. Honestly, I've not really thought about it. It should be part of your ongoing journey of self-development. Once you've got the echolocation stuff sorted, we'll start deconstructing your personality. I mean, we'll be digging really deep, pulling out all those dirty little weeds you got stashed in the darkest corners of your mind. I'll look forward to it. Might be fun. That last bit was a joke. Of course it was. I stifled a laugh. So what's the plan? I've not been on many dates before. Many or any. Okay, many might be somewhat of an exaggeration. To be honest, I don't know what I'm doing. For starters, I'm going to take this coat off. She shuffled from her jacket. What do you usually do? Usually do? How dare you besmirch my good name? This isn't normal for me either. Oh, I just thought as you suggested it. I would suggest quitting while you're ahead. We'll have a coffee, maybe a piece of cake, and just see how things go from there. I smiled. Sounds good to me. What sort of cake? The only kind. Chocolate, right? I got to my feet, unfolding my cane. Carrot cake, dummy. Oh, I hesitated. Chocolate it is. See, you're getting it. She gave me a gentle prod on the shoulder. I went over to the counter to order the coffees and cakes. The barista followed me with a tray of drinks and cakes, placing it down on the table as I returned to my seat. I took my coffee and cake, holding the mug in my hands. So, I realised I was sitting here waiting for you, thinking you wouldn't turn up, and I realised that apart from the blind stuff, I don't really know much about you. There was a short pause. I drummed on the side of my cup. Rebecca took her plate and cup from a tray, dropping the tray on the floor next to us. Not a lot to say, really. I spend most of my time either working or volunteering at Mandela House, making phone calls, doing admin, 
Do they pay you? Of course. At least for the admin work. She paused. I'm all right for money, though. I just thought because of the way they are with you. They don't think I should be teaching people, if that's what you mean. I hope you realize you're taking a huge risk coming out on a date with such a dangerous person. I live on the edge, baby. Did you just call me baby? Ironically. Are you sure it was ironic? It didn't sound ironic. It was definitely ironic. Hmm. Remember, I've got that deadpan delivery you love so much. Keeps you on your toes, baby. Okay, that last one wasn't ironic. No, that last one definitely wasn't. I spooned a piece of chocolate cake into my mouth. She laughed. What about you? All I really know is that you've been getting under Terry's skin, that you're visually impaired, you like bad 80s music, and you play Gambit with a manga schoolgirl who also happens to be my brother. That about covers it. Wow, that boring, huh? Yep, I'm just a boring guy. Nothing to see here. Just keep away from those dark weeds in the deepest recesses of my imagination. I hear they bite. At least that's what they tell me. When did you lose your sight? You don't mess around, do you? I laughed, rubbed my chin, and sighed. I don't know. It's been gradual over the past few years. Started closing around the edges. I swallowed. You coping? I'm getting there. Still coming to terms with everything. It's been hard, you know? My dad killed himself a couple of years ago, so it's just been me and mum. She's finding it hard too. That's terrible. It's fine, I guess. I sighed. I know I need to start thinking about getting a job, going to college or something. I don't want to be one of those blind people who waits around to die. Rebecca held my hand. I think what's been difficult is getting the B-chip. I can still be a part of the sighted world in a weird way, but at the same time, I know it's not real. I can hang around with friends, play games, watch films. I don't know how to explain it. It's more than just a game to you, isn't it? She lowered her voice. I didn't realize. It's just hard at the moment. I feel like I'm always clashing with mum. I know she means well, and she's trying her best, but she doesn't get it. And she won't. She'll never understand, but that doesn't mean she can't be there for you. What should I do? I feel like she's always getting on my back about being in Gambit. And then when I do go out, she lectures me about safety. I think if she had her way, she'd wrap me up in cotton wool and have me staring at the walls forever. It was like that with my mum, too. Always overprotective. When mum and dad split up, I went to live with dad. And he let me make my own mistakes. I hurt myself all the time, but I worked out I could do the clicking thing. When I tried that with my mum, she'd always tell me to stop it, but I didn't listen. Dad said I shouldn't listen to her, so I kept doing it. Sighted people will never truly get your situation. But you can make them try to understand where you're coming from. What happened with your sight? I had cancer when I was about two or three. I've got vague memories of seeing things. Not even sure if they're real or just made up in my mind. Damn. I don't remember it. I think the earliest thing I remember is being at school and me arguing with the teachers about clicking. Yeah, my mum thinks it's annoying that I should consider what other people think. People don't think. I take it you ignored the teachers. Yep. Didn't stop me getting in trouble, though. Ended up having my dad being called into the head's office about it. I'd never heard him shout before, but he was so angry at the school he threatened to go to the papers and everything. What happened? The school backed down. At least it ended positively. But it's always a fight. You're always having to assert yourself for access, for rights, for people not to treat you like a kid. It's so easy to infantilize people with disabilities, to underestimate what they can do. I didn't think I'd be able to get around by myself like I do. Exactly. And I'm so pleased. You've really taken to it. You inspired me. If it wasn't for you... My words cut off when her lips pressed against mine. I ran my hand through her hair, long and silky, breathing in the smell of ice cream. Our tongues met. My heart thundered in my chest as my fingers drifted across the scar on the back of her neck. Chapter 40. Schematics. I double-checked inside every glove box and under every car seat in the crafting area. I searched inside washing machines and tipped out the contents of random boxes and barrels. After what felt like several hours, I cursed and sat on the ground, head in my hands. 
I started at the sight of Sysadmin standing before me and glanced up at his grey suit, frowning. I can't find any schematics. How am I meant to level up? I can't build any new stuff. There is bound to be something around here. He gestured over his shoulder. Did you check under the seat of that truck? Twice? He smiled. Check again. I shook my head. No point. I've already checked it twice. There's nothing. Believe me. Who knows? There might be schematics for a pretty nifty assault rifle in there. I gave him a quizzical look, got up, and walked over to the truck, its door creaking on its hinges. A rolled-up blueprint rested in the footwell. I grabbed it and turned to Sysadmin, smiling. Thanks. Sysadmin followed me into the shack as I opened the schematics out on the workbench, holding it down with a screwdriver and a roll of gaffer tape. This is going to take ages. I shook my head and there's a lot of stuff here I don't have. Did you check that barrel just outside the shack? I'm sure everything you need will be in there. Yeah, I checked that. I smiled. I'll take a look. The barrel's lid slipped off with ease. It brimmed with a mishmash of springs, pipes, and machine parts. Adding the items to my inventory, I compared them to the blueprint and grinned. What do you know? Everything is here. What a coincidence. I fingered the instructions, squinting at the diagrams in the dim light. This is very complicated. It's meant to be. Can you help me? He stepped backwards and waved his hands. If I do that, you won't get the stats boost. Nodding, I took in a deep breath. Okay, you can leave me to it. You sure? I can't physically do it for you, but I'm sure I could offer you some tips. I waved him away. No. I need to do this alone. Good luck. He vanished. I spent the next few hours putting together the rifle. I kept having to start again when I realized I put a screw in the wrong order or welded something in the wrong place. When I finished, my perception jumped up a point. I went outside, set up the tin cans on the barrel, and shot at them with the new rye fool. Aiming felt effortless. It was almost as if I didn't have to try. I shot three tins in quick succession. Tiredness hit me like a wall. I logged out and crawled into bed, head fried. Chapter 41. A Joke. Scrolling past several dead game feeds, I flicked between a couple of live bouts. The hacker charged into the arena, bursting through the fabric of the game world, taking out the players and tearing down the scenery, leaving a void of blackness in his wake. I switched off the screen as C's admin entered. The hacker's back. He's wreaking havoc in the arenas. I know. He looked at me for a long moment. It's time. What? Now. Gambit has become a joke. He paced before me with jerky steps. This is my life's work and I'm powerless. People are leaving. As soon as we rebuild anything, the hacker comes back and destroys it. It's now or never. What should I do? Get in the game. Do what you did last time. Lay the mines, draw him in, you know what to do. I need to destroy that shield. Exactly. You got your lightsaber? I laughed. Laser sword, you mean? Sis admin rubbed his chin. Laser sword, right. I sucked in a deep breath and nodded. Okay. I can do this. This is it. I know you can do it. I got to my feet and brought up my HUD. If I'm not back in five minutes, just wait longer. I found myself in a town that looked like something from a western. Tumble-down shacks lined a dirt road. Blast craters peppered the desert landscape. The ground around me was too flat, too open, too exposed. I pulled up my map and saw my marker flashing white in the bottom left corner. I scanned the horizon for the hacker. Tumbleweed and the eddying clouds provided the only signs of movement. I walked along the track, counting eighteen huts, eight on the right and ten to the left. A rusted pickup truck stood at the end of the street. I fixed a remote mine to its side and traced the way back, placing two more remote mines. I lay the proximity mines in a horseshoe and took out my assault rifle. I let off a few shots, the crack of the bullets echoing around the shacks, the sound not quite fitting with the open space. Scanning my surroundings, I cursed at the lack of movement. No hacker. No zombies. It occurred to me that with no other players in the arena, maybe the hacker was causing trouble elsewhere. 
The pickup truck sunk on its suspension when I climbed onto its trailer. It was the same design as all the other pickup trucks in the game. As I jumped up and down, it squeaked and groaned. I let off another shot. Come on! Nothing. Nervously, I dropped from the trailer and ventured past the shacks, buildings making way for towering orange rocks and twisted cacti. I expected a roadrunner to whiz past me at any second, while a coyote misfired an elaborate but ultimately flawed trap. I stopped and looked around again. Someone watching might have wondered why I was spinning in place. Sighing, I clambered up a mound of brownish gold rock and perched on its summit. Still no sign. It crossed my mind to log out. I dropped down and raced back towards the settlement. After a few minutes, I returned to the end of the dirt track, the pickup truck standing ahead. I scanned the village just to be sure. I walked over to the truck, returning the remote mine to my inventory. A window erupted from a shack to my left, knocking me to the ground. I reached for my laser sword, but the hacker drove his sword into my skull before I could react. The game faded to black. Wow, that was quick. How did it go? I glanced up at the blank screen and shook my head. He was on to me. He knew all my tactics. What happened? Rage tore through me. What happened is I failed. What happened is everyone's right, I suck at this. I got up ready to leave. Sysadmin raised his hand. You don't suck. Look at how far you've come. I let out a deep sigh. I can't beat him. He's too strong. I've been thinking. Maybe we're going about this the wrong way. I've been building my level up, getting better with my skills. But you're supposed to be a sniper. Not according to everyone else. Screw them. I let out a sniff. And do what? Be who you are. A treasure chest appeared in front of me, spinning in midair. What is it? Open it. As I flipped the chest's lid, a chime sounded. I snatched the scroll of paper from the air. It's a schematic. It's something you need to build. I checked the blueprint. This looks really hard. Sysadmin shrugged. Best get to work then. Chapter 42 Sacrifice I logged into the crafting area, alone. Taking the schematics from my inventory, I laid it out on the workbench. The diagrams outlined several upgrades I could make to the assault rifle I'd previously built. I raised my eyebrows when I saw the required parts were already in my inventory. I can't do this, I muttered. The blueprint required me to dismantle the laser sword and use its parts to upgrade the rifle. I rolled up the schematic, dropping it back into my inventory. I can't do this. I paced back and forth for several minutes, bringing the laser sword from my inventory. I activated its glowing blade, its light reflecting neon against the walls. Shoom! Bringing the blade back in, I stared down at its black handle. I nodded to myself and took out the schematics. The upgrades looked awesome. I followed the instructions, slowly, carefully. After an hour or so, the laser sword lay in several pieces along the workbench. The laser sword's handle and glass lenses made up the bulk of the rifle's sight. Some of its internal components were connected to the rifle's side, but I couldn't tell what it actually did. I used a length of pipe to extend the barrel. Thin struts of steel acted as a tripod. My head thumped with a dull ache as I screwed the last part in the rifle. I stood back, examining my work. The rifle was longer and bulkier, its barrel shimmering against the light. It looked pretty badass. I hefted it up to my shoulder and stepped outside, setting the rifle down on the ground, piled up cars extending into the distance. Grabbing five tin cans, I strode past the mountains of junk, reaching the edge of the crafting area. As I stood the tins on the top of a washing machine, I glanced back at the shack, the rifle, no more than a dot, in the distance. I sauntered back to the workshop and crouched on one knee, leveling the rifle full towards the cans. The sight drifted towards the can as if controlled by magnets. I took a breath and squeezed the trigger. The tin disintegrated with a flash of iridescent green. Whoa! I let off another shot and another, the tins disappearing into molten metal. I lowered my sight, e-brows raised. Damn. 
Setting the refill down, I return it to the washing machine. There was no sign of the tins. I set up again near the shack and aimed at the washing machine itself. I pulled the trigger, and it disintegrated in a green flash. Well, this is interesting, isn't it? I started as Sis Admin looked on. This rifle is awesome, I said, getting up. If you can't beat the hacker with this, I think it's fair to say we're screwed. Why did I have to give up the lightsaber? Laser sword, because you're a sniper. It was short-sighted of me to give you a weapon like that. It's right now, it's perfect. The hacker's still out there. You ready? I nodded. I'm ready. Chapter 43 The End I spawned on a highway, cracked asphalt making way for vines and roots. The central barrier stretched off into the distance, getting lost in a haze of zombies. The skeletal structures of a ruined town stood to my left, shadowy concrete and twisted girders extending for miles. I shook my head. This arena is huge. Glancing down off the highway's right, my eyes skipped over the blast craters and grey dirt. I took up my rifle and swept the sight across the barren landscape. Dust clouds swirled in lazy tornadoes, but there was no sign of the hacker. My sight drifted towards the shadow of a lumbering zombie. I hesitated for a moment, then pulled the trigger, grinning as it disintegrated in a green flash. I brought up my HUD to check on my ammunition, unsure what the figure eight on its side meant. Turning my attention back to the ruined town, I scanned the horizon, taking out zombies when they filled my sight. Something else caught my eye, something warping at the edges of the game. There. With one eye on the highway and one eye on the town, I laid a horseshoe of proximity mines and set a trio of remote mines along the central barrier. I scrambled onto the roof of the car, searching for the hacker again. Dropping off the highway, I went into stealth mode and headed in the hacker's general direction, hopping over brick foundations, pressing against shadows. Joining the road, I stood for a moment, listening. I turned the next corner and stopped abruptly. The hacker stood before me, framed by a void. We stood unmoving for a long moment. I turned and ran, retracing my route. Reaching the highway, I headed toward my mines, signaling for the hacker to follow me. He stared at me for several seconds, then tore up the central barrier, pulling up the surface of the road, revealing the blackness beneath. When he turned away, I dropped back into stealth mode and slipped from the highway's edge, heading back towards the town, creeping in shadows, hiding behind walls. Glancing over my shoulder, I caught a glimpse of the hacker searching for me. Reaching the end of the street, I climbed a set of stairs leading to a rooftop. I balanced my rifle on its supporting struts and crouched at the roof's edge, watching through its sight. The crosshair hovered over the hacker's blank face. I took in a deep breath, finger twitching over the trigger, and stopped myself from taking a shot. I traced along his left arm, waited for the shield to face towards me its hypnotic light fluctuating between colours. I pulled the trigger. The hacker spun, looking around. Crap! Heart racing, I let my aim drift towards the shield again, letting it rest before pulling the trigger. This time the shield exploded in a flash of green light, disintegrating from the hacker's arm. I pumped my fist and jumped to my feet. How do you like my boomstick? Crouching, I focused on the hacker's sword. I took in a deep breath and it disappeared before I could pull the trigger. He must have stashed it in his inventory. I shifted my aim back over the hacker's head, took a breath, and pulled the trigger, smelling as the figure glowed red for a moment. He seemed to stare at me for a long time, then charged forward, dropping off the highway, disappearing behind the distant buildings. The game imploded in the hacker's wake, the scenery becoming a vortex behind him. I watched, helpless as the void grew closer, the blackness spreading to the sky like a giant mouth about to eat the world. Stealing myself, I looked down the rifle, trying to make out his location. After a few seconds, I heard footsteps behind me. I spun on my heels to see the hacker running towards me, sword flashing and swinging. I had no melee weapons in my inventory and held up my rifle as a defense, swinging it like a bat. The hacker charged towards me. I stepped aside smacking at the back of his legs as he stumbled past me. He let out a high-pitched laugh, a woman's laugh. What do you want? Why are you doing this? The hacker continued to circle me, thrusting forward with her sword. 
As I jerked backwards, she brushed against my rifle, almost knocking it from my grasp. Its barrel shifted and glowed orange, transforming into a laser sword, its handle forming around my fist. I didn't know it could do that. The hacker stared at me, looking me up and down. Shooting forward, she lunged at me. Our weapons clashed, both of them disappearing into nothing. Unarmed, I took a grenade from my inventory and shoved the hacker from the rooftop, shoulder first. I bolted downstairs and ran back towards the remains of the highway. I stood in the horseshoe of proximity mines, waiting. She charged towards me, fists flailing. I waited until she was upon me and activated the grenade in my hand, proximity mines exploding around us. I arrived back in the forum, sweating and exhausted. My head thumped as the adrenaline subsided. What happened? Sis Admin asked. I can't do any more. Gasping, I logged out of the game, the bee chip hot in the back of my neck. I trembled as I flopped weakly onto my bed, eyes closing, head sinking into the pillow drifting away. Chapter 44 Two Names I woke up half-dazed, my head still humming. Swallowing, I logged into Gambit, almost jumping as a loud chorus of cheers greeted me. The forum thronged with movement. Dizzy, I looked back at everyone's smiles. Socko, Frag Queen, Harley, Sis Admin, the Inconceivable. What's going on? I asked. Bro, you did it. Socko gave me a high five. You are freaking daredevil. I blinked, eyes wandering to Sis Admin. Did it work? He nodded. When you destroyed that weapon, I was able to identify its code. It's gone. I glanced up at the game feeds, the arenas still half destroyed. The game's still a wreck, though. Sis Admin nodded. Now the hacker's gone, we can fix it. Peanut came over and offered a hand. You came through for everyone in the end. Thanks. I gave a half shrug. It was nothing. They made R2 change his name. What to? I looked over to R2, bringing up his username. Re Tardis. I shook my head. Dude, that's not cool. It's from Doctor Who, R2 spat. I know where it's from, and I know what you're doing. Sis Admin, have you seen this? He looked between us, and brought up R2's username. Right. I'm fixing your username to R2, and I'm locking your profile. R2's avatar turned red. I walked over to Frag Queen and smiled. Good to have you back. You still on the team? What is it Socko always says? Time to kick ass and chew gum? Exactly. Hey, Harley said. Sis Admin said you'd opened up one of the best weapons in the game. I sighed. It got destroyed. It's fine. I think it was too powerful anyway. It would have been far too easy to take out the inconceivable. Peanut narrowed his eyes at me. You still suck. Harley turned to him, folding her arms. He doesn't suck, fool. Nero took out that hacker, and he's coming for you next. Sorko came over. Bro, now you're some crazy leveled-up sniper. Can I have your lightsaber? Laser sword, sis admin called. Whatever, bro. He turned back to me. So you gonna hook me up? I opened my hands. Had to use it to build that rifle. Otherwise I would have. Sokko nodded. That's too bad, at least you've still got your monkey suit. I glanced down at my hands and laughed. It's a gorilla. Sis Admin came over, patted me on the back and smiled. Thanks so much for everything. Did you ever work out who the hacker was? Sis Admin nodded. It was another beta tester. He gestured to his head. Bee chip like you. He showed me two real-world names. The first was my own. Chapter 45 The Matrix as the end credits for Doctor Who rolled, I found myself smiling over my cup of tea. You seem like a changed person, Mum said. We should do this more often. It's nice to spend time together. I nodded. Sorry I've been hard work these past few months. Years, I guess. You've got nothing to apologise for, I'm so proud of you. I sipped my tea. What's brought on this sudden good mood? I don't know. Things are looking up, I guess. Everything is good with Gambit, I've got a girlfriend. It's still not real, though, is it? I know I got too much into Gambit. I realise that. But I wouldn't have met my mate Simon in the real world if it wasn't for the game. 
He lives around here. That's great, I'm very pleased. I've got a girlfriend, I'm applying for a guide dog. I'm going to start looking at college courses. I've got a lot going on in the real world. But at the same time, I love that game. I've got friends in there, it's not everything anymore, but it's still important. I'm so pleased you've applied for a dog. I hope it's a Labrador. I don't mind, I think it'll be good, whatever. So tell me about this friend then. Frag Queen? Excuse me? That's his username, he's called Simon, he's Rebecca's brother. And he's a drag queen. I'm not really sure, possibly. I thought he was a girl in the game. Don't you think that's a bit weird that he'd lie like that? I don't really care. That's what I like about Gambit. You can be who you want, and no one's going to judge you. I suppose that's a good thing, is it? I think so. Well, I'm glad you're seeing new people. Yeah, me too. It's important that you cultivate those real relationships. I shook my head. Gambit is real. It might be constructed out of graphics, but the people in there are real. The friendships are real. The shared experiences are real. For all we know, this world we're in right now could be just another fake construct. It sounds like something from The Matrix. I've not seen it. You should watch it. We should watch it together. Do it with the audio description in here. Mum squeezed my hand. That would be great. We should just watch the first one, though. Agreed. Chapter 46. Scar. Rebecca was already waiting for me when I arrived. I took a seat next to her and kissed her on the cheek. How are you doing? Fine. Can I ask you something? Sounds ominous. Not really sure how to ask it, so... You felt my implant scar, she said flatly. Yep. And you worked out it was me. There was a long pause. Why? I don't get it. Because I wanted my brother back, for one. And well, Circle Tech made me a very nice offer. So you just took the money and tried to destroy the game? That's what happened. Right. It wasn't personal. It doesn't change anything between us. You hurt a lot of people. It's just a game. That thing you had gave people migraines. What the hell was it? The people at Circle Tech said it would freeze people out of the game. That's all. I didn't realize it was actually going to hurt people. And when I realized how much it meant to you, what difference it made to your life, I felt really bad. I tried to back out of the deal. They didn't let me. They said I'd have to pay back all the money. Why didn't you? I boot my house. I sat back and whistled. It must have been a lot of money. They needed someone with a bee chip to do it. I'm so sorry. She sobbed, and I placed an arm around her. She rested her head on the table, her body quivering as tears ran across its surface. She sat up. I don't want to lose you. I'm so sorry. I sighed. It's just a game. I'm sure we can get past this. She rested her head on my shoulder, tears subsiding. She shook her head and blew her nose on a napkin. I've just realized something, she said, sitting up. What's that then? I'm falling for you, dummy. The End Author's note. Thank you so much for taking a chance on my novel, Blind Gambit. Not only did you get to the end, but now you're here, listening to this. I can't tell you how much that means to me. This is the fourth novel I've published, and this was by far the hardest to write. I had a blast writing the chapters set in Gambit, but the ones set in the real world were very difficult for me. They were raw, honest, and emotionally draining, but I just had to tell this story. I'm severely visually impaired. I have a degenerative eye condition called retinitis pigmentosa and rely on a guide dog to get around. He's a beautiful golden retriever called Digit. I wanted to present a blind character who felt genuine and didn't fall back on the usual cliches. I hope that comes across in the writing. This was a book that I needed to write. In one respect, I wanted to write a story that was a love letter to gaming, but I also wanted to explore my thoughts about disability. My hope is that by the end of Blind Gambit, you felt that Brian wasn't a victim, that he wasn't someone to feel sorry for or to treat as oppressed or vulnerable. A lot of Brian's experiences are based on my own. I've been heckled in the street. I've dealt with patronising twats. Granted, Rebecca's responses were more what I wished I'd said in those situations. The great thing about being an author is you get to revisit negative moments in your life and turn them into something positive. I don't play video games anymore. 
but I have fond memories of playing Street Fighter 2 on the arcade machine in my local chip shop, of getting sucked into Final Fantasy 7, and getting lost for hours in the Water Temple on Ocarina of Time. Fallout 3 was the game that made me want to write post-apocalyptic fiction. See my book Wizard of the Wasteland. I'm now giving my young son a classical education, introducing him to games like Super Mario 3, Kirby's Dreamland, Sonic the Hedgehog, and Super Sp